folks, welcome to BR Gridiron Draft Night coverage. We are here in the studio again. It's myself, Michael Felder, and of course, we got Mike Renner here, a guy that knows his way around the scouting game. We're going to break down rounds four through five. We're going to hit on every pick. We're going to try to hit on some overall overarching concepts as well. I, I want to kick it off, Renner. I want to kick it off with kind of the overarching concept of what have you thought about the draft so far? Yeah, it's been, it was interesting. I thought round one, very eventful. But then as we got into day two and late day two, it started to be like, kickers are coming off the board. Yeah. These guys are coming off the board. The, the luster started to come off the draft. But I do think a lot of teams, there were some teams that had a lot of picks in this draft, whether it's the Seahawks, whether it's the Lions, Lions. whether it's the Eagles that are like franchise-defining type of drafts. Uh, I think, though, it all comes back to the quarterback position. And those three guys we saw at the top and then Will Levis into round two. Whoever hits on those guys are the ones that had the best draft. What about, what about value for Hooker? That's the one that uh, I love, hated what the Lions did on day one. I thought the value they got was just not what you would want for the 6th and 18th pick that they right. came in the draft with. But they end up getting that extra second round pick and then giving themselves some flexibility and had an awesome day too. I mean, getting Hendon Hooker where they got him, a lot of people would have, you know, without the ACL tear, would have been calling this guy a first round type of yep. pick to get that in the third. Uh, I thought the Lions crushed it on the second day of the draft. Yeah, just to recap for the Lions, what the Lions ended up getting, obviously we're seeing uh, Hendon Hooker right there just push the ball around, but what the Lions end up getting, round one, they, get, they, get, they go out and get Jameer Gibbs at, at pick 12. It seems like that was a little bit high. Pick 18, they get Jack Campbell. That also felt very high for the Iowa linebacker. Then we get pick three, we get to round two. Pick three, Sam Laporta, we like him. Pick two, pick 14. Round two, pick 14, Brian Branch, okay, we like him. Round three, pick six, or excuse me, pick five, they get Hendon Hooker. Hendon Hooker, okay, we've got Hendon, now we've got Hooker, and then you throw in Broderick Martin. This is a team that did what they needed to do in the, um, in the it, it, overall, their draft is a positive, right? I was going to say, I don't love the value of what they got in the first round, but I love the football players. I mean, that was my RB2 and my LB2 right. in this draft class. I think they're both going to be tremendous at their respective positions. They just better hope that, like, a Lucas Van Ness doesn't come and haunt them for, you know, two times a year in the Green Bay Packers uniform because that's the kind of, like, that's what you passed on when you take a running back that highly. You pass on guys who could be impact players at valuable positions. Jameer Gibbs is going to be an impact player for sure. But then what they did on day two, like they just targeted guys who are good. Maybe not the measurable guys, maybe not the guys who uh, tick the quote unquote scouting boxes, but they got five guys in Gibbs, Campbell, Laporta, Branch, Hooker, that you think are long-term starters on your football team. Here's what I'm gonna ask, because I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna tug at your heartstrings a little bit, because I heard you mention Lucas Van Ness. How do you, how do you, how do you feel about the Packers job? Packers had a unique one to say the least. I, I, I think Lucas Van Ness, his ceiling, Mm -hmm. at the edge position is as high as it gets in this draft class. Okay. Like even higher than like a Will Anderson, a Tyree Wilson, the guys that went before him. He has a unique physical skill set. And that's just, uh, the Packers were a team that drafted Rashawn Gary, who like, that's a similar mold of player that you're kind of going for, where it's like, if you hit on that guy, he turns into something special. And then on day two, the double tight ends. And, and I think there are two unique skill sets in that Musgrave is your vertical tight end, Kraft is your yak tight end, an inline blocker to where they can see the field at the same time. The Jane Reed one was the one where it's like a little bit of a reach on the board, but I think he's NFL ready for a slot wide receiver. And, you know, there aren't a ton uh, of guys maybe necessarily in that mold that have size and can play the slot at that uh, position. So weird draft, but one of my, one of my, as a Packers fan, one of the ones in recent years that I'm happier about than others. So I'm gonna I'm gonna stick in the same division. I saw in the chat somebody said, "What are the Bears doing?" So they've got Darnell Wright in the, in round one. Round two, they got they got Jervon Dexter. Round three, uh, excuse me, round two again, Tyreek Stevenson. Tyreek Stevenson, we love him. And then obviously round three, they get Zach Pickens, a developmental player, but a player with a super high ceiling. When I look at what the Bears are doing, one protection for protection for Justin Fields incredibly important and then we get two Dexter and Pickens two defensive linemen that can be very good yeah so they, they took swings right you could be looking at this draft four years from now and none of those guys could be on the football team besides Stevenson I think Stevenson's a safe yeah. pick but Dexter Pickens right like if they don't develop they are not making an impact on an NFL Bingo. football field they are liabilities on an NFL football field but you're in a position where you know you're not winning the Super Bowl this year I think that's pretty you know, obvious to anyone who's a Bears fan. You don't go from number one to a Super Bowl that quickly, but it's 
along that defensive line, these guys have all the tools in the world to succeed. So they're swings. And you're banking on your D-line coach. You're banking on what your coaching staff can do to develop these guys. And that's ultimately, if you don't have those positions in place to develop talent, you're not going to be a successful team anyways. Yeah, so the Saints are on the clock right now. And we look at, we're looking at what they've done so far. Brian Brezzi from Clemson, big defensive lineman. They go out and get Isaiah Foskey, and a big, a big-bodied edge player. Then they also go out and they get Kendra Miller, a running back I really, really like. I know he's coming off with an MCL, but I like him in their in their scheme. This is a guy that I think could be really special. Yeah, I, I don't think this is quite, you know, 2017 draft hall when they got, what, Kamara, Marshawn Ladmore, Ryan right. Ramchick, like the all-timer. But this is a solid draft. I think Brzee is the one that we could be looking back on this kind of the same way we look back when, on Ryan Ramchick dropping to the end of the first round saying, how they let this guy fall to this spot to this team because talent-wise, he's much better than that. Coming into this past year, mock drafts would have had him right behind Jalen Carter, and he falls to this spot because of the injuries that he suffered and all that. Foskey, I think, is their type of guy. Miller's the one in terms of like edge rushers, the long guys they like. And then Miller's the one where it's like, could this be Alvin Kamara's heir apparent? Like you get him there while you still have Kamara on the roster for however long before, you know, his legal issues play out. But very similarly tool dude, maybe not as impactful as a pure pass catcher, but he can develop in that regard, has all the tools to do so. Stick in the division. Bryce Young, Jonathan Mingo, DJ Johnson, Carolina Panthers, biggest head scratcher of the draft so far. I think so. Yeah. This was a its a weird draft. <laughs> it it kind of felt, to me, a little desperate. I, I know p there are Mingo fans out there, but 39th overall pick is, you know, that's like where Debo Samuel went. That's where Michael Pittman went. That's where uh, T. Higgins went in that range. I, and honestly, I, I can live with Mingo at 39. DJ but it's Johnson, a DJ Johnson at, one, at 80, though. That one felt insane. That, that was the first guy to come off the board in this draft. So he was pick 80 that I had a UDFA grade on. And it happens every year. There's one or two, but... Usually, I'll say this, so so steals are not often as good as they sound on paper, but right. reaches are often as bad as they sound on paper. Not a lot of times do guys reach highly for one that the consensus, the, you know, the opinion of most people around the NFL or the guys doing it in media are saying isn't good. And he's 174th on the Pro Football Network consensus board. And they took him at 80 overall. Yeah. Usually those guys, the track record of those guys just is not strong over the history of the draft. Yeah, we had we were in here on Thursday night with Micah Parson, obviously plays for the Dallas Cowboys. They get his guy, Mozzie Smith. They also get Luke Schoonmaker. They also end up with DeMarvion Overshone. What do you think the Cowboys are going to do today? They've got pick 27 and pick uh, pick one, they have one, so 129, 169, one in the fourth, one in the fifth. I think they did a great job of hitting needs, right? I think the Cowboys see where they're at as a franchise and see where the NFC is at and say, we can win a Super Bowl or at least get to a Super Bowl right now. We have a roster capable of doing so. So when that's the case, I, I can kind of back myself into a corner in certain positions. And I don't even disagree on the value here, but I can say I need a nose tackle, I need a tight end, because those are the two positions that if we hit on, get us a Super Bowl. Smith, obviously, you saw Michael Parsons on day one, yes. how he felt about that. I, I don't, I'm not that excited about it, but yeah. I am excited. That is a perfect fit for what they needed on that side of the ball. And then Schoonmaker is the most NFL ready tight end you were going to get that yeah. point in the draft. Playing, you know, playing at Michigan does a lot for you in terms of what you're able to do, what they ask you to do, and what they expect you to do. So, yeah, I agree with you on that. I do think, though, it's still not going to be enough to put them over the hump. What the Eagles did in that same yeah. division, yeah. are you kidding me? Like, they, they had a good draft. The Eagles had a fucking great draft. That yeah, was... the, Eagles had a, the Eagles had a great draft. I mean, let's go, ahead and, let's go ahead and take a look at it. Here we go. We got the pick is in. Oh, yeah. What do we got? Let's see what we got here. Oh, is it Nick Saldaveria? Look at that. Oh, this was one of my top guys available. We're, we're writing down who we we're going to discuss, who I want to see, some top small schoolers. Old Dominion, right tackle. I, I think he can, truthfully, I think he's like more NFL ready than the guy they drafted in the first round last year in Trevor Penning in terms of pass protection. Mm -hmm. I thought he had a great week at the Senior Bowl. I think he moves really well. But also a guy who I thought could also play guard at the next level. 6'6". 318, uh, just needs to get a little bit stronger to hold up to NFL caliber uh, sort of strength. But that's that's to be expected. You know, right. a lot of guys coming in the draft with that same sort of knock and then figure it out. Uh, this is a guy who I think is a starting tackle in the NFL. To get a starting tackle, this is why they obviously move up here. To get a starting tackle at this point in the fourth round, I think this is a, 
this is a great pick, in my opinion. We don't have the grades anymore, no, but I would great. be tapping A plus right now. <laughs> if we did. I like him. He's someone, and most of the clips that we saw, we got a chance to watch him play it against ECU. That's an FBS school. We got a chance to see him play, hold up against Virginia Tech. That's a Power Five school, and he 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 not only held his own, he succeeded. They decided we're going to go away from this guy. We've seen him play left tackle. We've seen him play right tackle. He can get those things done. I think at this level, at the four spot, or in the fourth round, mm -hmm. top of the fourth, great spot for him. Now I want to ask you a question because we got a little bit of time before the next thing happens, before the uh, before the Raiders come up. How do you evaluate small school versus big school guys when we get into yep. the back half of the draft? Yeah, it's a it's a unique sort of weighing that you have to do because the tape's different, right? It, watching a guy who played four years in the SEC mm -hmm. versus you know where every week there's an NFL player lined up across from. Whereas Nick Salaberry, there weren't, wasn't an NFL player lined up across from him until he went to the Senior Bowl, right? Like right. you get a week of seeing that guy with an NFL player lined up across from. So that's why you have to go back to traits. You know, you have to go back to physical capabilities. Uh, how the guy moves, how the guy uses his hands, how he plays the game of football, not necessarily how well he played the game of football because his tape is level of dominance that, like, you're just not going to see from a lot of SEC tackles or a lot of Big Ten tackles and that right. sort of thing. So it's difficult, but you you have to rely on your eyes. And eyes don't lie in terms of, like, this is what wins at the NFL level. This is what it should look like at the collegiate level. So it, it's once you get to this point in the draft, you're either looking for guys who played at a super high level at small schools with the traits that it takes to win at the NFL level, or you're looking for good athletes with what I like to call good excuses, where it's they maybe have all the physical tools that it takes, but there's something about them, whether it's they have to change positions, whether it's they were playing out of position, whether it's they had an injury, or whether it's the scheme they were in just doesn't fit their skill set. Those are the guys I'm targeting at this point in draft. Here we go. The pick is in, and what do we have here? Jacorian Bennett. Jacorian I can't see that far. There we go, Ja'Korian Bennett. <laughs> Ja'Korian Bennett, the Raiders pick Ja'Korian Bennett. Give me a talk about this guy. So, corner out of Maryland. Yep. He was one of the fastest corners. I actually think he was the fastest corner, or second fastest corner. DJ Turner's the fast corner of the combine. 4-3 speed. It shows on tape. He just is a little tight framed. 5'10", 188. You saw him get pushed around a little bit, but Guy's got real deal makeup speed. He has man coverage sort of skill set here. Uh, obviously, the Raiders need all the help they can get at the cornerback position. But I, I, I don't think his tape was too far behind his teammates, Deontay Banks. Uh, Deontay go. Banks has a much more projectable physical skill set. But this was a damn good cornerback duo right. there at Maryland this past year. Not a lot of teams got the best of these two. I love the way he plays that flat foot tough technique where he's lined up off six yards, flat foot, collision, and, and then hit. carry. Mm -hmm. He can do that really well. He is tight, tightly wound, though. You can tell the way his upper body is built, he is tightly wound. Yep. So he's got, um, listen, Ja'Korian Bennett has got a lot of skills. And again, we talked about this with Illinois. We hinted at it with Maryland, with their earlier pick, with, it, with his teammate. There are other people playing good football that are Ohio State, Penn State, and Michigan in the Big Ten. And this is one of them. The, that, that Maryland secondary, again, for them to have two guys come off the board, that's going to be in the recruiting material. Come, come to Maryland, play, play, play corner. We, we'll get it done for you. Well, and their S and C program is going to be pumping these guys up because yeah. we talked about Banks as measurable. Shakorin goes 4'3", 40 and a half inch vertical, 11 one broad jump. Like the athletic high end ability is there. Like I said, the hips, the turn, change of direction ability doesn't quite match his straight line ability that you see there. Does he have to play in the slot? Uh, I don't think so because the speed, like you usually when a guy has that speed, you still want him on the outside. But I, I do think he is going to struggle against bigger wide receivers when right. he is on the outside. Just based upon the size. I think, but the big thing for me watching again the play that kind of that tough technique where you are flat footed waiting for that guy to collision you and he can, you mirror him so you can get hands on and then reroute and disrupt the timing with the quarterback is a really good show for me. So I love that. Um, let's go back to what we were talking about though that evaluation process yep. between small school, big school, and what is it, does, do you think that Saldaveri, you think he was dominant at ODU? N not like that not caliber. Like like, uh, obviously. So in pass protection, it, is, it looks different, right? When you're dominating the run game, it's that's clear. easier to highlight than when you're dominant in pass protection just because dominance in pass protection looks like playing patty cake right. you know, 20 times a game is what it is. You're not pancaking dudes. You're not seeing that physical ability. And – you were never going to see that from Sal he, He's no. not a Trevor Penning-like athlete right. who's going to physically manhandle you. He's going to win with technique. He's going to win with positioning. 
but that's also how you win in the NFL, right? You know, physical dominance is great. The, the Trent Williams of the world, like that's how you reach the pinnacle. But a lot of starters around the league, a lot of high-end starters, you know, the Mitchell Schwartzes of the world, are, we're not Ooh, yeah. elite athletes, oh. right? You know, he likes to say, well, you all saw the combine testing of me because it was, was objectively pretty poor, but it's still a skill position. Even if we don't call it a skill position, offensive line needs skill development as much, if not more, than a lot of other positions on the football field. Oh, yeah. So we got folks in the chat right now. They're saying Eagles are, Eagles are overrated. Okay. Mm, I mean, yeah, they I mean, were, weren't they yeah. just in the Super Bowl? So I think that's a really tough thing to say. Uh, we got <laughs> to pick in, and we're, then we're going to get back to the Eagles. Um, there you go. Oh, my go. Lord. Georgia North. Keely Ringo. <laughs> Here we go. I, I don't even – I didn't even love Keely Ringo as a prospect. Like, when he was getting first-round hype, I was like, you know, I don't see it. He's too uh, He's too big, honestly. Like, he, he does not change directions well because he's, like, 210 pounds. He, he moves kind of just a little – he doesn't have the twitch – that you want from a lockdown outside corner. But at 210 pounds, he plays the position differently. He can get up at the line of scrimmage and end reps before they start because he is that size. And then if you do get a step on him, he's one of the fast corners in the draft. Goes 4-3-5 and was actually like timed faster in high school. So this is a guy who has real deal makeup speed, plays with his hair on fire. You're never gonna question his effort on the back end. Man, he's only 20 years old. Yep. This guy will not turn 21 until this summer. Like, there is a lot of developmental potential here that we have not seen. Eagles to get him. Again, it's just like, Georgia it doesn't North. have to be that hard. It doesn't have to be that hard. Yeah. Some of these teams are making it look hard, but like, just grab the dudes who are falling for unbeknownst reasons, yep. and you're going to look like a good football team. This is a great pick. Yeah, I, I, I love Ringo. I, I've loved him for, I've loved him since the day I saw him. Like, this is a guy that I... Love at first sight. Yeah, it it truly (laughs) was. He's super... I love how physical he is, right? And he loves... He gets hands on you. He's one of the few corners in this draft that gets hands on guys very consistently. Most guys, they open the they open the gate, right? What I mean is they open their hips and they try they try to start running because yeah. they're scared of getting beat deep. With the speed that he has, with his with his ability, he's not worried about getting beat deep. What he wants to do is, as you mentioned, he wants to kill the route before it happens. And if he can do that, that means that the quarterback loses their read immediately. Look at the way he triggers here on the run. Boom, let's go make a play. Like he's he's a good He's a good run defender. I think he, for me, he was still one of the best all-around corners. Mm-hmm. Zone, man, yeah. versus the run. Do you think he has a switch to safety? Do you think he could stick in at corner? Just a positional corner? Where do you think he fits? I think you keep him at corner. He's just kind of like a silo corner where you're not going to be super versatile with him. You're not kicking him inside. You're not asking him to really mirror full route trees, that sort of thing. But if you're backing off into cover three, cover four, right. He's, he can play that. He can play that. And again, like I said, we're talking about some corners going before this that are 23 years old, that are getting up there, fifth-year guys. Yeah. This is a 20-year-old, a redshirt sophomore coming out at this point in the draft who's been productive already. Um, I love the pick. Tackle Blake Freeland. There we go. Thank you, Connor Hughes. He's back on it. Today. Oh, Connor is <laughs> locked in. Freeland's interesting. He was a guy I, I – uh, thought was one of the best developmental tackles in this draft class because, I mean, he is a special athlete. He comes from a family full of athletes. He broke the combine record uh, for vertical jump, I believe, with a 37-inch vertical at over 300 pounds, which is just freaky stuff. And and you see it in the run game. 37-inch vertical and a 10-foot broad jump. You see it in the running game with him, whether it's a lot of stretch zone at BYU. His get-off-the-line-of-scrimmage is just elite. I mean, he gets on guys quickly. Balance concerns, you see him play a little top heavy there, gets out over his toes too often in my for my uh, liking. But also he's at six foot eight, three hundred pounds hard. is skinny. He, he needs to put yeah. on fifteen to twenty pounds of muscle before this guy's seen the football field. But he's going to a spot where you, you know they have a left tackle in Bernard Raymond that they drafted last year that they like. They have a right tackle in Braden Smith that they like a lot, obviously. This is a developmental dude at, at a place where you can have him afford him the time to develop. So uh, I, I think this is a pick that I, I, I like. I think he has swing tackle potential, and, and is definitely not a guy though that you're moving inside there to play right, right. guard. He, he's, at six foot eight, there's no way he's exactly. going to be played guard. He's, he's definitely going to be a tackle. They they just picked up Anthony Richardson, so they need as much offensive line help as they can get. Obviously, he's a developmental player, but getting him helps you keep. You, again, as you said last night. 
you don't need an offensive lineman until you need one. Yep. And so you got to draft them before you need them. And that's what they're, what they're doing with this right here. Um, we have the, I believe it's the Patriots that are coming up next on the clock. But let's go back to this Eagles talk because I wanted to hit on this. The Eagles, we saw the Eagles pick up Jalen Carter at nine, Nolan Smith at 30, both in the first round. Tyler Steen at t- at, 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 in, the, in the third round. Yep. Third round, Sidney Brown. Fourth round, Keely Ringo. I mean, they probably have from the 2021 Georgia team now, which was the gold standard for modern college football defenses. From, yes, from the 2020, not this past year's team, but the two yeah. years ago team. Yeah. Yes. They have the five most impactful players for my money. Jordan Davis, Jalen Carter, Nolan Smith, Nicobe Dean, Keely Ringo. Those were the five best players on that Georgia team. Yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> Those were the guys that, I mean, now there were other good guys, don't get me wrong. Right. I mean, like Quay Walker sure. uh, was sick. Channing um, Tindall, very good. Yes. yes, but those were the those were the five guys. That was it. That yeah. was the that was what is what keyed it to make it the best defense ever. They are all now Philadelphia Eagles for the next four, three to four years at yeah. least. That's insanity. Insanity. Yeah. What do you think? What do you think the Pats are going to do here with this pick? Uh, gosh, I mean the Pats have had a good draft, right? Yeah. I, I'm a fan of what they've done. I love Marte Mapu. I love the way he plays the game. Christian Gonzalez was one of, if not the biggest steal of the first round. Pats do things their own way. I'm trying to pre- we're trying to predict. I, I wouldn't be surprised. Fourth round, I guess they went quarterback they're, last year, but like they they've got the, the corners, wide receivers. They haven't well, addressed would, the wide receiver situation yet. I would love for them Nick Herbig, the Wisconsin linebacker. Okay. They, they love their undersized kind of edge hybrids that can drop into coverage. The true three four outside linebacker right. types. They have a Josh Uche there who is one of the best oh, yeah. in that molds. Nick Herbig's. Just, just probably like a little less athletic version of Josh Uche. Yeah, but them. he's super productive. But yes, that's the thing. With, that's the thing with Nick Herbig is he's incredibly productive for that. And listen, I all I love all those Wisconsin guys. They all play with their hair on fire. What do we got? Let's see. Oh, Jake Andrews. Jake Andrews. That okay. felt like, dude. That felt like a Patriot when I was sitting. The, the uh, Troy interior offensive lineman. Yep. Um, he, he felt like a Patriot watching him on tape. I, I mean, the guys got you. The gosh, who was the old Patriots center that was there for David Andrews? That they it feels a lot like there David Andrews. I don't know if they're brothers actually now that I'm thinking about this. I, <laughs> I will effort, that. but there is high effort, plays the game the right way, a little physically overmatched when I saw him at the senior bowl, but a guy with developmental potential because he's going to work his butt off to do so. So it, that's a Patriot type of interior offensive line. No relation, okay, no there relation. Go. We've got no relation, okay. <laughs> Who do we have coming up next? Right now we are on the, we are currently waiting for the sixth pick of the third round of the, or the fifth, fourth round of the draft. Goodness gracious. The Seahawks are on the clock. The Seahawks, let's take a look at their, what they've done so far. The Seahawks are a team, they, they're one of those teams that have multiple picks. A team that was able to, they need a defensive line, wide receiver, offensive line. They're able to go out there and they get Devon Witherspoon. We love him. Mm-hmm. Jackson Smith and Jigba, love him. That's both first round guys. Second round, Derek Hall, Zach Charbonnet. So they've addressed the wide receiver. They were just edge. They've, they've hit on running back, which wasn't necessarily a need, but it's a thing they wanted. And they addressed defensive line. So right here, what, what, would you, what do you want them to do with what, they, what they've got going on? Because they've already hit on a wide receiver. They've already got an edge rusher. Mm-hmm. Is there somebody in the long defensive interior that would be interesting for them? Well, I mean, out of bar, eh? It's yeah, he's still up there. Still up there. That, that'd that be a guy that I'd be intrigued by if I'm a Seahawks fan. But I'll say this. John Schneider had one of the best, no, he had the best draft run from, I believe it was 2010 to 2012 of any GM mm-hmm. probably ever. He drafted multiple future Hall of Famers in that space. Last year, had a lull of bad drafts. They had traded away a bunch of first round picks. That's kind of how they got to that point where they had trade Russell Wilson. Last year, he was back. One of the best drafts of anyone. They added K. W- Kenneth Walker, Charles Cross, Abraham Lucas, Tariq Woolen, and now this year poised to do a lot of the same. Add Anthony Bradford here. There we go. Into your offensive alignment. One of the most powerful guards in this draft class. It shows immediately on tape with this guy. I mean, he is built like a brick house. Uh, the, you <laughs> see it right there from his lower body to his upper body. Yes. The man can move the line of scrimmage. Not too dissimilar to obviously former LSU interior offensive lineman that's there right now uh, in 
Gabe, uh, no, not Gabe Jackson. He was the one who just left. Uh, who's their left I guard? Got it. Let me pull it up right here. Look at that. The power of computers. Blanking on it. Damian Lewis. That's who Damian I'm thinking Lewis. of. Not too dissimilar in terms of bill wise. Now, Damian Lewis was a little more accomplished than pass protection coming out. That's there probably my concerns with Bradford, but the traits are there. Long arms, big base, can play low, just a guy who needs some seasoning at this point in the draft. Uh, with what they want to do now, running the football, obviously, yeah. this is a guy that can move in the line of scrimmage, give space to Zach Charbonnet, Kent so they, Walker. Yeah, so they address, they get, a, they get a running back, they get another, they get an offensive lineman, you get a wide receiver, you get edge, you're doing, they're doing what they need to do. Oh, and oh, by the way, they got what many consider to be the best corner in the there draft. Go. So, yeah. good draft for the Seahawks, especially as one of those teams that have multiple picks. Next, who's next up? Who, well, we got a pick. Who's in there? Oh, they're coming hot now. Dylan Horton, TCU oh, right. edge. Texans. They're, they're going with some homegrown guys, right? They went Houston wide receiver Tank Dell. Yeah. They're going now TCU. They're, they're, they're going spanning the state of Texas. Uh, yeah. he, he's a guy who, high effort, high motor, doesn't quite know what he's doing now, yep. and, and just kind of a limited limited athlete, too. Like, he's not a special athlete. The guy We saw that run in the third round where it was just like DJ Johnson, Yaya Diaby, um, Byron Young, guys who were just like freaks. Yep. This is... He's a tier below that those guys athletically, but he, get, he wants to get after it. You'll see him track down a lot of quarterbacks outside the pocket. A lot of his production comes on plays like that where effort. it's just pure effort. Uh, obviously one of the keys to this TCU defense from a season ago, but you're going to have to coach this guy up as a pass rusher. He, he needs to add some moves to his arsenal. He but needs to have a move. Seahawks need, <laughs> Seahawks need depth, though. You, you know, they just need some people there, as you're seeing here, a lot of these, that's just... That's just effort. Again, that's just him not giving up on football plays. That's what you consistently saw out of him on tape. Yeah, so good, good. we got Jake Andrews to the Pats. We've got what Jalen Horton to the Seahawks. We're waiting on the Houston Texans now. Uh, the, let me ask you something about TCU, because mm -hmm. we saw Kendra Miller come off the board. Mm -hmm. um, what do we think about D. Winters? Okay, he's to me. I had a UDFA grade on Winters. Okay. I, I, I did not see him as a draftable prospect. The one guy from TCU defense that I thought is wet and that I want to see come off the board here is Trey Tomlinson. The Trey Tomlinson, Ladane Tomlinson's nephew. Yeah, the five foot eight corner who's going to be one of the smallest corners ever drafted. Oh, here we go. We got it. We got a top fifty There's, player come off the board here. There he is, out of Bowie. The Colts making some plays right now. Uh, I, Northwestern, right? Yes, the yeah. Northwestern DN slash DT comes off the board. He is the freakiest athlete along the defensive line I've ever seen. He ran a 44940 at 282 pounds. He is 109 pounds heavier than Jordan Addison and ran the exact same 40 times. Good grief. Jordan Addison plays wide receiver. This guy plays defensive line. And, and so he was a little out of position, in my opinion, at Northwestern, playing a lot more on the edge. Now, they kicked him on the interior a little this year, but he did not look comfortable because he really hadn't played there. Right. But I thought he went down in the Senior Bowl, and he looked like he belonged. He had a bull rush rep against Jarrett Patterson, Northwestern guard slash, or excuse me, Notre Dame guard slash center, yep. where he walked him back to the goal posts from the goal line on a bull rush. Patterson was pissed afterwards but that just shows you the level of explosiveness this guy possesses and yeah he's undersized for an interior guy but he has a six foot ten inch wingspan he has long arms Th this is a pick that I, I am floored he lasted this long I there yeah. has to be some injury or Medical. some reason why because he is a much better prospect in terms of potential than the, that group of guys we just saw come off the board in the third round that were high-end athletes. This is a higher-end athlete right. with more projectable NFL tools. I, I am, and with better tape, frankly, in my opinion. Florida lasted this long, but the Colts start off with two elite athletes at two positions that are valuable that I think could see the field at some point during the rookie contract. So, fan of what the Colts have done here on day three. Is this the Colts? Hang on a second. My order is looking different. I'm looking. I'm, just so I'm the trades are coming so hot right now. Yeah, we got so we got Dylan Horton already. We're okay. We're just ahead. That's the thing. That's, yeah. that's what threw me off. Boom. There we go. So we're looking at the on the the Colts. We already know their pick. We already know who they got. That's amazing. This is this is a good pick. You think he? You think what? How do you think the Colts use him? 
on the edge, or do you, are they kicking him down inside and asking him to bulk up a little bit? I think they're kicking him to three tech. Uh, like in that defense, you obviously have DeForest Buckner, but he's getting a little up there yes, he is. in age. And you've seen his production maybe take a step back from when he was at his prime after they first traded for him in recent years. And they just like athletes there, right? That's Chris Ballard's MO. He right. drafted Quiddy Pay, who was a freak. Yes. Uh, he has consistently done so over the years. And, and this is a guy who's not tooled too dissimilarly. Like you watch their tape and it doesn't look too dissimilar from a guy like Quiddy Pay and what he did at Michigan. So. Man, at this point in the draft, the picks, the two picks they've had in the fourth round right now, I, I'm a big, big fan of. So yeah, far. so guys, folks, we are the reason I got that messed up is we are ahead of, of the draft. Yeah. And to reference it, the Colts got Blake Freeland, and then they added in um, Adabawa. Ada Bawari. It, it's it's like a uh, it's like a Canadian guy saying he's at a bar. Yeah. At a bar, eh? At a bar, eh? Got it. Um, oh, that was that's the perfect explanation. Colts draft though. Yeah. Anthony Richardson, there Julius Prince, Josh Downs, they've had they've had themselves a draft. Ooh, Guys, the Browns we got, have had a draft, too. There we go. DeWan Jones from Ohio State. He is the pick for the Browns. This is a guy we thought could go a lot earlier than this. We wait, he had to wait until day three to hear his name called. He's a massive, giant human man. I compared him to Orlando Brown just because he's so huge. Orlando Brown, the kid, the cat out of Oklahoma. He's humongous. This is a huge player. Like, 6'8", three, 374. He, guess what? Could be bigger. <laughs> He's, he, he, oh, dude, yeah. I mean, 374 is when he had to cut down to make the combine and run a 5'3", 540 there. On tape, he's probably pushing 400. Right. And he can play at that size, though. Yes. I, I mean, I usually do not like bigger, slower tackles. But I am a fan of Dewan Jones for the same reason I was a fan of Orlando Brown coming out. Right. Skill. The, yes. the guy gets the position. And, and he's also, like, so freakishly big that he can play the game differently than your run-of-the-mill six foot four, 315 pound tackle, right? right? Cause at 6'8", 374 with 11 and 5 eighths inch hands, the biggest hands ever measured at the combine, 36 and 3 eighths inch arms, the biggest arms, longest arms of anyone in this draft class, he gets on you, he short sets a lot, he, he you know, quick sets guys a lot where he just gets his hands on them and then once he does, it's over. Yeah. You cannot get off him and around him with those hands, with that length, now, he does need to be protected a little bit. If you are a team that's a heavy drop back, deep drop passing game, put my tackles on an island, this isn't going to be your guy, right? Like, right. He, he can be susceptible to inside moves. He can get knocked off balance when he faces speed. But if you put a tight end to his side, if you have a mobile quarterback, right. like obviously the Cleveland Browns do, that you want to keep in the pocket, that has to be kind of bull rushed, you're Ooh. not bull rushing this dude. You're just, quite frankly, not going to. And he obviously goes to a great situation to develop. But my favorite story about Dewan Jones was he tweaked he, had, he tweaked like a minor injury after day one of the senior bowl was sitting out, but he still comes to practice. He's watching the one-on-ones and he's calling out the moves that the defenders are gonna do before they do them because he has watched these guys, his tape studies to that point, and he just knows. And he's like, watch the inside move, watch the bull rush. Get your hands up. He's no, that, that to me is skill. That to me is what the high end tackles at the next level have. That's why I go to bat for this guy and why at this point in the draft, that's a steal for the Browns. Yeah, I mean, that's an A plus if we're still in grades. Oh, yeah. But the thing, here's the thing I love that works on me for two, that story works on me two ways. One, that means he studies. Yes. Love a guy that studies. Two, he don't know those guys from Adam, those other offensive linemen, mm -hmm. he's but he's helping out his group. Yep. So when he gets in that offensive line room with the Browns, He's going to help make everybody better. I think that goes a long way. That's something that you get. I think he got that from Ohio State, playing with a guy like Paris Johnson. It's one of those things where you end up working together because you know that if you guys are all pulling in the same direction, there's nobody that can beat you. Yes. Except Georgia. The, the, the Browns now, so they went Cedric Tillman in the third, Siaki Ika in the third as well, and now Dewan Jones. They got three guys who I had higher on my board than where they came off the board, and at three positions – that are valuable positions and positions that can make an impact on this roster. All right, folks, we got a trade. You see it right there on the board. The Jets trade with the Pats, with Pats. So they're coming up to 112 for 120 and 184. So here we go. The Patriots, they select. <laughs> they moved up to get him. Chad. They Island. moved up to get him. So I'm going to ask you the another one. The run on kickers is real here. Here we go. Let me ask you one of these questions that I that I put together. Um, yeah, we can move on. Can we talk? Because right now, this is a good, good time uh -huh. to talk about value versus fit. Yeah. Maybe they need a, not maybe great they need value a, there. Maybe they need a kicker, <laughs> but it's not good value, right? Yeah. Like, what's the difference? Like, that, if you need a kicker, sure. But you don't have to value a kicker so much to give away 
those two picks. Yeah, so I mean, you think back to whether it's Alberto Aguayo, whether yeah. who was a second rounder, whether it's uh, Sebastian Janikowski. Who, yeah, who was the the Browns the guy they drafted in the oh, third yeah. or fourth round? Oh my goodness! Um, but I think about Mike. Was it Mike Nugent too? Yeah, just kicking was a is a small sample size. Yes, you do not get too many attempts, and especially at the points that are valuable when you get to the NFL, which is forty-five plus. Yep. And so you are only evaluating a guy on. Uh, you, you need a lot of attempts to basically get a big enough sample size to feel confident that whatever percentage he was kicking at in college is the percentage he's going to kick at in the NFL. Yes. And so the draft track record, there is a 0% correlation between draft position at the kicker position and how good you are in the NFL. Right. So I get that you need a kicker, but a lot of times um, it, there's just so many factors that go into success at the NFL level that – when you draft one, you just really don't know what you're getting, wow. unfortunately. So, so the value versus uh, versus fit, though, it's it's a difficult conversation, and it's something that we saw the Lions basically say, like we we just we we, we prioritize fit. prioritize fit, prioritize fit, and, and there's multiple ways to build a roster, but I think the more you just focus on value, and the more you say, you know, admit that I don't necessarily know what's best, like I don't know better at any position than anyone else. As long as I, and you've seen this with the Eagles and what they do, as long as I prioritize the positions that are consistently valuable, that provide the biggest cap edge for me, and that if I draft a defensive end and he plays well, I don't have to go out and pay $20 million right. in free agency for him. Whereas running back, if I draft a running back and plays well, well, I could have gone out and spent $8 million on Zeke. You right. know, like $8 million on uh, a quality NFL running back and knowing I'm gonna get a good one. That to me is the biggest difference and why I say, you know, try to prioritize value as much as possible in the draft. Yeah, it's, a, it's they're still operating in a very small economy in the, as the NFL itself, but also each team. Uh, the Falcons have selected DB Clark Phillips, Phillips out of Utah. This was a guy, I, I find him to be phenomenal. I think he's got great patient feet. He, play, he goes up and makes plays. He plays bigger than he is. And he's got kind of that, what is it? was Nomni Asimov style game where you will not hear about him all game. And you do not challenge this man. What do you think? The only the only the reason why he falls here. Yeah. Five nine is you literally can see it on screen. Five nine one eight four four five one. Bingo. Small and unathletic is a bad combo for a lot of positions in the NFL. Specifically corner. Specifically corner. But I'll say this. He's not playing outside corner. That's where he played at Utah. This is a slot corner going to a team that needs a slot corner. You have your outside dudes. You have A.J. Terrell. You got Jeffrey Okuda. Those are press, long, outside corners. Comp right okay. there, Mike Hilton. This is a this is a man slot corner. Like, him and man coverage is when I thought he was at his best. Getting his eyes yep. on receivers from off position and being able to match and mirror, I, I thought he was special in that regard. Yeah, he I just mean, now, the problem is tracking speed down the football field. But if you throw him in the slot, Track speed on the football field don't matter. You ain't running a ton of verticals from the slot. You have a safety over the top. That's how that position works. So, guy's a dog. Guy gets after. He plays the game the right way. This is a fantastic pick, in my opinion, for the Atlanta Falcons. I, I love that last clip that we just showed where he was playing off, and then you watch him do that flat foot read mm -hmm. and then push the wide receiver out just a little bit, enough for him to kind of touch cloth, slow him down, bring him down to your speed. Bring that. If that's a 4-4 guy, that's a 4-3 guy, Collision him, bring him down to your speed. Now you can run with him. And that's the beauty of playing corner. There are all these little things that you have to do to make sure that you can run with them, bring them down to your speed, and go make plays. Love this pick. Uh, I'm a big Clark Phillips fan. We got a division rival, divisional rival here with the Carolina Panthers on the clock. Let's see what they do. And I think their pick is in, and then we're going we're gonna to head into the, the Bears are coming up next. The Panthers are really... Oh, here we go. They redeemed themselves. I, I love go. Chandler Zavala. Let's go. We got, we got footage for him? Let's show it. He's a NC State okay. interior offensive lineman, played guard, so he transfers from D2, two years at D2, right. transfers to NC State. First year, I think only four games, then had a back injury. And then this past year, like, wasn't on radars because of that. Like, right. no one knew about this guy from a scouting perspective heading into this season. Balls out this past season. They ha has a tremendous year. I think he allowed only four pressures all season long at guard. And then he goes to his pro day and had the best pro day, in my opinion, of any of the interior offensive linemen in this draft class. Uh, he's six foot four, 316 pounds, and he had a 32-inch vertical 
a 7.583 cone, a 4.7 short shuttle, and did 30 bench press reps. The guy can move. The guy uses his hands well. See the comp from TJ Lang. I'm a big fan of this guy. He was my third-ranked guard in this draft class and not too far behind guys like Osiris Torrance and Steve Avila, who were my right. one and two. Like He was close to them on tape, in my opinion. So to get him at this point, I think he could steal a starting gig away. Maybe not day one, but at some point from right. the guards they have there in Carolina. Well, let me ask you something. They, you, uh, I almost called him UNC. The Panthers go out and get, they, they go and get Iki Aquano mm -hmm. from NC State. Now they add, add Zavala in from NC State. They found a well that they like. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, I mean, they played next to each other last year. You got Brady Christensen at guard right now. He, he To me, he was always a tackle. I, I don't think guard's his best fit. I would almost want to just put him back as my swing tackle mm -hmm. behind Taylor Mouton, behind Iki Aquano. One of them gets hurt, like, Injuries do happen right in. every year. You got a guy that can slide right in, and now Chandler Zavala plays that left guard next to his college teammate when they were such a dominant run game a couple of years ago. Uh, this this Panthers line, I will say this: I, I don't trust the Panthers' weapons right now. Right. I think they still need to do a lot of work in that regard in the future for Bryce Young, but they gave him a good offensive line. This is a line that he can work with right out the gate that is not going to be a liability whatsoever. I'm not going to wood for that, but I, I do think this is a solid, at least average, if not above average, offensive line at this point. Yeah, I think so too. And I think the big key, because remember, we've all, we've, everyone's talked about it. Bryce Young needs to be protected. He's yep. so small. He's so small. Injury, injury. And they're, they're working on protecting him. I think that's great. You talked about the weapons there. Uh, they, drafted, they just drafted Jonathan Mingo. They have DJ Chark. LaVisca Chenault, who we mentioned yesterday, hasn't really kind of lived up to what we expected. Terrace Marshall Jr., same thing. So this is going to be interesting to see if they get anything else. Oh, by the way, they did, they did also get at, sign Adam Thielen. So yes. that's, a, that's an upgrade for them. I, I'm looking at their receiving core, though, and I'm thinking it's third down. I'm right. seeing press man across the board. Who am I throwing it to? Exactly. And right. I, I, there's not one I love just yet. So I do think they're still in need of a number one. Yep. This could be a team that DeAndre Hopkins would make a lot of sense for. You know, if DeAndre Hopkins is available, this is a team I would be kicking the tires on just because that's what I'm missing uh, so far. Bears pick is in. They pick Rashawn Johnson, the backup running back from Texas. What do you Ooh. think about him? I, I'm a fan of his. Now, he, he is the David Montgomery replacement in this offense. Bingo. They, they are similar-ish players in that not super great long speed, but great between the tackles running backs, great short yardage running backs, and Tremendous contact balance. He actually had a higher broken tackle rate than B. John Robinson. Now, a lot of the times that's because he's the guy playing mop-up duty. He's the sure. guy playing against the smaller schools when it's out of touch. But at the same time, the guy is elusive. He's, he came to Texas as a quarterback, was supposed to be the backup. And before his freshman year, they had injuries at running back. And they said, you want to switch to running back? He I'm said, sure. yeah. And they said, let's go. And now he was backing up B. John the past few years, but he was doing his thing when he was called upon, like I mentioned, that high broken tackle rate, uh, just doesn't have, like I said, the long speed. Once he gets out into space, he can get hawked down. He went four, five, eight at the combine. So you have that aspect that's gonna be missing from his game, but he's got long arms. He's got a good stiff arm and he is a powerful back that will not go down on first contact. So basically, like I said, just Dave Montgomery walks in free agency. This guy slots right in, no down, no got, drop off and play. They have Deontay Foreman, Khalil Herbert, They've got Luckily. Travis Homer, Tristan Ebner. Where does he where does he fit in, in the, with those four? So I, I love Khalil Herbert as a starter there. I, I think he has the best speed mm -hmm. uh, of those guys, and I want speed with Justin Fields right now. Truthfully, like I, I'm surprised. I would have. I, I hope they still go for like a Keaton Mitchell later on, okay. like someone who can really hit home runs. But I, I like Khalil Herbert as a starter. But I think you're going to get a. Uh, by committee backfield there, mm -hmm. and, and it's going to be a pretty good split between him and Roshan Johnson. I think both those guys get a lot of touches. There we go. I like that. All right, we got um, there we Hackers go. on there the clock. Is. Let's see what they got. Don't screw it up. <laughs> oh, he's not, he's not bad. Okay. Okay, there we go. The Packers have selected Colby Wooden. Tell us about him. So Colby Wooden is 6'4", 273. He's a tweener. So 273, you're thinking, I mean, they just drafted a guy who's 272 in the first round, and you're thinking edge, right? Yeah. But this is an interior defensive lineman. I think he's very skilled. I think he knows what he's doing, but he's not a super high-end athlete. You know, I just said, the guy drafted in the first round went 4'5'8 in the yeah. 40. He went 4'7'9 at the same right. size. So, so not quite the explosiveness, but he's a little quick, uses his hands really well on the interior, and a guy that if 
you know, you can continue to put on muscle, get into the 290 range, that's a player. That's a guy that can hold up as a 4-5 technique in that defense. So um, at this point in the draft, they're just trying to get depth, trying to get guys who, when they're on the football field, aren't liabilities, right? Because they had too many of those a season ago after some injuries struck along their defensive line. I, this is a guy that won't be a liability for him. I, I really like his ability to disengage. Yep. Like, that's something that I really like about him. Like, you see him right there, there the, with the throw. That guy almost felt if that, if that guard didn't run into his own player, he would have been on his back. Mm -hmm. I love his ability to throw. He disengages incredibly violently, and that's what I like to see out of, of a player in that position. Even though he's not as big as what you would expect from a three yes. technique or as big as you would expect from a guy that's playing at the one, the reality of it is with the violence, with the strength, with that power – comes the ability to disengage and we just watched those clips and we got a chance to watch this guy truly disengage and that's a huge pick for them so I think he's a guy that's going to be able to contribute pretty quickly yeah I think he's a rotational player but you needed rotational players you, you lost um gosh I'm blanking on the guy's name they lost the Vikings in free agency but like you you lost some pieces to this defensive line and it was already thin so it definitely um a, value, a, a position of need for them, even though the value, uh, that's kind of where I had him on the board in the 120 range. Right. You know, he's one, he goes at 116, so that's pretty spot on. Uh, this is going to be really interesting to see how this all shakes out because we just saw we just saw guys like Dylan Horton come off the board. We saw Rashad Johnson come off the board. We got another one coming off the board right here. Let's see. City style. There we go. There we go. Look at that. Drafting athletes so along they, the interior offensive line. Let me see what happened here. So the, the Patriots traded up to get a kicker and now they are getting offensive linemen this it, i'm a fan of this guy i had him 114th on, okay. the, on my draft board so this is you know comes off the board 117 so a little before even where he came off the board but he's six foot five 320 and if you watch here the guy can move you know he can move a lot better than someone like an anthony bradford who just came off the board from lsu this is not a phone booth guard this is a guard that can climb to the second level, locate guys. He ran a 5.0740 at the combine at that size. Um, obviously, at Eastern Michigan, level of competition is a concern. Sure. I, I do think he's not a day one starter by any means, despite you know having six years of collegiate play, being oh. 24 years old already. He's probably still your backup guard, but you have two good guards in place there in New England. You, you don't need a starter. You need depth. And right. this is a great depth piece for them in that, you know, if called upon, I think he can step in and start two for you. So really? I, I, the, the Patriots know interior O-line scouting. I, I would not question them too much on that. That's what I was going to I was going to say. It really feels like the Patriots are kind of gearing up for another, like, Belichick kind of being like, okay, let me show you what I can do. The let, me show you why, let me show you why I'm the man. They're setting up for the zag, which is the ground and pound. They are trying to get back to what the Steelers are kind of trying to get back right. to, which is just move the football, take teams out of these two high shells that everyone wants to play. So let's talk. Let's before we get to the next pick, let's talk about that because we're a little bit in, in mm -hmm. front and the commanders are on the clock. When you say the zig, he set up for the zag. So basically, we're seeing smaller, smaller linebackers. Mm -hmm. We're seeing more five defensive back packages, more six defensive back packages. Yes, but we talk about the Steelers. So I'll go with the Pats. They are beefing it up so that your guys won't be able to stop their guys because they got a lot of big dudes. Is that is that an accurate representation? I think that's fair. Like the rise of teams, like you mentioned, playing either 220-pound backers that don't want to take on blocks to yep. save their life, that are taking safeties out of the box, making them play the run with six guys, seven guys at times. Um, when that's the case... You better make them pay when they want to do right. that. You have to be able to, or else teams are going to live in that. And when you live in these two high shells, it just puts caps on your passing game. It makes your quarterback have to be damn near perfect right. in the underneath and intermediate game to move the ball down the football field because one drop, one air and pass, and you're a three and out. You're, yep, you're coming you're off the football field. So getting that five, six yards on first down when you do see a light box with the run game is invaluable in today's NFL. Oh, picks just in. Braden Daniels. Um, that's what they watch. The Washington Commanders select Braden Daniels. So this is a high, high end athlete. You watch him move. That looks like a tight end, but he is kind of built like a tight end too. 294 pounds. He came in at the combine playing tackle there. Started his career at guard. He will be a guard 
at the next level. At you know, 294? I think he's going to be a guard or a center, truthfully, at that size is okay. where probably he's at his best because this dude pops off the line of scrimmage. His twitch is evident from snap one to the last snap of the game. He will fly, but he is – the guy is – out of control. I mean, he, he plays the game. The cop there is Kendrick Green, who's really struggled yep. to transition to the NFL because of similar reasons in that he flies head down in the contact, thinking there's no way in the world I'm going to miss this guy. And then more often than not, he gets swam, ends up on his face. Like, there is a lot of seasoning that he needs, but – you give him that seasoning. He reminds me a little bit of like Shaq Mason in that regard. Remember okay. Shaq Mason coming out of Georgia Tech, where yes. it's just like, look at that guy fly around the football field, but can he control it? Control it. You get this guy to control it, like Shaq Mason uh, finally figured out in New England before obviously bouncing around. After that, you have a starting center slash guard in the end. The cool thing for me was watching him play against Florida and Ohio State. Two teams that we both have extremely high talent levels. Two teams, and we're going to see it here again. Um, watch the way, listen, get off me, okay? And then he wants to go He wants to go run. He's ready to look for somebody else. He can get the job done. I love this here. Boom, okay. Look at the way he moves to that second level. That's against Penn State, another team that's got a pretty high talent level. He can do that, and that's what you want. You want that in, you mentioned him playing guard. I think that obviously there's got to be some work in, in pass pro. Yes. Either at either tackle or guard. He's got to be some work in pass pro. But listen, when you get a guy like this, you got to be absolutely thrilled with Braden Daniels because he's so. Oh, we got a trade. Kansas City moving up to 119. Okay, so Kansas City is now on the clock, not the Vikings. Okay. Interesting. Kansas City. Let's see what they've done so far. I feel like no one's picked in their actual spot so far in the fourth round. We have been, of the players, there's been only. Five, or six players drafted in this round that were the initial picks by them. Good grief. <laughs> That's incredible. Um, here we go. Top players available. Hopefully we see Tanner McKee come off the board here sometime in the fourth round. I, I don't think he lasts past the fifth. He's good. Well, where does, what's a good fit for Tanner McKee? Because I know some folks haven't, don't know who he is, didn't watch a ton of him. What's a good fit for Tanner McKee? I, that's a good question. I, I, I think he's a guy who is a pocket passer. So someone that's going to, uh, to me, not too dissimilar I see as a prospect to a guy like um, Brock Purdy, who came out last year and obviously balled mm -hmm. out. I'm not saying he's going to do that by any means, but that's the kind of offense you want him to go to, is what I'm saying, is he can work the middle of the field really well. He's tall. He's the tallest quarterback in this draft, 6'6", six six, 230, can really see that area of the field because of it. Oh, the Chiefs go a little off the wall here. Shamari Connor. Guy did not have in my top 200. Ooh. Safety out of Virginia Tech. Um, oh. It's a, I'll tell you, before we get to him, I, just Virginia Tech-wise, rough, rough road for them. Yeah. Like, it's been a rough, like this is a school that, there was a time that they were being called DBU. Like they were in the discussion with LSU, with Florida, with Florida State, with Miami, with Ohio State, and with Texas. And now they've kind of just fallen off the radar. Okay, let's get to, let's get to Shamari Connor. Uh, safety that, yeah, you said you didn't have him in, in the top 200. Did not have him in the top 200. Uh, I think he's just a solid. Like I didn't have him top 200 because I think he's just limited upside-wise. I think this is probably more of a special teams type of pick. Sure. I think he, he plays the game in a way that you want a safety play. Like He, he has this sort of aggression. Uh, aggression, the want to, like sticks his nose in it, that sort of football player that you're getting. I just didn't see high-end coverage ability necessarily on tape. I, I don't think he's usurping Brian Cook in that defense right. by any means, but he's a guy that you, you could probably be reliable at this point in the draft. And again, special teams value as well. Well, we got a we got a little quick thing. I wanted to ask you about this. When do you start drafting for special teams specifically? So, anytime on day three. It, truthfully, if you're an NFL team, that is depending on how bad your special teams are. But like a sixth, seventh round is almost. Exclusively, exclusively yeah. for special teams. If a guy can't play teams at that point in the draft, um, chances are you're, you're not drafting. There's very few teams that take a chance there. Um, fourth round at this point is probably early for me. Sure. But if you get towards the back end of the fourth round or if you're a team like the Chiefs, where it's like... Luxury pick. Where do I have a starting spot? Where is the guy even going to be able to do anything for me on this roster? That's when, that's when you can make a play like this where it's like, yeah, he's probably more geared towards special teams, but if you want to put him in the defensive backfield, or excuse me, yeah, defensive backfield, you can do it in a pinch. Yeah, I think that's the key. And listen, it's, it's going to be interesting to me because 
I believe they still have Devin Bush, right? And he was a guy that kind of fit into that same mold of a special teams guy when he back when he played for the Bears and when he played and then he got yes, Deion Bush, yeah, yeah it's similar. It's a similar player. Yeah. So does that mean that they're going to move on from him? I don't know. They, they got I mean they got Mike Edwards too. Yeah. Justin Reed. They have options at safety, so this is truly just a depth piece. Yeah. All right, what do we got? We got the Jets with the pick in. Okay, Jets, what are you doing? Carter Warren. Here we go. Okay. Pittsburgh OT. He's, I thought he was going to go higher. Okay. Now, he had an injury this past season. Uh, I believe he only played two games before that injury. Um, and, and so comes out, excuse me, four games before that injury. Misses the final nine with the knee but he has the tools, kind of, I saw him and Wanya Morris who came off the board in the third uh -huh. round in similar light. I thought Wanya is a little more powerful, but these are guys who have the size, 6'5", 3'11", have the length, and kind of are close in pass protection. You see it at times with him in pass protection. The consistency is the biggest thing, though, with him that we haven't yet seen and then obviously didn't get to see because right. he got hurt this past year. Comp for him I had was Yadni Kajust, who was kind of a similar guy who came oh, out wow. with injuries. Never put it together. It never put it together, and obviously it isn't starting anywhere now. But this is this is where you take that guy to where, hey, he figures it out. We've been begging for a right tackle. You know, we we need that desperately here in New York. This just gives us another swing at that position, another chance that we find our starting tackle of the future. So we're looking at Will McDonald the fourth, Joe Tipman, and now Carter Ward for the three picks that the Jets have had so far. They are clearly looking to shore up that offensive line. And I think they've, they've attacked it in the two guys that you feel pretty solid about. Yeah, so I think the first round, they, I think they just loved Will McDonald. Right. Like that, that to me was just Robert Sala saying, I like this guy. Putting his nuts out there and saying, I, this is, the tape was good enough that I think he's right. here. Yeah, you know, right? It wasn't a need, it wasn't anything like that. But then after that, they kind of scrambled and were like, I wouldn't even call it scramble. Tipman was like, you know, the first center to come off the board, but basically saying, well, now we got to plug the holes that are kind of missing that we're worried about because we're in a championship window. You know, we trade for Aaron Rodgers for one year, not because we want to just make the playoffs. Right. We're doing it because we want to win a Super Bowl, so we need guys that can make an impact tomorrow. Warren, I don't think, makes an impact tomorrow, but I do think Joe Tipman can. Tipman absolutely can. I think that's going to be exciting to see him slide in there and really kind of be, at some point, he's, he's going to run that offensive line. That's, yeah. that's the ultimate goal for him. He ain't quite Nick Mangold, but this is your 10-year center type guy. There you go. Um, let me see what else we got here. So, well, we talked about this because we got Tipman going, what did he go, round two? Mm -hmm. And then we've got Carter going in round four. What are the kind of diminishing odds of getting on the roster, having an impact on the roster? One Round one, that's 100%. At least you're be, playing. You're, 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 you're playing. You better play. One. Yeah. But as we go down, what are we looking at? Mm -hmm. so, so I like to think about it like this. Round one is you're starting them whether you like it or not, usually. Yeah. He's going to be on your team. You you better have found a guy who is a quality starter. Now, the hit rate's usually more like 50% or lower, right. truthfully, of guys that are quality starters. That's why I say when you can find, you know, a layup like a Michael Mayer, that that is those are guys that he will be right. one of the best 30 players in this draft class, right? Like may, maybe he falls outside the top 30, but he will be eventually. Um, so I still advocate for those guys. But it's that's what you're looking for in round one. Two and three – is kind of where GMs separate themselves. Round one picks oftentimes pick themselves. Rounds two and three is when you cannot find duds. You cannot find guys that cannot see the football field. You have to have at least guys who, when they are uh, on a football field, are at least not liabilities in rounds two and three. Right. That, to me, is where that point in the draft. And then four, five, six, seven is icing on the cake, right? If you find something there, great. More likely than not, that's a guy who's going to be a backup for you that you're hoping you don't have to go to free agency to go sign, right? Because of the rookie wage deal, those guys are super cheap at that point in the draft. They, they are the cheapest players that you will yeah. ever get on your football field are fourth round picks and later in UDFAs. That is as little as you'll pay a guy. And so if you can get a guy that say, you know, my corner goes down and I have to sub him in, or my offensive line, my center goes down and Brain Daniels has to come in there for me, if he can not be a problem for you, that's right. a win. Like that, that we call that a win for a fourth round pick. If that guy is not a problem when he sees the football field. So, uh, again, the expectations for these guys is backups at this point. But you, you're not, you're not, 
you're not necessarily swinging for the fences. You're, you know, like right. we said in round three, you're swinging for competency right here is yeah. all you're really looking for. We're looking at your big board right here. Mm -hmm. Tanner McKee is at the top. Are you so surprised that Luke Whippler's still there? I, I am very surprised about Luke Whippler. Some of these other guys, I get why. Herbig's a tweener. Travis Hodges Tomlinson, super undersized. Antonio Johnson, just a slot over the course of his career. Mm -hmm. But Whippler's like a redshirt sophomore coming out at center. He is a young center. Yeah. Super productive. Very good. R really like only struggled, only bad tape this past season was against Mozzie Smith, and that's a first rounder who's a grown man in terms of his play strength. And yeah, that's why you're worried is because Whippler's not that strong. But again, he's a redshirt sophomore. He is three years younger than John Michael Schmitz, who came out and went in the second round. Right. And I thought their tape was somewhat comparable from this past season. So you're telling me in three years, this guy's not going to improve the way John Michael Schmitz has improved the past three years? I, I'm floored. I think someone's getting a starting center, and it's going to be one of my favorite picks of the draft when he does come off the board. The other one, Juice Scruggs, right? Juice Scruggs went ahead of him. Not, went ahead of him too. Scruggs is solid. Um, he went, where did he go in the draft? So 61? I, I would have preferred Whippler in that conversation. But I, right. I, again, like I'm not... Those are all starting centers also. Like, I, I think there were probably four in this draft class that I had top uh, 110, and Whipple is the only one not to come off the board so far. Yeah, he's still there. So we'll see what happens with him. We are at pick number, this is the 19th pick of the fourth round, pick number 121. So we've got, goodness, we've got a handful of picks to go in this, in this fourth round, and then we're moving on to the, onto the, onto the fifth. What are Jaguars, we we're like, we're at the halfway point almost. We're 18 we're, picks in, 14 picks to go I, I do I do want to see so Daniel Jeremiah tweeted before this he said expect quarterbacks to come off early it's been I they have know. not no. <laughs> there's not no. been one to come off one. in this fourth round but but I'm curious to see so I prefer when, Tanner McKee because of kind of what we broke down earlier but I know Jaron Hall is in that mix to come off the board sure. the BYU quarterback DTR, Dorian Thompson Robinson, the UCLA quarterback, who yeah. Chris Sims is unbelievably high on. Adam, like his fourth QB. All right. Uh, and, and then also, uh, gosh, the last one is uh, Jake Hayner from Fresno State. It could all be possibilities come off the board here soon. This is a guy like Ventro Miller. Ventro Miller out of Florida. I think he's just a good linebacker. I, obviously, I know he's, he's in the he's, he's going in the fourth round, the 19th pick of the fourth round, pick number 121. He's a kid that played at Florida, played a lot of football at Florida. He's he's. He, I think he's got the opportunity to be uh, an every down starting linebacker in the NFL. And that's, we just talked about value. If you can get that guy in the fourth round, then you're doing something right. I think he's definitely going to help you on special teams. But look at the way he's able to run sideline to sideline. I love that about him. You see him there turn his hips in coverage and go get a PBU. That's a beautiful play right there. You don't see that very often. <laughs> what do you think about Ventrell? This guy is a straight line dynamo. I mean, when he wants to come downhill, he will rock. Yes. He has legit sideline to sideline speed. He's a touch stiff for my liking when you ask him to flip his hips, run down the football field, change directions in space. I don't think you're ever getting much of a high-end coverage linebacker, but he's a guy who can make an impact as a blitzer. Um, he, he's a guy that can play the run at a high level and obviously played against the highest level of competition at Florida. I will, though, just say of note, was at one point dismissed from the Florida yes. program back in 2019. So that... Uh, obviously could factor into why he is still available at this point in the draft. Yeah, next up, do we got the – there we go, let's do it. The Arizona Cardinals, they select John Gaines, the UCLA off – is he a guard or tackle? Guard? It, that's a guard. Yeah, yeah. He, he's a little undersized. That's, you know, the biggest issue with him, Six foot four, 303, play strength. A bit of an issue, but he's one of the best athletes in this draft class. He had a 4-4-5 four, four, short shuttle. His ability to mirror quickness on the interior, some of the best in this draft class. I believe he had the fastest short shuttle and the fastest three cone of any interior lineman at the combine. That's what you want in terms of pass protection, right? That, right. that is that is what translates to the NFL in that regard is just positioning, the ability to stay in front of guys. I, I don't think you're ever getting a high-end run blocker out of a guy like John Gaines. I just don't see him having that level of physicality that he plays with. But you got to protect Kyler, right? The, yeah. you, you see right there, that is what you are drafting him for. And, right. and this is a point where you find starting guards. Uh, more often than not, these guys are playing on your football team, and it's still valuable to find them. So uh, I, I like what the Cardinals have done here. Uh, they're Thanks. really addressing this offensive line and trying to make sure that Kyler Murray and that ACL doesn't happen again. He's, help, he's helping with that. I mean, he's he's creating creases for what was a very, very impressive UCLA run game oh, yeah. and finding a way to create space for people. 
Um, here we go. Next up, we've got the Seahawks taking DT, Cameron Young, out of Mississippi State. This guy is a, he's a hoss, dude. Like, he plays big time. He, he's got heavy hands. Yes. It, this is a, one of the better athletes in this DT class. He like said heavy hands. He has big hands, 10 inch hands, Ooh. a six foot, 10 inch wingspan, 34 and a half inch arms. Like, he is a block controller, is how I described it. He's right. a guy who is going to two gap or one long arm you and just go left or right on you. I, I don't think he offers much in the way of pass rushing. No. I don't see the twitch, the lateral agility to kind of shimmy shake to kind of get around you. But as far as silo run defenders, there aren't a ton better in this draft class. To me, I had him higher than a guy in Byron Young who went probably a full round earlier, the Alabama defensive tackle. I just think he's a more projectable NFL athlete to that position for what he's going to be asked to do. So uh, I'm a fan of this pick. Yeah, his arms are longer than I, than I remember them being. Like, like just re-watching this, his yeah. arms are a lot longer than I remember. But he still, I, th I think he still plays with good leverage, even though he does have some longer arms. Yeah, he plays low for his size. Um, and again, you're, you're looking at, these are these are role players that are coming right. off the board here. These aren't guys that- Short yardage. Exactly. This first is, down. This is a guy that can play a role for you and you feel comfortable in him doing so on your roster. Yeah, goal line, like that's, he fits in there. Okay, we got the Ravens, the Ravens. Who are they picking? Tavius Robinson. Tavius Robinson, okay. Where do you have him on your board? He was a little lower down my board. I get why he comes off here. Unique build. 6'6", 257, and like looks like a wide receiver right there. You yeah. see that. That is a long, lanky, that is what edge position is. And so he ticks those boxes, tested well at the combine, 4'6", 6", uh, 40 with a 1, 5, 8, 10 split. Those are good numbers. I just worry stiff. This okay. guy struggles to consistently play low. At 6'6", six six, it's hard to sink into contact consistently, and he just does not have the sort of, uh, you see there him trying to bend the yeah, edge, looked a up. little rough. Yeah. He doesn't have that to his game. So I comped him to DJ Wanham, who's obviously was a mid rounder for the Vikings oh, wow, a few years ago, which is kind of, he's a guy that can probably early down against the run. I'm not sure I ever expect him to be too much as a pure pass rusher, but the Ravens and how they've developed edges, wouldn't put it past him. There you go. The Ravens in this draft so far, they have taken Zay Flowers, that's a home run. They've taken Trenton Simpson. That feels like it's going to be a pretty solid pick for them. And then obviously now we add in Tavius Robinson. Feels uh, weird that the Ravens don't have like 10 third and fourth round picks. Right. Like they have the last couple of years. But they they, they went out and spent some, they but went yeah. out and traded it and spent some money. So they're, it's they're making some plays though. They've got, a, they've, got a, they've got the same pick, pick 22. That was pick 22 of the fourth round. They've got the same pick in the fifth round. Here we go. Pick is in. What do we got? Ooh. Ooh, Darius, Darius Davis, Davis, the okay. TCU wide receiver, there right? There you go. Yeah, he this, is. This Texas, this the whole gang of Texas wide receivers from SMU, Houston, like this guy is fast. This is a return man. Yes. They just picked a return man. This is why you're drafting <laughs> him, which is interesting. I mean, because 531 yards last year, that was a career high, and that was yeah, his fifth in year terms at TCU. Of reception, yeah. He's not a he's not a part of your offense. He no. is. You know, purely a return man, but he's a pretty damn good one, right? Yes, he, he ran a 4-3-6 40 coming out of the combine. He, he is twitchy. Dude is wound up. He, he can move. But, again, this is you're drafting him purely as a returner or, or maybe a pure gadget guy in the offense. Bring him in, run him on deep crossers, that sort of thing, and maybe you can hit a splash play every now and then. But uh, truly, a, like I said, interesting point to be taking those guys at, with guys like maybe Tyler Scott still on the board, the yeah. Cincinnati wide receiver who has legit starting potential. This guy's probably would be very floored if he ever starts in your office. He has, he has only a five foot nine inch wingspan. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like yeah. that would be the smallest so, of any starting I mean, wide receiver a, in the NFL. He's a gadget piece. Mm -hmm. We talked about it. We talked about it a little while ago. When do you when do you start drafting special teams guys? You can get a guy that right now apparently. right now, I mean this guy averaged 15 yards on per per punt return two Two touchdowns he scored a year ago or this past season. I mean, he gets the he he understands his assignment. He knows what he's supposed to do. And when you look at him play, he is electric. And when you work if you can work him into some of those jet sweep that jet action, work him into some of those under those little shallow crosses, you've got something on your on your board. We look at what the Chargers have been able to do today. Quentin Johnston. Okay, that's gonna be a, one of your big time wide receivers. Tuli Tui Puloto. He's gonna help you out along that front. Diane Henley. I think you think he's gonna play early? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then Jarius Davis. Jarius Davis, guess what? He's gonna get to camp and they're gonna be like, hey man, just go over there with the specialist. <laughs> 
catch punts, catch kickoffs. I didn't even look at look, what did he do? Did he do anything in kick returns too? Yeah. No touchdowns, but I mean he averaged 20 yards per kick return, so I think he's gonna be okay. This this Chargers draft is probably one of my favorites of anyone. Okay. And now obviously you lean and gravitate towards the teams that just picked eight guys in the first sure. three rounds and they got a zillion got talented dudes. But as far as pick for pick goes, those first three, I'd stack up with anyone. Because I love we both love Quentin Johnson. We yes. we gushed about him on day one. Yes. But then I love Diane Henley. Yeah, I think he is what they are missing now with obviously uh, losing uh, the former Notre Dame linebacker, who I'm blanking on his name, but uh, Drew uh, Tranquil. Drew, so uh, I, I'm a big fan of his. Drew I think he Tranquil. immediately fills his shoes. And now they do have Eric Kendricks there, who they brought over, but I'm starting Diane Henley over Kenneth Murray. Uh, I'm just telling you right now, I don't think that's really a fair fight. There we go. All right, on the clock right now, we've got the Browns. We've already seen the Browns make a pick this. Uh, they picked DeWan Jones already this, uh, this round. So they're at pick 24, pick 126 overall. We got, we're looking at the big board. Some interesting new names there towards the back that I'm surprised are still here. One is Corey Trice. This mm -hmm. guy's tape last year was awesome. And he is a horse of a corner. Have we had any Purdue players come off the board yet? I don't believe so. I don't think so, right? Yeah. But he, he's, he was their best prospect. I had 73 on the board. And he's a high-end athlete, too. Yeah. I mean, he is six foot two, over 200 pounds. He earned a six seven three cone at that size, which is unique that if you're a press, any sort of team, uh, this guy should be high on your boards. Now, maybe he is just a press corner, and that's why he falls here, and maybe that's why we saw like Joey Porter fall to the second round for similar reasons, because not a lot of teams are going that route anymore, becoming an off-coverage league. But if you still play press, th this guy can start for you. This guy can start for you year one. We got another. We got one guy coming off your board. No, do we? Yeah, we got Mizzou. Oh. Isaiah McGuire, defensive end for Mizzou. So look at that. The rounds are killing it. Coming round. off the board. I... I, I I like this guy, top 75 player on the board, because his flexibility. You don't see a lot of 270 pounders, so he's he's a big dude. Yeah. He is he is a guy who is a powerful defensive end, six foot four, 268, 34 inch arms, you know, 6'10 wingspan, and he can dip around the edge. He had a yeah. 7193 cone. You know, that's better than some of the wide receivers. That's better win. than Quentin Johnston. Yeah. Shit, that came off the board in the first round of wide receiver. Like, this guy can move around the edge. He gave Broderick Jones fits, and his ability to stick in his tracks in the run game and yeah. really set a hard edge, this is a guy that's gonna start early downs for them because they don't have someone now across from Miles Garrett that they feel good Look about that. in that role. I, I think day one, he can provide that. Um, reminded me of like a Kingsley and Nagbury who came out last year. I think he's a little bit better against the run, even though than Kingsley is. So this is this is a good, damn good pick. The Browns are really hitting some guys that can make an impact on their team without having a first or second round pick in this year's draft. Yeah, 126, they're getting the 75th best player on your board. I think that means a lot. So this is going to be really interesting to see how it shakes itself up. I think we've we've just had a trade, I believe. So if we can get that information at some point. But yeah, I just saw it looked like somebody suggested there was a trade. There's yep, Jacksonville trades. trades to New Orleans. So New Orleans is now back on the clock. This is going to be interesting. New Orleans, so far this round, has drafted. Oh, if we're talking about fits for Tanner Nick McKee, Salaberry. I'd love New Orleans to take a quarterback at this point in time. Just insure. For New Orleans to take? Yeah. Oh, I, I would love. oh for them to pick Tanner McKee, yes. Yeah, or yes, like yes. any QB at this point in the, in the draft, just because you got to give yourself options, right? I think the Raiders found out the hard way that just pigeonholing yourself to one Derek Carr for as long as they did yeah. was not wise. And now you're in a position where the NFC is weak, the division especially that they're in is weak, that it's up for grabs for sure. But you're 127. You know, get, yeah. get, a, get a, quarterback, like a quarterback swing here is well worth it. And I feel better about all these guys than I did freaking Ian Book when they draft them in the fourth. Yeah, we, oh, we do We've have got a, a quarterback. Hayner. Jake Hayner. There we go. Jake Hayner from Fresno State, from Washington to Fresno State, played with a good teaching. This is something I love. He's not the most athletic guy, does not have the most strong arm, but he knows how to put the ball where it needs to be. I'm a huge fan of his. Um, played for Tedford. Tedford is one of my favorite quarterback coaches in the history of football. Uh, he's well taught. He does not make mistakes. 
Uh, biggest problem for him this season was injuries, right? Yes. Dealing with that, with dealing with that, with dealing with that leg injury, he couldn't move. When he couldn't move, they, he got teed off on because their offensive line wasn't great. But I love Jake Hayner. What do you think about him? Yeah, he scored really well in the S two test. I know as well. But the size is why you know injury combined with being six foot two oh seven is like, yeah. is he going to get hurt? But I love this guy. Pro comp there is Taylor Heineke in terms of that because okay. he's a gamer. He yep. shows up when it matters. I go back to that UCLA game a couple mm -hmm. years ago when they upset him. He had a drive at the end where it was just all him. You know, a drive that's better than anything we've seen to this point from CJ Stroud in clutch situations, from Anthony Richardson in clutch right. situations, from Will Levis in clutch situations. Bingo. Like, it was a big boy drive. I noticed you held off on my guy, though. It, Bryce Young talking about <laughs> wet in big game situations. But he, he has that on film already. I do worry about how he handles pressure, though. At sure. that size, he, he he throws a lot off his back foot. Yes, he does. He will get a little bit skittish when something comes there. But he, you said he doesn't have a great arm. Like, this is an NFL arm, though. I'd put his arm on par with someone like Bryce Young and CJ Stroud. Like, it's in that realm of arm strength. I think, he can spin it. I think it's not the strength for me. Mm -hmm. I, think he, I don't think he has the same strength as those guys. But I do think he has a quicker release, and he's more accurate than all of them, than, than most Yeah. He's more. He's certainly more accurate than Anthony Richardson. Or yeah, Will there Lewis. you go. He's incredible. He's remarkably accurate. He does throw off his back foot because he's trying to avoid pressure, trying yeah, to avoid getting hit, scared. because he needs to stay healthy for them to win football games. Uh -huh. And then he, he, but I love the way that he can change his arm slot up and down, up and down, and still be remarkably accurate. Could be a good QB. Has promised. Thank you, Dilton Paul. Uh, Alici, I love the spot for a QB. If it works out, gold. If not, nothing. Lo nothing really lost. I totally agree with you. That's why this is the pick. We're very happy with it. This is really going to be fun. I think that the, the reality here is they got a guy that – what's the worst-case scenario? He's your backup? Yeah. I mean, needed a backup there. Obviously, no more Andy Dalton. But oh. I, I, did sit, I did think after Tanner McKee, he was my next quarterback available on the board. Oh, here we go. The Lions are trading starting running back DeAndre Swift. Sources oh. tell me and Tom Pelissario <laughs> sending him to the Eagles. Lefko – oh, my – I wish Lefko was here, huh? What is going on? <laughs> in exchange for draft pick compensation with David with David Montgomery and now Jameer Gibbs, Swift heads out. Okay. Swift is good. He is good. Swift Swift is a damn good football but player. But apparently, he, it, from everything that we've heard, they just they were they butted heads. Oh, him and Deuce Daly were gonna fight at some point. <laughs> if you watched Hard Knocks at all. They just he he does not run the way Deuce Staley runs. And, and that's sure. the problem. He he is a guy who is continually searching. For that bounce space. out, for that space. And in the NFL level, the space is rarely sweeter than it looks, right? Yeah. It, it's a fool's gold to try to get that space on the outside because these DNs run 4-4s. Four they'll, they'll track you down. So that's the problem with him. But you have Rashad Penny, who can be your between-the-tackles guy. Rashad Penny is awesome. His yeah. vision and running in that area of the field is as good as it gets. This is your third down back. This is your pass catcher. This is your screen guy. And in that role, dude, he's like a top – 10 back in the NFL in that role. Yeah. There are really aren't too many better than him in such a – and that's like, oh, man. Man. Yeah. That's Eagles, a, great, mean, great, Eagles, great move. I mean, what the, the Eagles are just absolutely out here just they, – yeah. they're, 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 they, they took the – they realized we almost won the Super Bowl. So let's do everything we can to win the Super Bowl. And here's the thing. Downer Swift's no worse than when he got picked in the second round. Right. He's still that good. And it's why we say, like, don't pick him that high. Here we go. Oh, oh wow. That's in. First that's key, the, the, Oh, wow. Rams taking him. The Rams have selected QB Stetson Bennett from Georgia. Did you see him going before any of those other three guys? I quite frankly did not. But I did have, I had a fourth round grade in him after yeah. his day. He, this is the realm I thought he would go. I thought maybe those other guys might go a little earlier. but I like him. His tape was good. Is, this, he played damn good football. Now he is, you know, everyone knows he's 25 years old. We get it. But he's an athlete. They have 4'6", 740. He's faster than that. He jogged out that 40th combine. But 5'11", 192, I mean, you're just never really going to start this guy. But the comp from is Doug Flutie. Doug Flutie yeah. won some games in the NFL for this reason right here. He can make a little magic, dude. He plays the game well, like the right way. He has an NFL caliber arm. It's not weak. Like it's, I think he has like a stronger arm than even like a Joe Burrow maybe. It's not bad by any means. But it's not going to be described as good. But when it came crunch time, the dude did not blink over the last season and a half. It truly did not. And so as much as the town around him was pretty nasty at Georgia, he, he didn't, he may not have elevated it, but he facilitated it. So 
I think someone said, I, I, I thought someone put it succinctly saying, Georgia could have won the national championship without Jalen Carter. They weren't going to win the national championship without Stetson Bennett. Yeah. So here's, here's my take. Early on, when he first got the start, out of necessity, mm -hmm. I was not impressed. Yeah. I'll be honest. I, 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 saw oh, him in, I saw him in high school. I know why they call him the mailman, because I was there <laughs> at the openings when he was running around in the U.S. Postal Service hat. <laughs> I remember that. He was, I, he was in Atlanta. I think he was in Houston. Maybe at one more, too. I, or maybe it was in New Orleans. But I remember that. I was like, he's a, one of these things doesn't look like the other. And it was in the same year as guys like, I don't know, it was Tanner McKee or Trevor Lawrence or that. One of these things doesn't look like the other. And then the next thing you know, gets into that second year. And then it gets going. And I was like, okay, this kid can play. He he won. He truly won me over. Like, I'm not ashamed to admit that I didn't believe him at first. He didn't look like, what, he didn't look like any of the other guys. And then he truly came around. He grew on me. He's a good quarterback. This guy can play. I don't like to use the term gamer, but at the end of the day, he understands what he needs to do to succeed. He puts his team, and this is what I love. He saw this Georgia team come around to believe in him too. What they let him do early on in his career versus what they let him do at the back end of his career were worlds apart. We're talking screens, shallow passes. That's what we're talking about early. And then we start to see him be able to push the ball up and over the top. So I'm a believer. Let's go. I truly think the second half of the national championship game against Alabama, he turned into a different player. After that, the, that was yeah. like pre-90 pre Stetson Bennett versus post-90 Stetson Bennett were two different people. You know, him going on TV the next day, hammered uh, on what was it, Good Morning America. That was the start of a new Stetson Bennett. And truly, what, the guy we saw this past year was – a legitimate NFL quarterback. It yes. truly was. It was maybe not a starter, but it was a guy who can play in the league, even if a lot of people before that thought he wasn't even a legitimate college quarterback. Yeah, that's the point. Is He, he absolutely can. He can play in the NFL. Mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness. Where are we? Almost the back end of fourth oh, he here? Goes, he goes by, by the way, I, I figured out what, what Cap was saying in my ear. He goes, Matt Stafford's there. Matt Stafford's there. So now what do we have? A little bit of Dogs West mm. <laughs> with, with, with Bennett and Stafford. The two best QBs in Georgia. Football history. <laughs> I mean, heard rumors about Cook, Dalton Hall. Oh, who would I want here for the Cowboys? Uh, for the Cowboys, I would love someone like a Moro Ajomo there. Like there you go. add to that D line. Keep, keep building it up, right? You know, one Mozzie Smith's cool. Keep giving yourself options on the interior. Is where I think I'd go if I were them. Man, I I'm trying to look at their needs. And they're clapping. They love it. Okay, they like the it. But they clap every time, though. Actually, Jerry's still on the phone. They do clap every time. They clap every time. All right, let's see what the Cowboys have done so far. They, they don't have the electricity of the Lions' war room after a pick. All right, what we got? Oh, Viliami, let's go. Top 100 player on my board. Oh, yes. Oh, absolutely. This guy, his tape is... It's fun. He, it is fun. That's, that's like the only way to describe it because he doesn't have what we'd call traits that like that the NFL loves. He's six foot four, 280. Is he 280? Playing on the edge at San Jose State, but he's powerful. I, he reminds me stylistically of a Zadarius Smith. And that's Big Z was at this point in the draft too. I think he was a fourth or fifth rounder coming out of Kentucky. Where it's just he's not linear. He's not super explosive in a straight line. He's not super quick, but all he needs is one paw to land, and he knocks you to the side a little because yes. he's so powerful. And then he kind of just skirts past you and gets to ball carriers. I, I, this guy was uber productive at San Jose State. Multiple seasons of it. This past year, nine sacks, 19 tackles for loss. Um, it, this is this is what I just mentioned. This is a guy that can stop the run for your football team on early downs, and, and truly can be an interior pass rusher on third downs. I love this pick. I love this fit. And Cowboys, like I said, are continuing to add to this D line in ways I love. Yeah, they're building up this defensive line. I love Fioco's so good. By the way, cousin of Vitavia. Oh, yes. I didn't know that. Yeah, everybody thinks he's related to the Fiocos. He's not. <laughs> yeah, right. He's a Via guy. So, um, really, I, watching him play, he's all over the field. He is someone that, at one point, I, that's why I said he's 280, because he plays, he, he looked smaller than that. And 
but he because he moved moved to the interior, moved to the exterior. He moved off the ball, played standing up, played hand down. He could do a lot of different things. Tremendous versatility. We're looking at the Cowboys draft right now, Mozzie Smith. We know Michael Parsons was thrilled about that. Schoonmaker, who we've talked about already. Overshone, we've talked about him. I'm curious to see how Overshone slots in there. They got a lot of linebackers. They got a lot of linebackers. Real Cox, Damon Clark, who they drafted recently, too. Yeah, so, and then Fioko. Fioko's going to obviously step up to play in that line, in that rotation, and he's going to go up and make some plays. So, we got the Jaguars, too. Their pick is coming through. Let's see what they do. Boom, Jags. Who are the Jags picking? Oh, Tyler Lacey, the OK State. Yeah, look at that. Yeah. Tyler Lacey from Oklahoma State. This guy. Similar players to him and Fajoko, right? Yes, that's like what I was, I was, I was going to say. What's, I don't know what the <laughs> difference is between them, with the exception of Fajoko seems to have a more have, be more powerful. The production is the difference, in my opinion. Okay. Lacey is a similarly tooled guy, you know, and even their testing was similar. But just, I, I did not see enough twitch with him to be right. able to impact the passing game. Like, like he is a pure rundown defensive end. Whereas I thought Fajoko, like as an interior rusher, you might have a little something from him. I, I don't think he got that from Lacey. He went down to the Senior Bowl down in Mobile and truly, like he got blocked up. He, he was not making much of an impact in the one-on-ones, which is always to me a red flag because those are those are set up to be defensive line. You're supposed to. You're, the D line are supposed to win. Yeah, for those that don't know, one-on-ones, both on the defense, one-on-ones between the offensive line and defensive line are set up for the defender to win. Yeah. One-on-ones between wide receivers and defensive backs are set up for wide receivers to win. If you are losing those reps, then you are, you are lacking in some area, whether it's yeah. moves, strength, understanding of what, what's going on. Like you don't, like if you can't understand how to play through the outside half of a player mm-hmm. instead of running straight into them, that's a thing that you got it. You you clearly haven't been taught correctly, and, and you got to, You're gonna have to learn. And here's where he's lacking. So 279. Mm-hmm. That's it. That's a four three defensive end or a three four defensive end. He's not an interior guy. Five one one forty. Oh no. And seven six three cone. Now he did do thirty bench press reps. Like he's strong. He can hold up in the running game, sure. But you're just getting a bit of a limited player at this point in the draft. Yeah. So let's let's talk more about the one on one situation because yeah. you 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 go down there. What impresses you when a what how when a, how does an offensive lineman win in that spot that impresses you? I think coordination is what I'm looking for for offensive linemen down there Be, because a lot of times on tape and pass protection you are like you're protected right you, you're part of a unit you yeah you you can say I, I don't care about inside moves I have the slide coming my way my left guard's gonna help on any inside move. right uh, and that's the vast majority of pass back drop back passing snaps for offensive linemen but there you are truly on an island and so you, a lot of times you'll see inside moves or pure bull rushes that like you don't see in a game. In a game, usually. Right. And so how do you react? How do your hands and feet work in unison? Are you ready then to play in the NFL? And it really kind of exposes who is and who isn't. And again, when a guy like Tyler Lacey goes there and just doesn't make an impact as a pass rusher, that's a worrisome thing. Here we go. Pick is in. Oh, I love this fit. The Bengals take wide receiver Charlie Jones out of Purdue. A guy that you want to talk about production. I mean, this guy constantly produced, constantly open. Don't know how. How did you forget him? He's the best player. He's the best pass catcher that they have. I don't understand he's, how he was always open. This is this is basically, I compare him to, I think, Jared Aberderis. He is Ooh, reliable nice. as can be. I think he had the lowest drop rate of any wide receiver in this draft class. If it is possible for him to haul it in, he is going to haul it in. Tremendous hands. The only worry is five years. Five years it took him to even see the football field. I think it was three years at Buffalo, two years at Iowa, transfers to Purdue for his sixth season, and all of a sudden goes for 110 catches, 1,361 yards, and as you see there, making big plays on yeah. the outside, making big plays over corners, like Garrett Williams, that came off the board in the third round, that are not easy to make. <laughs> like that right there was insane. <laughs> the guy has great <laughs> concentration, and I think he's a shifty route runner. The only problem is 175 pounds, he is a slot, yeah. But they're looking for a transition plan from Tyler Boyd. Uh, obviously, his big contract coming up soon, getting up there in age. I think this is your slot wide receiver once Tyler Boyd um, is elsewhere. Yeah, he's. but here's the thing for me. If you can hide him in the slot, then he's going to be okay. I'm not worried about his size nearly as much. And he's super shifty, right? He does not yes. let himself get hit. He doesn't. He never takes a big hit. He understands where he needs to be. Look, at he's like, no, 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 no. That, that big guy's not going to get his paws on me. And he's not the fastest. He doesn't have to be. 
They catch up to him. Okay, guess what? I got all these yards. We are now in winning. We're in winning position. We're in position to go out and make plays. Um, you look at the skill positions. Obviously, Jamar Chase, T. Higgins, Tyler Boyd. You add in Charlie Jones. Charlie Jones is going to walk into that room. He's going to learn from these guys. He's going to figure out what he needs to do to be in the NFL. He's got, it's taken him a long road to get here. And so you look at those guys. When they had last year, like when they were without Higgins, when they were without Chase, their wide receiver four was an issue. Whoever it was coming in onto that football field yeah. for the most part. Jones now will not be an issue. Right? He, you can, he is right. going to be reliable. He's not going to be coughing up easy ones. He's not going to be in the wrong spot. This is a guy that may never be you know, a wide receiver two or a wide receiver one. Sure. But he's a wide receiver three on your football team. Right. He's good. He's good football. Yeah. I, love, I loved watching him play this year because it seemed like I don't know how many, I don't know how much you can watch of a guy on film. And pretend like he's not good. Oh, it's hard to. I mean, 1,300 yards. You can't fake that like you, with the way he was playing. Like, how do you how do you watch this this guy on film, week in, week out? If you're Nebraska, if you're if you're if you're Ohio State, if you're any of these teams, and not think, oh, he's good. Mm -hmm. We need to pay attention to him. We need to worry about him. We need to check on him. We need to make sure we know where he is on every single play. And to me. It's truly disrespectful, but also like it speaks to what he's able to do because maybe they were paying attention to him. He was just so good; it didn't matter. Yeah, uh, Jones is a player. Uh, that this is a fun pick for the Bengals. Uh, they had an interesting draft because they're they're forward thinking. None yeah. of these guys, you know, everyone's like, oh, O line, O line. These are all guys that if we lose free agents, they can step up and play in those spots. Oh, there oh, we, go. we go. Steelers. They did up. it. Unbelievable. The uh, this is a guy I wanted to go there. That, that was the yeah. spot for him because he can rush. That, that's a scheme. So this is a true 3-4 outside linebacker coming out of Wisconsin. Yes, he is. He is 6'2", 240 with under 32-inch arms. That, that's not a profile that right. a lot of people love for success at the NFL level rushing the passer. But he gets off the football. He is slippery into contact. He knows how to adjust his pad level to avoid that big blow that stops him in his tracks. And then he uses his hands so well. This is a redshirt sophomore coming out. We're talking about Charlie Jones, who's 24, 60-year dude. This is a young guy, still ascending, who's played elite football the last two years. Not just yes. good, he was dominant in the Big Ten, beating guys like Paris Johnson on tape. And now you just worry about traits projecting the next level, but he's got some undersized guys there in Alex Highsmith and TJ Watt to yeah. learn from, who have figured out how to win consistently at a high level as pass rushers with similar tool sets, with similar skill sets, and man, uh, this is an absolute. Uh, the Steelers is huge. take their drafting of brothers yeah. to another level now because Nate Herbig on the roster there. They drafted, obviously, um, Cam Hayward's brother last year. Right. Uh, absolutely love, love before this that, Steelers they the Steelers draft. They had the twins before that on the, along the offensive line. F the kids from Florida. Oh, yeah, the Pounce. Pounce well, they had one yeah. of the Pounces. So it's, this is just one of those things where you watch this and you see what they're able to do. He, he's what you see what he's able to do. Quick move, a stutter. I love yeah. that little stutter step right there, and then quick move to get inside. Uh, he can get outside. He can win on the edge, and he's tough. He's tough. He's physical. You know he is. He played at Wisconsin. That's what they are. That's all they do. That's all they make. That's what they create. And so this is going to be really fun to see how he grows up into this. I his brothers his brothers in the NFL. Yeah. Yeah. Like Herbig's brother is in the NFL. He played football at Stanford. He plays offensive line. So this is one of those things where it, it, I, 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 it does matter when you have family members that are in the NFL. You do, well, get a, you do get a leg up, whether it's your dad or your uncle or your cousin or your brother. Like, it helps because you understand how hard you have to work to stay in it. You don't just walk in and think, I'm the man. You walk in and think, they're going to do everything they can to get me out of here. And what I love, how I describe Herbig to a friend when I was discussing him was he's too good at football to be bad in yes. the NFL. Like there's so many knocks against him in the size and the length and the limited athleticism. He plays the game already too well to be bad. And I even loved him as an off-ball linebacker transition sure. if you wanted to because I thought he understood the game well enough to make that transition. It's and still so, a possibility. Yeah, That's still very a possibility. much still is. They had you know Joe Schobert playing off-ball there at one time who was a similar sort of prospect coming out of Wisconsin. Yep. Oh, finally get a wide receiver coming off the board in Tyler Scott. Look at that. Cincinnati wideout. I expected him to go a lot earlier than this. Yeah. Because 4-4 four, four speed, 
legit deep production on tape. And 4-4 speed, truthfully, like, I don't think did him a service. Like, he looks faster than that on tape. GPS times that were faster than that. And a guy who was a running back and a cornerback in high school. Only started playing wide receiver, really, when he got to Cincinnati. Cincinnati. And year on year progression, you saw it from year one to year two to year three. And I think he's shifty after the catch to make plays with the ball in his hands to where, man, what does this guy get to next? You know, he's young. He can have some development to his game that other guys can't, especially when he's as physically gifted as you see here on tape to where Chicago Bears now have Darnell Mooney, Chase Claypool, and him that can all really get down the football field. They all have real speed to challenge. And that's how I want this offense to be built. I'd even give this guy some carries out of the backfield because as I was saying, we need some speed there in that backfield in Chicago. I would mess around and throw him a few jet sweeps every time, every now and then. So here we go. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read them for you. Year in 2020 for him, three catches for 20 yards, no touchdowns, one rushing yard, 20, one rushing attempt, 20 yards. 2021, 30 catches. That's a huge, 10 times yep. more catches, 523 yards, five touchdowns. Five carries, 102 yards on the ground, no touchdowns. And then we get to 2022, this past season, what does he do? 54 catches for 900 yards, nine touchdowns. And then he also has, oh, and they, then they, oh. They didn't let him run the ball. He was just a wide receiver for, for all last year. Yeah, that's why Cincinnati sucked last year. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Pick. But no, it was, it was a very, like, He's a good football. Like, again, you mentioned the fact that we like gadget pieces. We like guys that can run. We like guys that can make plays, and he can do all those things. He's got the ability to really take the top off of a defense, be a threat down the field, and that's what we're looking for because if you have that, now all things things can start opening up in the run game. Things can start – or vice versa because if teams are worried about Justin Fields running the football and that safety comes down, whoop, right behind him. And so we had two guys in Trey Tucker – and Darius Davis come off the board, who I call probably just gadget guys, who are like small speed right. guys. Scott's a small speed guy, but he has like a 6'1 wingspan. He, he has legitimate ability to make plays and still be an option in your offense, high-end athlete who can also return. So I'm surprised those guys go before someone like Scott, because Scott can stop, Scott can be a one or a two in your offense in time. There's that potential with him, whereas those guys, I just don't see it. To me, he, he wasn't too dissimilar of a prospect to Jalen Hyatt. Now, I know Hyatt's production was there, and sure. he's more advanced in a lot of ways as a receiver, but they're similarly tooled athletes. Well, there we go. And now we got the Vikings. Looks like the – yep, there it is. Hey, LSU safety. Wow. Jay Ward. Did you think he would go this high? I did, actually. I had a fourth-round grade on him coming out of LSU. I think he's – I love his length. You know, he's six foot – 188 pounds with 32 and a half inch arms. That's, he played a lot of slot at LSU. That's probably where I'd play him in the NFL. And now where did he come off the board to here? We got to the Vikings. The okay. Vi- came to the Vikings at pick 32, 134 overall. So this is a guy I'd feel comfortable dropping down and playing man coverage over the slot. I think he has that sort of ability to him because 4 5, five speed is just, it's not the range you want for a back end player. I don't think that's ever going to be his game. To me, he looked more like a cornerback than a safety on tape. Got so, it. with Brian Flores now obviously bringing over uh, his predominantly blitz and man heavy defense that he's played a lot over the years, oh. I think this is probably a slot in your defense. Possibly. Yeah, because a good throw on that play beats him. Goodness. Yep. Yeah, I, I, I liked him. I didn't know if they were using him correctly. And hearing your answer on that, that makes a little more sense because they yeah. did have him in the back end some when he was he was better yeah. coming down, better in the slot. Yes. Better, better, especially guy that's not afraid to mix it up against the run. Mm-hmm. 6'1, 188, he is thin. That is a that's a thin He's guy. Thin. But he'll mix it up. And we saw in that, that clip both a couple times when he after he made a hit or he got hit, he did lay down for a little while. Mm-hmm. So he's a guy that's you gotta watch him and see, make sure his durability stays up. This is the last pick of the round. The Patriots are on the clock. Whew. Well, that's Jay Ward, yeah. Like, I just... Pats. This is it. Pat's draft so far. Should we reset the Pat's draft? Yeah. Oh, we got a trade. Oh. Okay, we, let's not reset the Pats. Let's reset the trade. Vegas Raiders. Vegas back in at round four at pick 135. Vegas is back in. What are they looking for? So they went... They're the one that went Trey Tucker earlier at pick one. Las Vegas has picked up Ja'Korian Bennett, Trey Tucker today. 
Mm-hmm. They also got Byron Young yesterday, Michael Mayer yesterday, Tyree Wilson Thursday. Really a, you know, when you think of some drafts that have Warner themes, when we talked about the Steelers draft being like a toughness, you yeah. get back to a draft. This is a draft that's hard to like figure out, <laughs> truthfully. They went with Tyree Wilson was kind of like a pick that picks itself in the top 10. Sure. We need that. Let's get that. Mayer then in the second round, how he fits in the receiving core, I'd be excited to see. Young then was just like two gap run defender, a little something different, but then, then a gadget return guy and then a then a corner with just pure speed it's an interesting like if you're going for like toughness physicality that makes sense until we go Trey Tucker to Corian Bennett right if you're going for like dynamism well shit those first three guys don't really have it aren't those so So it's kind of discombobulated kind of just no rhyme or reason here but uh they they got a few players that I like especially Wilson Amir but that's like the draft will be remembered by your first two picks more right. often than not. If especially, you hit on those first two picks, the rest don't really matter. Especially if Mayor becomes, you know, of, of your franchise's best, your, your face of your franchise, your tight end that you can throw the ball to. Yes. You know, four or five times a game, you pick, he's always picking up first downs and you can always count on him. And, and a welcome respite for Raiders fans who usually it was the opposite. First and second round picks sucked. Yeah. And then Mike Mayock took over and all of a sudden, oh, we got a Hunter Renfro. Oh, we got a Max Crosby. No, now they're picking the good guys first. Yeah. Thankfully, that's where you—that's where you want to be picking uh, the impact players on your roster. Yeah, there's. This is not Darius Hayward Bay. <laughs> this ain't Cleveland Furl, fourth yeah. overall. Oh man, I. Why didn't he pan Sadly. out? Sadly. Well, I mean, well, quite frankly, because it wasn't that good even as a prospect. But yeah. it, it just, low, low end athletes, right? Uh, I mean, yeah. low end athletes along the defensive line, they, they just look better in college than they do in the NFL more often than not. Yeah. I, I put him in a similar category to. Uh, who was the guy left go was to cry? Derek Barnett Derek out of Barnett. Tennessee, where it's just like, man, you got to have juice in the NFL. T- tackles are athletic. Tackles know how to use their hands. So if you just have hands and without elite length and without elite burst, chances are those hands are going to look a lot better against collegiate tackles than they do NFL tackles. Sure, because most collegiate tackles don't play in the NFL. There you go. <laughs> there you go. All right, picks in. What do we got? Raiders. I'm trying to think who they would even go with here. Oh, QB's coming wow. off the board. Who do we got? Is this Aiden O'Connell? Aiden O'Connell. Wow, Ooh. two Purdue guys in the in the third round, fourth round. Excuse me. Aiden, o- if you can get past the little bit of a funky release that Aiden O'Connell has, it's easy to be a fan of his game. And now he kind of dumps it down low, and then kind of like tucks it's it this, by his this ear. Drop and drop and pop. It's like a drop and pop. Like it. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, not uh. ideal, but he. It's, he was a guy who was just trying to keep his head above water with the talent around him at Purdue. Like, there's Especially a reason. Especially offensive line talent. Yeah. There's a reason he would just go to Charlie Jones there, as you saw us, because no one else was getting open, and he didn't have time really to go to anyone else. But he's a guy who works with timing really well. If he didn't get the ball out of his hands quickly, he was getting crushed, so he got the ball out of his hands quickly. Mm-hmm. I think he has an NFL caliber arm, even if it's nothing special. And, and I love that he keeps bouncing back like he will make one to two plays a game that you're like what the hell was that throw he will throw one up for grabs but then it won't affect him he won't fall off and he won't spiral into uh, you know a complete disaster game he had games where he threw a lot of picks but he didn't have games where he was completely ineffective right like yeah. he, he at least showed up every single week yeah I, I love i think he's a good player this is someone who just Again, as you mentioned, he showed up every single week. He was able to get the job done. He was able, I mean, realistically, let me see. I'm going to look this up. The Purdue game against, they played Michigan this year. And they Out lost. There, Big Ten Championship. And this is the, this is. He had yeah. him in that game in the first half yes, before. Yes, yes. He threw two interceptions, and that was the difference and then he, in that then game. Then he started, then he, then he kind of heaved one up there. Yep, for that was the difference in that game. But he threw against this Michigan defense that everybody called so great. Mm-hmm. 32 for 47. Four. 32 for 37, 366 yards. He didn't throw for any TGs. That's mm-hmm. what they needed. Yep. And that was, a, that was a big problem. They had a spot in that game late that they were within a score. And if he could have gotten them a TD instead of an interception, they would have been in the they would have been in business. So I like that. Folks, we have reached the end of the third round of BR Gridiron draft night coverage. We're going to do a recap of round four. This is the fourth round of the draft, 33 picks. Let's take a look at them. 
Here we go. Some notable picks. We've got Stetson Bennett from Georgia going to the char- going to the Chargers. We've got Viliami Vil- Vil- Fihoko from San Jose State. He's headed to the Cowboys. That's a good pick. We both we all like that pick, dude. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tyler Lacey, Oklahoma State. Uh, defensive lineman going to the Jacks. Charlie Jones, wide receiver from Purdue, headed to the Bengals. Nick Herbig, linebacker, edge rusher from the from Wisconsin. He's headed to the Steelers. Tyler Scott from 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 Cincinnati. He's a wide receiver. He's got a weapon for the Bears. Jay Ward at LSU, a safety headed to the Vikings. And Aiden O'Connell, the final pick of the dra- of the fourth round, going to Purdue, or excuse me, coming from Purdue to go play for the Raiders. Uh, we're looking at the big board now. Take us through the big board. Let's see what we got. So, I'm surprised, McKee, some of these guys getting drafted over McKee, quite frankly. Now, I knew he was going to go at this point in the draft, uh, and quarterbacks, I'm just going to be higher on some than most. When you sure. like them, that's how it goes. Whipler is, if anyone's a surprise to still be available, come fifth round, it's him. That's a starting center in the NFL. I, I am floored that he is still yeah. on the board at this point in time. Some of my favorite picks from round four, I'll kick it right off from the top. Nick Saldaveri. Yeah. From the New Orleans Saints, I think he's a starter for them at some point in time. I loved Keely Ringo to the Eagles. I think everyone's yes. going to say they love Keely yes, Ringo I to do. the Eagles. Hard to debate that one. I loved Ada Tamiwa, Adabare. Dewan to the, Jones. To the Colts. Fantastic pick. Jawan Jones to the Cleveland Browns. A little further down the board, Chandler Zavala to the Carolina Panthers. I had him as a top 65 player in this draft class. He goes all the way at 114. One of my favorite picks for the Panthers in this class. Going a little bit further down here, I really like the pick of Nick Herbig to the Steelers. This Steelers draft, it, when we talk winners and losers, who had the best draft, Steelers is gonna be in the top three. Top three grades I give out because that has been an absolute haul for them and really a draft that was needed. This team had gotten depleted in terms of young, up and coming talent. There was no Watt in the pipeline. There was no Hayward in the pipeline. Now we may have that with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Let's kick it off. We are going to... Well, Kytrell Clark? Is that who got came on? I don't know. I didn't see the name. <laughs> oh, Abdullah. Oh, Yazir. Abdullah. Abzu- here we go. Let's go. I didn't see the, I didn't see the, yeah. I didn't see the name. I was like, there's going to be one of those two. Those are the two Louisville guys that are probably coming yeah. off the board here soon. But oh. Abdullah's, this is an athlete. I mean, you don't see an edge rusher that far down the football field making plays on the yes. football very often. And 4-4-7 speed. That shows up on tape consistently. 19 and a half sacks the past two seasons. I worry about his size if he is going to be an edge rusher like he was at Louisville. 237 pounds. That's, I, we just talked about Nolan Smith being that size and how it could be an issue. Abdul does not play as physical as Nolan Smith. He, he wants to play around blocks, not through blocks, as opposed to Smith who loves the contact, relishes it. So that's the worry I have with him. I think here, going to the Jaguars, he's either a situational pass rusher or he's an off-ball linebacker. Yeah. Truthfully, probably just a situational pass rusher. See, just I was some juice ask, in that realm. We look at this, Louis, look at this. He can, I think he can be both, right? Yeah. 6'1", 237, 4'4", 4, 4, 40. He's got an opportunity. We got to trade. They got a zillion linebackers. Commanders on the, on the clock. Buffalo trades 137 to Washington for 150 and 215. Okay, Buffalo is working back. Um, they do have a lot of linebackers, but... With, his, with that speed and athleticism, maybe that's a skill set that he can master. And mm-hmm. then in situational pass rushing, he can also then slide down and do that. Yeah. And, and at this point, the special teams value. A guy who's that big, running a 4 4 7, coming down on a punt team, you're going to yep. get there in a hurry. And yep. some, some, uh, some special teams coaches love that. So who's on the board? On the clock. Washington. Thank you. There Commanders. we go. Commanders. The who Commanders are on the move? clock. I, and they did just go into your offensive lineman early. I was going to say, could they be moving up for one of these guys? But I'm curious to see who they do move up for. What's Let's the desperation? We here. Washington. I, I wouldn't hate them going QB too, right? It, just give yourself options. Because the quarterback the there right now is Howell? is Sam, Sam Howell. Yeah. That's no. like kind of who you're, if you're banking on anyone. Tanner it's McKee. Like a you long-term. should pick Tanner McKee right here. I mean, that's what I'm saying. Like, just give yourself another dude, right? On the roster right now, Sam Howell, Jacoby Brissett. Jake Fromm, unfortunately. Um, yeah. Just like a lot of meh. A lot yes. of something that's just I mean, not super exciting. And, and now I'm not saying Tanner McKee is a surefire slam dunk quarterback, but it, it's like when the Seahawks signed Matt Flynn and then drafted Russell Wilson. Just give yourself options because yeah. it doesn't hurt to take those swings. Because Sam Howell in the fifth last year, do look good at the end of the season. You know, like the. There's, uh, they don't always fall because of talent reasons, some of these quarterbacks in the draft. 
I'm curious to see what they do. Mm -hmm. And this is the picks in, so what we're gonna get to see, they are a, the, the Commanders are a team that is gonna be, they're gonna be an interesting watch this upcoming year. Quite frankly, I haven't loved their draft either up to this point. All right, let, With let's... Emmanuel Forbes in the first, mm -hmm. Quan Martin in the second, mm -hmm. Ricky Stromberg in the third, and then Braden Daniels was there. KJ Henry Clemson is the pick. Okay. I had KJ Henry as the top 100 player. Okay, yeah. there you go. And you can get him, if you can get him at 130, 137, that's a good one. Pick is in, let's see. Boom, KJ Henry, defensive end out of Clemson. This is a guy that can just, he, when he when he's on, he's on. Yes. He, he looks like he's a little thin, but he's very strong from what I see out of the way that he plays. What do you think about that? Yeah, unique, because at 250, you know, 6'5", 250 is, you would think undersized, but he's got some pop to him. Yes. I, I mean, he, on contact, will hit you, will rock you back. I think he is a three down type of player. I thought he was an average athlete on tape, but he went to the combine and went four, six, three. Right. You know, similar realm to Will Anderson. So this guy, I, I know he's a touch stiff, bending the edge, but he works his hands so well, and that's how he wins that I think he continued to do so at the NFL level. It's just another nice piece. You got your two edges there, uh, but how much longer Chase Young will be there after they didn't pick up his fifth year option remains to be seen. This is a guy that I, I, I'm not saying is going to ever be the, the replacement for Chase Young or a starter, but he's a guy that you like in your rotation at defensive end if you have one. Yeah, uh, KJ Henry also played at West Forsyth High School. That is the last high school game that I played. They beat <laughs> us in the playoffs. He was a five-star. He was a highly regular guy. I know, he was guy. a highly regular yeah. guy. He's another one of those North Carolina guys that ends up outside of the state. Mm. We are famous for it. Mm. They all, Clemson, Put a border. Put, Clemson, put a wall. Clemson, Georgia, Florida, they've all had guys that were North Carolina guys make, make big, some big plays for them. All right, what do we got here? Oh, here we go. Darius Rush, South Carolina corner. He has some fans. Now, I, I wasn't particularly high on him. Like, he had people having him as a top 60 player in this okay. draft class, like second round grades. I, I didn't see it because I think he doesn't have the twitch out of his breaks okay. that I like to see to really like drive on dig routes, on stuff inside of him and drive back down on footballs. But as a pure man corner, it, he's got that skill set. 6'2", 198, he probably had, you know, of the corners at the Senior Bowl, probably was just behind Tyreek Stevenson and Josh Brents, okay. Julian Brents, Julius Brents, in terms of his performance down there. I, I think he's really good at seeing uh, receivers breaks from a pure man coverage perspective. So when he's staring at them, he reads their body language to know when they're throttling down, yep. when they're going to sit, when they're going to break off their route and kind of where their stem's going. I, I did think from off coverage, he wasn't near the player, but for 6'2 with his length and 4'3'6 speed, um, at this point in the draft, that, that's something that I'm intrigued by at the very least. Yeah, I see the, the Cordray Tankersley comparison. A guy from a different school in South Carolina, but certainly get two two players that are pretty good on man. Especially, here's the thing: if he can get hands on you, then he can run with you. Yeah. If he can get hands on you, if he can sit in your hip pocket and and feel you, then he can go play. And that's mm -hmm. the cool thing about him. Even right there, with the little with the little zone turn, he's able to feel him behind him, and he can go make a play. They're physical enough to strip that ball out. And special teams, we talked about it earlier. Mm -hmm. What are we looking for? We're looking for guys that can there play on special go. teams. There we go. Let's go. So that's a that's a great pick. I, I like it a lot, especially yeah. for the idea that early on, guess what? All I need you to do is be a gunner. I just need you to be a gunner. Go down there and and go tackle a punter. Go go tackle a punt returner. I, that's what I need you to do. So this is going to be interesting. The what do we have? So he's this the, is a Colts the pick. Colts draft now. Anthony Richardson, Julius Brents, Josh Downs, Blake Freeland. Ade Adabare, and now Darius Rush. That's that's as good a draft as I've seen from them in a while. You know, they crushed it. Their, their kind of franchise-defining draft was the Quentin Nelson, Darius Leonard, Shaq Leonard now draft, where they had multiple All-Pros from one draft. That kind of set the tone. But since then, the past few years has not been as sweet. They have not come nearly close to that Chris Ballard has. To me, this is a draft that can get there. These are guys that can get to high-end type of performance for you that Colts fans could be looking down the road you know, a few years from now looking back and saying, Ooh. this was the start of our you know, turnaround here. Okay, I got a surprise for you. Don't look, don't look, don't look, don't look. Toon. Yes. To the Cardinals. Arizona Cardinals draft. Clayton Toon, quarterback from Houston. I like him. He's a good player, obviously, incredibly productive. 
He had, a, he had a target that helped make him very productive. Mm -hmm. uh, but he's someone that's more athletic than people probably give him credit for. You see him there running away from, from the defense. He's, a, he's a someone that can play. And I think yeah. he's, he brings this ability. He's a, he's a big, strong, tall guy with a good arm. He's pretty accurate as well. And obviously he was a captain for that football team. Uh, they went out and they got the job done. Yeah, so after, after Hendon Hooker came off the board, you know, after the first yeah. five QBs were gone, this was the most physically gifted guy available. 6'2", 220, you see 4'6", 4, 4 there. He was a legitimate rushing threat in that Houston offense. And he's got a big arm, an NFL caliber arm right up there, probably just, just right behind guys like Will Levis and Anthony Richard in this draft class. He, he can really spin it to every level of the football field. And productive, you know, 4,000 yards, 40 touchdowns mm -hmm. this past year. Has been playing a ton of football. Four years as a starter there at Houston. I do, though, worry he is it, watching him makes you nervous with how his feet patter in the pocket. I, I mean, he is a guy who's just kind of on edge a lot. Yeah. He really leaned on Tank Dell and his separation ability in that offense. It, it was kind of Tank Dell or I scramble and get outside the pocket and try to create something. Yeah. He's going to have to play more in structure, learn how to kind of the fundamentals of quarterback a little bit more. But this is the kind of, again, like his tools at the quarterback position often go a lot higher. And if he was doing what he did at a bigger school, he would not have lasted this long. That's true. And he's, I, I love to watch him play. Like watching Houston play was always a treat. It, it, I will say this, I felt like they did not like Dana Hogan that much <laughs> at times. <laughs> watching guys come off the field and he'd be clapping uh, and they just go walk around him. I was like, goodness, this seems dysfunctional. But he's still there as their head coach. He's got a couple guys get drafted already. He's gonna put those on, you know, they're gonna go, all that's gonna go on the recruiting material. Try to get some more guys there. Okay, we got another one. Oh, DTR, the QB run is there real right now. To the Browns at 140. Okay. Interesting. It's so, a that's a hang on, what's that is you know what this is? This is a this is a complimentary scheme pick. And I like that for them because this means instead of trying to play Kellen Mond, Josh Dobbs. Who I just think I think the windows closed on. I don't think the window ever opened on Mond. I think the windows <laughs> closed on Dobbs. Now yeah. you can have a guy that still can fit you complimentary to Watson. You don't have to change yes, your offense. So go. often, so often we it looks like they just picked up pieces to try to like make play some complimentary football instead of getting a guy that can actually play that complimentary football, had real success at the next level. I think DTR got better every year. Every year, got more trust from his coaches every year, got the ability to not run check with me. We saw him call plays, we saw him audible, we saw him get people lined up in the right position. And to me, that's high high value, that is also high IQ football. And to me, I, I just really love to see a guy grow, 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 and keep getting better every year, not peak as a sophomore, peak as a freshman. The more tape they got on him, the better he got. Instead of, well, they got more tape on me, so I couldn't couldn't mm -hmm. really do this. No, the more tape they got on me, guess what? I get better every year. 48 starts in his career, and experience matters a lot at the quarterback position. Yes. That's like why guys like Brock Purdy can hit the ground running, because he's a four-year starter. Yep. DTR is a four-year starter at the position. And Versus as you mentioned, Trubisky. every single year he got better. And he's a guy who you think four, five, six, 646 rushing yards last year. Oh, he's, he's a runner. No, this guy ran out of when it was necessary, not first reads not there, I'm going to run. He is a guy who is a pocket passer who has rushing ability. That's why, you know, Chris Sims had him as his fourth overall quarterback. Yeah. I'm a little lower on him than that because I think the accuracy is still a fairly big problem for me and that long release I do not love. But he went to the combine and had the fastest ball speed there throwing of any quarterback in attendance. He has real high-end mm -hmm. NFL arm talent. This is, there's a reason why a lot of quarterbacks are coming off the board. It's because this was a good class for developmental type of guys at that position outside of even the top end guys. See, that's the thing. I, I love that about him. And I, I, I saw it at the opening when we were there. This is when he's, he's in high school. Yeah. At the opening, watching him drop back. And I know the release is a little bit loopy, but when that ball comes out of a hand, his hand, it sings. Like you can yes. hear like, like it's going. And that's why he's able to make some of these throws that people might think he's late on. I'm not late. I throw the ball hard. Like, this is what I'm doing. And so it, it took him a while to harness it, but it took him good coaching, Chip Kelly, took him good development, him working on himself, but also working with quarterbacks coaches. And he harnessed all those, all those skills and all those tools. And I'm glad you mentioned experience, because when he got to college, he didn't have any. 
Mm -hmm. He only played one year. He only started one year of high school football. He played wide receiver for three years because Tate Martell was in front of him. Oh. Obviously, I don't know where Tate Martell Tate. is, but the reality is he played behind Tate Martell. And then he got to start one year at Bishop Gorman. Then he went to play. But he, he got, listen, he got full ride scholarships when he was a wide receiver. He got him at quarterback from people seeing him as a backup in those games where Gorman was blowing people out. But he didn't have much experience coming in, so he struggled early. And then he got better, and then he got better, and now we're in year four, we're, we're coming out of year four, and he's a very good quarterback, super talented, has the ability to make every throw that you want. And again, I'm glad you mentioned he didn't run. This, this is not, the, their yardage may be close to the same. Mm -hmm. This is not the same as Anthony Richardson running. Yes. This is not the same. Most of these are not design runs, and most of these are not, I don't like what, I don't know what I'm doing runs. These are check, check, okay, covered, 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 okay, I'll buy myself some more time, okay, that's, okay, nope, you know what? They're giving me space over here. I'm going to go take this first down, and I'm going to get out of bounds. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I love what the Browns have done. I have to say it. They, they didn't, again, to come in with no first or second round pick to get the guys that they've gotten so far, that can, you know, multiple guys that can actually play a role. Is... We've got to trade. Vikings are on the clock now. Who we traded for? Gosh, this pick went Vegas to they... Indy to Minnesota. <laughs> the amount of movement at this point. In the draft, I, I truly like. I can't remember this much movement. Vegas, this Indy, Minnesota, yeah. Where just every group. pick is an absolute. Just has no value to anyone apparently. No. And then other picks have so. They seem to have so much value to people. Oh my god! I'm looking down the board. Pick 159 right now has already been traded four times. <laughs> <laughs> it might get traded again. It's where the Packers are picking next. Oh, that's incredible. It's when the NFL said you could start, what was it, three years ago when they said you could start trading the compensatory picks? That's when the, yeah. the floodgates just opened at They're this like, point. They're oh, like, oh, great. I hardly even want these. <laughs> now, dude, compensatory picks are clutch. Yep. Oh, GMs my goodness. GMs care about that shit. This is going to be All interesting. Right. I think that, what are, we look, what are the Vikings looking at here? Let me recap the Vikings draft. I got it for you right okay. here. Minnesota. They drafted the first. The first thing they did was pick up. So they they got I, Jordan Addison, Jordan Addison, Mackay Mackay Blackman, Blackman, and Jay Ward. So, mm -hmm. so they went, hey, Kirk, here's our second option. We needed it, Justin Jefferson. You can't just put everything on him like you right, did last we need, year. We need to give him some help. And then it was, hey, our defense was disgusting last year, and not Let's in a good help. way, in the worst way. And Brian Flores. Got two. Who do you want? You know, who, who, who is fit in your scheme here? That to me is what Makai Blackman and Jay Ward are. Even if the value of the either of Roy. Oh, this is, I, I like his tape. And he's another guy where at this point in the draft, he's young. He is a true junior coming out. I, I thought he was truthfully, though, better as a sophomore than a junior, but yeah. kind, of, kind of a guy who ticks every box that you there want you from a defensive tackle. He's six foot three. 305 pounds, long arms, 6'8 wingspan, and played solid. I don't think, like, we're going to show a highlight reel here. There's really not a lot of highlights on his tape. He's not a guy who was looking to make plays, unfortunately. He was a guy who was looking to execute his assignment, and I thought he did it really well. And I think for a guy who's young still, again, true junior coming out, he's strong. He did 30 bench press yep. reps, so he's kind of... You know, a lot of the DTs, I'm saying, not a lot of pass rushing upside. It's not going to happen. But but defensive tackle is becoming a run-first position for a lot of defenses. And, and this is a guy that I feel very confident in that regard at the next level. So, B.J. Hill is the comp there. B.J. Hill's obviously been yep. – was a mid-round pick that the Giants and Bengals were happy as hell with. I, I think that could be the similar guy for the Yeah, Bucks. I think that the fact that he, he can stuff the run. Yeah. He does what's – he answers the – he answers the – he understands the assignment. He – listen, don't – you he doesn't get moved. Goes, didn't, that's a face mask, but still. <laughs> that's okay. It's a play. It's a play. And he showed that he can move a little bit laterally, too, which is what you need to see out of him. I, I think he's a good player. I think they're getting someone, especially with this value, 100, pick 142. He, he's, he provides quality depth, and he's going to continue to grow into that role. And they need DTs on that roster. Do you think he's a zero, or do you think he plays more of a three? I, I think he's versatile enough to just be in any, like, a, if you want to play sides, you know, if you have left defense tackle versus right defense tackle, I, I think you can go from one all the way out to five and not look out of place. So yeah, that's, that's only, what, that kind of versatility. Pounds. That kind of versatility is, is important. They, they obviously added Harrison Phillips um, to that 
defense, that's not enough though. <laughs> you got more needs along that defensive interior. So this is a guy that could be playing real snaps year yeah. one for you. Goodness. All right, we're cooking. Quaylen Roy. So to recap where we are right now, the Browns have a pick that's in. We're waiting on that one. But we just had Jaqueline Roy, Dorian Thompson Robinson. He goes to the, ooh, the Browns. The Browns had, had the Browns got DTR and they have a pick right now. So that's pretty fun. Clayton Toon was go to the Cardinals. Darius Rush to the Colts. KJ Henry to the Commanders and Yasir Abdullah to the Jaguars. We got 20 Cameron more Mitchell. picks before the end of the fifth. And see, this is a draft in my opinion. Like that's, that is, those are four guys, at least the first four, that can be starters. You didn't have a first or second round pick, and those are four guys, in my opinion, that will, in time, start for your football team. That's, whew, that, that's good drafting. That, that, that is good. That's a necessary draft, too, for the Cleveland Browns, because last year did not go their way. Here they we gave go. a pick that was a pretty premium pick. The pick is in. A little. Northwestern cornerback Cameron Mitchell is the pick here. Another pick for the Cleveland Browns. They go defense again. They get some more defense. Mm -hmm. They're getting some help. This is a really interesting pick for them because they, they look, they're, they're looking to fix a lot of different things. Former teammate of their first round pick a couple of years ago, Greg Newsom, the mm -hmm. second at Northwestern. This guy had some fans. I know he was on a number of top 100 boards that I saw. Uh, I, I think he's a little, I, I question his play strength. You know, 5'11, 191, he could get pushed around a touch, but he's twitchy. This guy can really mirror a route tree. Ran a 447, 4.06 short shuttle, 689 three cone, like ticking those boxes. 10 pass breakups this past season. I, I think he's a solid all around corner. I think he could play slot or outside if need be. May not have super high end to his game. It may, may have never been a lockdown guy there at Northwestern, but I think versatile enough that, you know, you have your starters in place there. You have Denzel Ward, you have Martin Emerson, you have Greg Newsome. You don't need a starter for you. You need a guy to where if my slot gets hurt, Someone can play slot. If my outside corner gets hurt, someone can play outside. This is a guy that can do both. Oh, Abani Kanda comes yes. off the board. Israel Abani Kanda, running back from Pitt. This guy is an absolute warrior. Like this, watch the way he runs. Watch how fast he is. Suddenness. There's, there's a suddenness to his game that I really enjoy. The, 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 it takes him two steps to get to top speed. He it may not have the highest top end speed, but he does have burst and. That burst is what gets yeah. you into oh, yeah. space. The burst gets you into space. You get into space, now it's a foot race. He might not win every foot race, but at least he has the burst to get into space. You see that little angle right there. Breaks a tackle, sidesteps a tackle, your arms aren't on me, and he's gonna try to get to the end zone. Look at that! Dude, <laughs> he, he's a unique prospect for a number of reasons. One, he's the youngest prospect in this draft class. Okay. He does not turn 21 until October. So super Ooh. young, um, 1,431 yards this last year. And, and like he was the biggest big play running back in the class. It was, it was all or nothing for him. He had a ton of runs of 40 plus yards this past season. And once he got in the open field, see ya. It was lights out. He was taken to the house. I do though, why he falls this point in the draft, never been too much as a wide receiver. Sure. And running style wise, I just did not like his tape. And now he's young, fairly inexperienced. That can improve. But to me, he looked like how running backs, or excuse me, how wide receivers look when they have to get placed at running back, where it's mm -hmm. like the pacing is not correct, the vision is not where taking you where it's supposed to go, and the feet don't always uh, churn into contact. He'll stop his feet in the backfield a little too often for my money. But if you can coach him up, if you can get him with a good right. running back coach that can get in his ear and really get him to work on his fundamentals, this is as physically gifted a running back that exists in this draft class in terms of pure explosiveness and size. 216 pounds running a 4.44 with a 41 inch vertical. This guy can cook. He's just very, very rough around the edges. Rough around the edges, but that game we just saw right there, the Virginia Tech game, he went for 320 yards. Oh yeah. 320 yards in that game. Let me read you these. 71 runs for first down, 38 runs of over 10 yards, and 16 runs of over 20 yards. Mm -hmm. Like, that's who he is. That's just this season. Like, he, he gets the job done. I really love watching him play uh, for those Pitt Panthers. Let's see what else we got. Him and Brees Hall. I, I mean, yeah. I actually really like 
uh, who's the Jets' other back that was playing at the end of last year? Zonovan Knight. I, I like their backfield now. Yeah, they I, have Bam Bam. Bam Knight, Michael Carter, Brees Hall, and this guy. So you have two, you know, high-end explosive dudes. You have one great pass catcher in Michael Carter, and you have an elusive kind of between the tackles back in Bam Knight that you're really never getting a drop-off. Uh, in this, I mean, obviously you are. Brees is obviously the cream of the crop in that backfield, sure. but in a certain role, you have guys that can fill it. There we go. We got a, oh, Antonio Maffi. Antonio Maffi from UCLA. Another UCLA lineman off the board. That's, oh, that's in. Listen, they're fi- they're realizing. Oh, there was a reason why Zach Charbonnet was so productive. So this is a good pick, man. Where do you think he plays at the next level? This dude is a guard yeah. through and through. He so is, both of their guards coming off the board. Yeah, six foot three, 329. He started his career and was playing legit snaps as a freshman and sophomore. Mm-hmm. Started 14 games those two years as a nose tackle for UCLA. Switches to offensive line in 2020 during the pandemic. Doesn't play any that year. Gets his feet wet in 2021 and finally becomes a starter this past season. And his tape for, again, three years of ever playing offensive line, I was a fan of. I mean, the guy knows how to use his hands. He's powerful as shit. I mean, he, he can move people yeah. as strong as an offensive line as you'll see in this draft class. Just the feet are not there. Right. He, is, he is not a high-end, you know, mobile, agile dude. He's going to struggle to find and locate in space. But in a phone booth, like we're talking about with this Patriots and what Bingo. they're doing offensively, yeah. put him next to someone like Michael Aquanu or just what they have there, Trent Brown and this guy, you are crushing double teams. Oh, you drafted Kalijah Kansi and you want to you wanna see me run duo 30 times a game at you? You're not going to be able to hold up to dudes like this. So. And that's the, that's the goal. The goal is, listen, everybody, everybody else wants to get small. Everybody wants to run the spread. Everybody wants to do this. And everybody wants to build their defense to stop that. Guess what? We're going to be different. We're going to be different. We're going to do something different. We're going to go ahead and go out there, and we're going to go out there, and we're going to maul you. Maul you. We're going to grind you into dust. I can't – like, this is good. It's going to be fun to watch kind of that old school – going back to the old school mm-hmm. style where it's just, you know, not, not quite three yards in a cloud of dust, but if we have to hulk up, we will. It's interesting team-building draft for the Patriots. Kind of giving you insight in what they want to do. It's, All right. Uh, I like their draft, though. So we got this. We got a recap here, guys. We got K.J. Henry. He's going to the Commanders. Got an uh, edge rusher out of Clemson. We got Darius Rush, corner out of South Carolina. He's going to the Colts. We got Clayton Toon, Houston quarterback, going to the Cardinals, giving them a little bit of insurance. Uh, Cleveland Browns you get more insurance as well with QB, DTR, Dorian Thompson Robinson out of UCLA. At the Vikings, we have Jaqueline Roy, a defensive lineman out of LSU, a guy that's going to be a tough run stopper. Next up, we've got the Browns, again, taking a cornerback, Cameron Mitchell, this time from Northwestern. The Jets have, the Jets take Israel Abinikanda from Pitt, and then the Patriots take Antonio Maffi. This is going to, this is interesting. Now we got the Carolina Panthers coming up, and we're going to see what they do in this draft. A lot of picks I like there. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, there's nope. no pick there that I'm like, what are you thinking? Like, Ooh, I don't know. I mean, I mean, we're in the fifth round, too. So, sure. so you even like if everything. it was a pick where I was like, eh, I got a UDFA, UDFA grade on them, we're 100 we're picks. We're, we're yeah. close to getting to UDFA anyway. So can't complain too much. But a lot of guys that I think, you know, fifth oh, rounders, wow. sometimes you draft them and then you never hear about them again. A lot of guys, I think, and shit, another one here coming off the board. Here we go. I know this one. And Jamie Robinson, that yep. this guy can start. This is a starting safety in the NFL right there for you. He was a four-year starter between two years at South Carolina, yep. two years at Florida State, played slot, has played deep, has played in the box, one of the best tacklers in this draft class consistently, just doesn't have the physical profile. And so at this point in the draft, I'm either targeting high-end athletes who, like I said, good athletes with good excuses or – Middling athletes with high-end production. This, right. to me, is a middling athlete with high-end production. He was as impactful as any safety. And you watch him tackle there. Yeah, he's vicious. Violence. Oh, I I'm a that. big fan. He's a top 75 player for me. This was Look a guy who was dude. high on my board. Yeah, he's he is he's great coming downhill. He's a violent football player. And I, I, listen, I want violence out of my mm-hmm. safety. I need you to be violent. I want you to be violent. I need that violence to show you to show people that listen. You don't want to catch the ball back here. Uh-huh. And I know the game's changed and the rules have changed, but listen, you hit somebody in their kidneys. Guess what? They don't want. They don't want to go. They don't want to go, want to go across the middle either. So that's the way I look at it. Like that violence is important. So this is pretty cool. Obviously, a kid that played at South Carolina, 
then goes to Florida State. Big part of the kind of Florida State's kind of mini resurgence was getting better on defense. I'm, I'm excited for, um, what's his name? For next year's defense, the defensive end they've got down there too. Oh, Jared Verse, surprised yeah. he didn't come out. Yeah, I, I was, that's what I was gonna say. I was surprised yeah. too, Jared Verse. Surprised he didn't come out. So that's a big thing for them this upcoming season. So I'll say this. So to put some context to Robinson's, you know, lack of traits, like I was saying. So he's five foot 10, 191. He has only a six foot wingspan. So only 29 to five inch mm -hmm. arms. So short arms, undersized a little bit and only ran a four, five, nine. But man, flip on the tape and it's like, do I, do I mind that much? Like he, he's not going to be a pure deep safety. He's probably gonna be a too high guy, like ideally is where I'm looking at him. Uh, but a guy with like slot versatility that, you know, maybe the traits don't say he can do a lot of the things he does, but, but the tape his, tells a different story. Especially because he knows what he's doing. Mm -hmm. That's the other part of it. And that's the thing we, we've talked a little bit about it, but anticipation can help you get places you probably shouldn't even be. Yeah. And that's what, that's what works for a guy like him. Understanding what's going on around you on the field, knowing where you're supposed to be, and then getting there. I'll say this, 23 bench press reps, though, for safety. That's, that's, that's big boy stuff. Well, guess what? You got short arms. Yeah, yeah that helps, too. <laughs> that's my excuse, my long arms, why I can't hit 225 anymore. Dude, I haven't even tried. Are you kidding me? I have not even tried. Uh, oh, my goodness. All right, we got to pick it. in. Let's see. Does anybody know who it is? Everybody's not talking about it. Got it. Who we got? We got the Saints on the clock. We got the Saints. Titans, Bears. Saints got their pick in. And then I need the Packers to draft someone high on my board. Look at that. I'm excited. All right, who, who's tops avail here? Dude, Luke Whipler still hasn't come off the board. That one's poof. Yeah, I know. That's some, there's got to be something Dude, up with that, if, right? the if he's on the board for the Titans, mm -hmm. they got to pull the trigger, right? That, that has should. to be. Yeah, the, if the Titans don't, I will be floored. Okay, let's look at the big board. Luke Whipler's still there. Tana McKee is still there. Travis Hodges Tomlinson is still there. Antonio Johnson's still there. Andre Carter, a guy I wanted to talk about, but now that we look at where we are, we might not get to talk about him. So we might have to just do it anyway. So um, A.T. Perry, I love him. Dwayne McBride, love him too. Uh, Corey Trice, we already talked about. Uh, Moro Jomo, what do you think about him? So Jomo is a guy who had a real good breakout season this past year. He's long, he's linearly explosive, and he's a fifth year dude who's only 21 years old. He got to Texas wow. at 17 years old. Oh man. And he has improved year on year ever since. Uh, he's one that, you know, not many guys that I think profile to like above average starters at this point in the draft. He's one that I could see doing that. Because the he has so much room to grow. The top player on the consensus board right now on just like the pro football networks is Antonio Johnson, 64th player. He's a big surprise to still be available at this point in the draft. Ooh, Jordan Howden. Yep. Gotta be honest. Haven't watched them. <laughs> first guy, 147. First guy I got to that is not uh, in the Mike Renner database. Ah, look at that. Yeah, don't have a ton on him either. I watched, but here's the thing. I did watch Minnesota play. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I knew their secondary was good. Their secondary has been good. It comes with that. The same thing we talked about with Illinois, same thing we talked about with Maryland. He, listen, well, let's look what he brings to the table. Let's check it and check it out. Okay. Big, not, big not dude. So he's 5'11", 203. He yeah. got 32 and a quarter inch arms. He had a 39 and a half inch vertical as pro day and ran a 4'49". So we go from a guy who's a production dude in, in Jamie Robinson to, to a, a traits dude or, yes. in Jordan Howden. And they had another traitsy safety there who I'm blanking on his name in Minnesota. Who am I thinking of there? That's something. But they had a good defensive backfield. Him, Terrell Smith is Terrell probably going to come off the board here sometimes yes. in the Minnesota corner. So they had a real secondary this past season. Howden, though. Look at the Saints, what they've done. They've added Jordan Howden. They got Jake Hayner, Nick Saldiveri, Kendra Miller, Isaiah Foskey, Brian Bressy. One, two, three defensive guys and three offensive guys. There we go. Yeah. Here we go. They're, they're secondary now, safeties. They already obviously have Tyron Matthew, Marcus May as your starters. But after that, it gets a little thin. You have so JT Howden Gray, Jonathan Abram, and Smoke Monday. So safety, uh, as far as team that, you know, I think tight end might be your only quote unquote need on this roster at the moment with all the picks that they've made so far. You're really looking for Howden's, you know, special teams depth and safety is a position where if one of those first two guys got hurt, you probably would not feel great about who was coming in after them. There we go. We got another pick in. This is for the Titans. Let's see what they did here. Dude, this if if they get Luke Whipler, 
That will be amazing. This will be one of my favorite drafts. You know, going. Vrabel's there. Ohio State. And he reminds me of, like, Ben Jones. You know, like, that's the kind of center you're ben getting. Jones. The guy who was, like, stalwart there for forever. Uh, yeah. A stretch zone type of center. That's what they do. It's their bread and butter. My Lord. Run the card in. Come on. Go ahead and do it. I'm looking. So Bears after this. Packers yeah. after that. The Bears draft has been interesting, to say the least. Yeah, but we, we got to see talked about see it, how it's trades. like a bunch of boomer bust type of dudes yep. that they've gone with. I wouldn't hate if they kind of went a little bit safer here and try to get a guy like Amoro Jomo who can just like see the football field for you, can be a little consistent for you. What? Josh Weil from Cincy. That's who the pick is for the Tennessee Titans. This is Josh Wild from Cincinnati. This is a guy, Cincinnati has, has had a couple of really good tight ends, obviously, most notably Travis Kelsey. But they've had some other good tight ends as well. And when you look at Josh Wild, I think he does one of those things that, that all their tight ends have done, that most of their wide receivers have done well, especially the taller ones. They catch the ball well in that high point situation. They high point the ball well. They don't always get a ton of separation, but when they catch the football, it's up high, and they go, they go out and they make plays. So this is one that, for me, he could save your quarterback, be wide open, and come back to him to make some plays. So when I look at him, I see someone that's not afraid of traffic. Look at him lined up in the backfield. Okay, there's a little bit of versatility. This is going to be an interesting, interesting fit for them because I don't know that he's going to be like the blocker that they need to get. Yeah, I agree. It's tough with as thin as his. Still look at him. Yeah, he's skinny and short arms. So he, he's okay. he's one of the few guys who is taller than his wingspan. Six foot six with a six foot five inch wingspan. Oh my that rarely happens. Um, but he's got really good ball skills. He's really reliable. He can get up the seam. Um, a different type of tight end than Chica Conquell, who you got in the roster, who's more of your move, space, throw him screens, get him yak stuff. I, I think Wiley can actually like work downfield, make plays outside his frame, even if you know maybe has short arms to do so. So he, he's kind of just a depth tight end. I, I profiled him as a number two type of tight end at the next level. Had him a little lower down on my board because of that. Is this, did he play volleyball? Is that him or is that a different player? I am not sure about that one. Yeah. I know Cincinnati had, yeah, it's not him. It was the guy, it was, nope, that was him. A volleyball player. I mean, 6'6", six, six, dude. If you're not playing volleyball at 6'6", six, six, you're missing out. It is. It does suck when you play volleyball, like ever, you go to like play beach volleyball and there's like a guy who's good and like his yeah. tall. And you're I don't like, know okay, if it's dude, him or not. It could have been the receiver that came out last year. <sighs> Alex Pierce? Know. Pierce feels like he'd be a volleyball player. Yeah, I think, it, I think that's That dude could was. jump. Can, probably, yeah. probably could still jump. Yes. Yeah. So where are we at? We Noah got the, Soul. To the Bears? Noah Soul to the Bears. Oh, I like that pick. Yeah, that's great. That's absolutely fantastic. Yeah, Sewell's, he's a unique dude in that he's never going to be a coverage off-ball off linebacker. No. He is 250 pounds. Sure. Six foot one. He, he, is, he is like Penny Sewell condensed down. Right, yes. you know, like yeah. it, you just squish him down, and that's Noah Sewell, powerful dude. He did 27 bench press reps, and yep. he's only a true junior coming out here. You're getting a downhill football player. I truthfully, I said move him to edge. He has almost the same body type as Micah Parsons, the guy who was sitting here next to us a couple days ago. In that, you know, undersized, but he plays with such good leverage. He plays with such power, and he uses his hands so violently that I think he can rush the passer. If I'm the Bears, that's probably where I'm starting him out. Uh, just because I know as an off-ball linebacker, you're not getting the agility, you're not getting the sort of range you want in coverage to be making plays to where I think there's still a spot for him on the football field, but I just don't think it's where he played at, at Oregon. Yeah, I think the interesting part about him is the, the course correction with how he's incredible. He over-pursues, then he course corrects, and he, it's, it's one of those things that he is a violent football player. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, that's going to be probably next year's best tight end, and he just decided to move him out of the way. Mm -hmm. So I look at this, and I just think that he's – he gets stuck a little bit, as you mentioned, with moving laterally. Can you move into – I wonder what he looks like playing on the edge, like yeah. a true edge coming downhill to make the, make the rush because I, don't, I think he's probably a little bit more – I don't think he's as athletic as, as Parsons. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah, but, No one is, right? <laughs> but I think he can – make plays. I think there's a violence in him 
that not many other guys yes. have. And that's something that you can't teach that. And you look at the Bears depth, they have TJ Edwards, Trey Edmonds, and Jack Sanborn at those that three linebacker spot. So they got options now at linebacker. Yes. That's why this, to me, feels like they, they don't have a lot of options at edge. I'd be surprised if he's not moved there. It's going to be interesting. Pick oh, wow. Packers, who we got? Cool. Sean Clifford, are you shitting me? No way. Sean Clifford? I don't want to hate on him too much because he's already gotten that from every Penn State fan in existence. But, like, Sean Clifford? I don't know how you're going to break it down. We don't need to. Let's move on. <laughs> they can't believe they drafted Sean Clifford. Over Tanner McKee? I like Sean Clifford. I think they're at the same Elite 11. Him and really? uh, Tanner McKee, I think so. Yeah, I um, guess that was five years ago. He is, um, he's a guy who's had a, a long, winding road. And he did what he could for Penn State. I just think, I think that, obviously, he had a rough go of it at Penn State. Obviously, there was some injury situation, but also... He's a guy that he's got to figure out who he is and what he does, and I think that going there, he doesn't he doesn't put the put his feet to the fire. He doesn't put Jordan Love's feet to the fire. No, but he does provide a guy, a guy who knows how to play the quarterback spot. He's never going to be your saver, but this is going to be interesting. Yeah, I I had a UDFA grade. I, I was not particularly impressed by his tape, but I will say, he got better. He his got better. Went on. He he did improve this past season. It, it was his best year. It was still not draftable, and he is uh, going to be 25 by the time the season starts. Yep. So, huh? <laughs> yeah, I mean that's the point of the draft we're at, though, right? Yeah. It, is that right. this Sean Clifford doesn't even have to see an NFL roster, and no one will no, like it, right. It, you don't expect this. You, you don't expect him to. You, right. you don't expect any of these guys to. But that's why I'm still surprised because I think there are some guys that still are capable of. Making Getting and playing NFL roster, so. Hmm. There we go. Packers current draft. Sean Cl add Sean Clifford to Colby Wooden, Tucker Craft, Jaden Reed, Luke Musgrave, and Lucas Van Ness. Got two Lukes on there. An interesting draft to say the least. Really all over the map. I, I think though, once you get uh, Lucas Van Ness, Luke Musgrave, Tucker Craft, I think that's. I think those are good players. I think those are impact type of guys. I'm very curious. You, you don't draft tight ends where they drafted them. Early second, early third. Right. Without a plan to play right. both. To, vamp, right? to, revamp like, your, to revamp your offensive plan. You're not just saying, oh, there's going to be a tight end competition. Yeah. One of you is going to start. You're saying you guys are both going to see the football field at some time. right? Yes. Like when the Patriots drafted Aaron Hernandez after Rob Gronkowski. Right. There was a plan in place. I wonder if, what that's going to look like. Oh, Justin Shorter. Interesting. Oh, wow. Look at this. Justin Shorter. This guy's kind of been around the block, right? Penn State to Oregon to Florida. He is someone, again, who I saw at the opening. Justin Shorter, I mean, he reminds me of, like, he's a true possession receiver. Mm -hmm. He has, he's been, he played a lot of football. I think that there's a chance that he, not, not only can he make a roster, I think he's going to be some sort of a leader for somebody because he's been everywhere. He's played with everybody. He knows what he's doing. He's got a lot of skills. There was a time when Penn State could have had Justin Fields throwing to Justin Shorter. I, I saw them throwing to each other. Mm -hmm. And both, and then Fields obviously famously ends up at Georgia, then goes to Ohio State. Shorter gets to Penn State, then heads off to Oregon, then gets his goes, goes on down to Florida. This is an interesting pick. This is a guy that, for me, when I went through and was doing some of those comps that you guys always like, let me pull him up. Justin Shorter, I, I said Alvin Harper. Like, oh, man. he's not going to be your number one. Yeah, or two. He's not going to be your winner, too. But you know what? He's going to be okay. Yeah. If you I, need him in a pinch, he's going to do something that you didn't expect, and that's going to be – that's what he's going to need to do. He – truthfully, there are a few guys in this class uh, that I said watching the tape. I'm like, why not add 20 pounds and try to call yourself a tight end? Yeah. Here's one of them. He's six four, 234 pounds at his pro day. So he's, you know, a Popeye's meal from – Qualifying as tight end, six foot ten, six foot ten inch wingspan, really reliable hands. I mean, I think he only had a couple drops over his entire collegiate career. Now, also didn't have a ton of catches over his collegiate career. Peaked with 577 yards this past season. Just no dynamism to him. No, no suddenness, no separation ability. He is a guy who you're throwing jump balls to to try to get production out of him. Bingo. Mike Morris coming off the board okay. here. Okay. 
the Michigan edge rusher. And now on tape, he was better than the 151st best player in this draft class. He's six foot six in the 270 pound range. 275 is what he weighed in at the combine. And he uses his hands well. He, he knows how to rush the passer. He paces his rushes really well. He just is a very, very limited athlete. Yeah. Listed at Michigan at 290, I thought that's kind of the player. I, I thought you were getting maybe like a four or five technique, but the 275 is really not in that range of what you want. I think he's a pure edge, but dude is just stiff. 465 short shuttle, 746 three cone, 5.0840 at his pro day. Those are not good numbers. Um, and, and when he doesn't jump the snap like right there, he, he really does not test the right. edge for offensive tackles. And so good tape, but a poor, poor athlete by NFL standards. Yeah, but I think the question is, can he jump the snap? And yeah, that's can he be that's a that's that's a that's a hard thing to tell because yeah. some guys are really good at it in college and then they can't do it at the next level. Other guys learn it at the next level. Some guys never learn it. Yeah. And so that's gonna be the interesting part of all this. And again, we're getting him in the fifth round. I did look it up shorter. No Oregon, just just Penn okay. State to Florida. to Florida. Yeah, but it's a it's, it's fine. He is. Uh, listen, to go back to to Mike Morris. He has to, in terms of what the Seahawks are getting. Look look at this look at this draft. Defense, offense, defense, offense, offense, defense, defense. They know what they're doing. They, they want to get big up front. Anthony Bradford's going to help them do that. Uh, Zach Charbonnet is going to help them with that. They also want to stretch you. Jackson Smith and Jig was going to help them do that. You throw in Devin Witherspoon, Derek Hall, Mike Morris, they have the opportunity. And then Cameron Young, obviously, they have the opportunity to go out there and absolutely put their hands on people. Yeah, Seahawks, they're in a spot to really take control of the West. It is up for grabs. It's, that's what I was going to say. It's up for grabs. The Cardinals have a quarterback coming off an injury. And they stink. The Rams. <laughs> <Flat out> suck. <laughs> the Rams yeah. have to basically completely rebuild, rebuild the, roster. the roster. Yeah. Okay, and the got? 49ers obviously are rolling with Brock after a UCL tear. I have no idea. Colby Sourceful. Excuse me? <laughs> Who? Colby Sourceful. William & Mary. Did not get to my William & Mary tape this year. That was on the back burner. I, I, I couldn't tell you who this is. Yeah, there we go. Unfortunately. Yeah, sorry, guys. Hmm. <laughs> No, um, like I don't have the resources of an NFL front office at my disposal no. the way they guys, these guys do. But he is six foot five, three hundred five pounds, ran a five one five forty at his pro day and a four seven short shuttle. Those are solid numbers. Thirty three inch arms, so maybe he could stick at tackle. I don't know. Who did he go to there? He went to the Lions. All right. Yep. Culture fit. I'm looking at his picture right now. Long flowing locks. That's got Dan Campbell's name written all over it. Look at that. All right. 49ers. That's the other team we were thinking of. So it's the 40. The, it's about them and the 49ers. Yes. And the 49ers are just, they're in a weird spot at quarterback. Yeah. Where you, you, Trey Lance, you have no clue what you have in them. Yep. And your guy who was good as a rookie is coming off probably the worst injury you can have for a quarterback in, in, a, in an elbow tear. So we shall see. So the Seahawks are in a, I think it's the reason why they didn't go quarterback when they're sitting at pick five and could have because they want to get involved right now. They right. made the playoffs when people, no one in, thought they were. No, no one thought they had a chance. Made the playoffs and now are in a prime driver's seat to add more talent to this roster and I think and just did. keep pushing. So. I think that's, I think looking at everything as his own individual scenario instead of looking at what, who, who picked who or who picked what, I think it's important to realize they view they, they view themselves as having a window. Mm -hmm. So they went out and got things that could help them right now. Instead of, well, how's this guy gonna help? Why didn't we get this guy? He's, he's we could develop him. No, you don't. They, don't, they don't, they're not looking for development. They're looking for guys that can play right now, go out there, make plays, and do what they need to do. Is he as talented as some of the other guys that are maybe still on the board now? But you know what he's gonna be able to do? Get into that meeting, understand what's going on, and be able to translate that meeting work to field work and help them win football games right now mm -hmm. to hopefully get to the playoffs but also get to the Super Bowl. Yeah. And the NFC, you, you got Eagles, obviously, going to be your returning favorites. Cowboys? Mm-hmm. Then who? You know, like, then then who are you afraid of after those two Cowboys teams? and Eagles, you said? Yeah. But who's really Giants. scaring you? 
Not no one Giants. in the South right now. No, no, no. Saints no. probably take the South, but are they real no. Super Bowl contenders? Derek no. Carr? No. The West? No. Brock Purdy led 49ers, Karen? Like the the Seahawks, if they if they make some strides here and they hit on these rookies quick, they could be that third team in the in the NFC. Oh, the Dennis kid from Pitt. Oh, Servakia. Yeah. Dude's got a unique build. Yeah. Yes, very long arms. Long very arms. Six foot corner for linebacker. Yeah, Servakia, uh, Servakia Dennis from Pitt. He's got long arms. This is a guy that probably, uh, he, he, see, he, that, and I guess I see the difference between you were talking about Noah Sewell and him. Yeah. Because he can move well laterally. He Lateral. understands what's going on in front of him. And the thing about Dennis is he, he still can make himself kind of small and come through the hole and create penetration and Listen, playing for you can't play for Pat Narduzzi. You specifically can't play linebacker for Pat Narduzzi if you're not willing to stick your nose in there, and that's something he's willing to do. This is a tough dude, man. I'm a fan of the way this yeah. guy plays the game of football. 4'6", 340. He went 41 and a half inch in the vertical. Ooh. He's an explosive athlete. Now, in coverage at the Senior Bowl, nothing special. I, I, I didn't think he was. He was a guy who makes plays Great like job. this in front of him, but if he has to turn and run, if he has to react laterally, you're meh, like, but you can survive with him at linebacker. He's not a liability by any means in coverage. And a guy who we're talking about going to Todd Bowles and his defense, he's going to be asked to come downhill and blitz. He can do that. So I, yep. uh, I'm a fan of this pick at where it came off the board. Oh, and then Olu Oluwatimi coming off the board to the Seahawks. Oh, wow. Here. That, that's a guy who they probably need a center. If there's any position on this interior that they could use, it probably is the center position for the Seahawks. And I think he's NFL ready. Now, is he NFL ready and, you know, a quality starter? Probably not. I don't think he's that as an athlete. I think his uh, ability to sustain blocks, I question. But he is tough. He is physical. And he's obviously experienced. Six-year guy coming out. Multiple years, I think five years at Virginia, then transfers to Michigan this past season. They obviously win the Joe Moore right. Award is the best offensive line in the country. And I thought he was their best offensive lineman. But I just think a little bit of a limited dude, but also a guy that could probably start for you right away. Well, our guy's still on the board. Luke Whip. Yeah. You know, but so the Seahawks and what they want to do, they, they do big, powerful. Super line, strong. Right? They dra that's what they've kind of targeted over the years, especially on the interior. Two completely different types of offensive linemen. Whipler is a stretch zone, pull to the edge, get to the second level. Oluwatimi is your I can handle NFL caliber nose tackles, one on one sort of guy. Yeah, you like, I, I like to see it, man. He, he, can, he, I liked watching them play because they were so strong up front, up until they weren't. When, yeah, yeah. So until they saw, yeah, saw Georgia or no, excuse me, no, TCU. TCU. <laughs> well, Georgia the year before that. Georgia the year before that, but he wasn't. He wasn't there that he wasn't year. There, yeah. So yeah, but you look at him. He can move bodies, and I see that's a great part of it. You can, if you can move those bodies and keep running, I love the effort there to try to keep running down the play. That's good. Here you see him catch. Hold. He holds his line, even though the rest of those guys give up some space and put, create pressure for the quarterback. But this is a big score and play for them um, against uh, Ohio State. He held his own against Ohio State. You got, and that's what you have to do to be in the position here to have a team like this, like the Seattle Seahawks want to take you. Can we? Okay, let's look at the big board. Travis Hodges. The, the first three haven't changed in a while. In a long time. Yeah. Antonio Johnson's on there as well. Andre Carter is on there. Uh, we got Dwayne McBride. I really like him. I like AT. He's got to come off the board here sometime know, soon, right? right? He's too talented. Yeah. So we've got all these guys on the board. We're waiting to see who the 49ers pick. I would love Corey Trice here, truthfully. Uh, if they're, you know, they kind of farted out whatever that was in the third round with those yeah. picks, drafting the kicker. But they could get a guy in Corey Trice that, like, can actually make an impact on this roster and, like, fits what they want to do defensively. Um, I, I would love if that's the pick. We'll see. Good. Man. see. Come on, show me. Let's see. So let's reset the 49ers here. Who have they gotten so far? So they went Jair Brown. They traded up for him. Then they went Jake Moody, the kicker, championship-level kicker probably. Cameron Latu, tight end. Yep. We discussed that one. Yep, we did. And then that was their last pick. They had those three at the back end of the third. And now they're on the clock for the first time since then. So three guys there where I was like, Jerry Brown I like, but it's like no one really making an impact now. Maybe they go. Oh, they go Darryl outside Luder. corner. Yeah. 
This not guy's twice. good. Yeah, I like Luder. He's very good. Playing in press, man. He gets hands on. He tracks the ball well. Obviously, it's a bad throw, but you know what? A lot of cornerbacks create, they, they, they commit pass interference on that play huh. because they can't get their head around. So that's a great play. Daryl Luter from South Alabama, the Jaguars. I love, I, this kid is good. He can really play. Did you have him higher than this or no? No, this is right at the range I had him, but I was a fan uh, of his tape. I just think a little limited athletically. I didn't see quite the feet and footwork that it takes to be like kind of a high-end corner, but I think he can start in the league I think he can be an average starter in time because of the way he plays. You know, he wants to play aggressive. He wants to attack the football in the air. He can attack the football in the air. Five picks the past two years, 22 pass breakups the past two seasons, and he's got long arms. So just kind of a meh athlete by NFL standards, but sure. play style wise, he has what it takes to transfer from a low level competition in South Alabama to a high level competition, obviously, in the NFC West. So. A guy that fits, again, kind of what this, the, uh, the 49ers want to do defensively. They are now obviously without Jacko Ryans. I mean, they've got D'Amador Lenore, uh, Talanoa Funga, Tashawn Gibson, Charvius Ward, and Miles Hartsfeld as their first five. And, and Lenore... Ambry Thomas. Wow, I didn't realize he was with the 49ers. Lenore, Lenore, excuse me, Thomas and Hufanga were all guys they find late in this sort of range of the draft, so... Not crazy. I, I don't. How do you feel about this pick, Jordan McFadden, the off, the guard from Clemson? I like Jordan McFadden. You like him? I don't. I I question his play strength. If yes. I'm being honest, that, I, that's I, true. I do, because watching Clemson's offensive line over the last, essentially since Trevor Lawrence left, watching that offensive line has been pretty appalling. Um, the way that they've been able to be pushed around by teams, they get pushed around. Um, I'll never forget. Was it the Georgia game? I believe, where. They they were in the back. They were they were lined up at the three, and the whole offensive line ended up in the end zone. And I was like, how does this happen? As in going backwards yeah. into the end zone. I didn't I didn't get it. Like I don't I don't understand how that happened. So, I, I just question his play strength. I think he has the size. I think he has the, the tangibles. They say he won he won the Jacobs blocking trophy. I still am just watching him. I just wonder a lot a lot of the blocking that 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 team does is shielding and creating creases so that they can the running back can create the hole not bruise it's not like playing mm -hmm. at Arkansas it's not like playing at Georgia or Alabama no I, I do question his play strength too I, I think he may even be like a center convert he's six foot two okay. 300 pounds three-year starter though at tackle for Clemson first year at right tackle two years at left tackle long arms though he still has 34 inch arms yeah. obviously at six foot two not a lot of people are going to give you a shot at tackle though so he's probably kicking inside but I love his technique I love the way he yes. uses his hands he just has balance issues, and he just has play strength issues. He's just not going to move people. He's going to have to sustain blocks um, more than he, you know, imposes his will on other guys. So that's how I see him as a prospect. Yeah, we are, we are on the same page on that one. Yeah. Ukai Blue. I don't think there's an E at the end of the second blue there, technically in his name. But Kai Blue is a one of the better zone corners. His ability to move in space from off and kind of reduce space, as you see here, and kind yeah. of get into Create, wide receivers, I'm a fan of. He's eliminate not, separation. Not a pure press guy, not a pure man guy, but you know, Baltimore there, they just like to load up on versatile corners. I think he's a guy that I'd be comfortable even moving to safety if you wanted him to. And so uh, they needed it, obviously. They've kind of gotten depleted in the past couple seasons. And this is a guy that a lot of people had a lot higher. I think consensus board had him as a top 100 player. Uh, I had him just outside the top 100 in the 120s, but man, he, he's a solid football player. Dude, I, I was gonna ask you about the safety thing because I do think he has great ball skills, the ability to come downhill and make plays, but also the ability to play in the back end. I think he is fast enough in the back end to go make plays. So mm -hmm. this is another, whoop, let's get yeah. him. So it's one of those things where with Kai Blue, uh, with Kelly, he's so, Versatile. Mm -hmm. I don't want him to play man consistently. Yeah. I want him to play man. If you are, if this is a, if this is an all-out blitz and the ball's coming out quick, and he can play it from off instead of playing it from press, gets to see through and then go make a play. I want that. But I don't want this. I, if something, if that's the case, the exact play that we yeah. just showed, where they come, up, they go. come on the blitz, he's playing them off, and then he gets to go break and make a play. That's what I mm -hmm. want him to do if he's playing any man. But otherwise, I'd like him in deep third, deep thirds. I like him in cover too. Uh, at the corner or at the safety spot, I think you can do either one of those. Yeah, and so they, they kind of had to move to a more zone-heavy approach last year simply because 
Marcus Peters was not playing man anymore. Right. He was not the point in his career where he could do that consistently and not get torched. So I think they probably are going to because they really haven't added uh, too much else to that cornerback group. You have Marlon Humphrey, obviously, feel great about him. But then you got question marks. You got Jalen Armour Davis, who drafted in the fourth last year, who had some fans. I had him as top 100 player last year, but obviously as a fourth rounder, he got kind of torched in the p- games he did play. You have Brandon Stevens, who was a third rounder the year before that. He hasn't shown much for you. Right. Marvin Williams, who was a fourth rounder last year as well. You got a lot of question marks. Obviously, you haven't addressed it to date in this draft, but I think at some point they had to do it. And this is a corner that kind of fits their versatility that they covet on the back end. All right. What are, who's on the clock? The Colts? Boom. Here we go. Colts. Colts have been kind of cooking. If, if, yeah. if they get back in the lab here and make another good pick, uh, they are in the running for my favorite draft so far. Got it. Oh, is this Daniel Scott? Is that who the pick is? Let's see. I think it is. Oh, dude. Yeah. He's a player. This is one of not a lot of single high guys in this class. Not a lot of right. guys with real deal range in this draft class. And he is one of them. I think he can really cook sideline to sideline. They got a guy last year, Nick Cross, yep. who fills that mold as well. But Daniel Scott, 4-4-5 speed, 6-1, 208. And on tape, that 4 4 5 shows up. Yes, it he does. He gets there in a hurry, two plays. Um, I do think, though, he doesn't necessarily play up to that 208 consistently. Like, I'm not putting him in the box a ton, but the guy's range is real. And, and I'm surprised he lasted this long, because as I said, there's just not a lot of athletes in this safety class. Um, and, and I think he could Woo. I think he could steal some playing time there over the course of his rookie contract for the Colts. Yeah, so let's see what the Colts have done so far. Anthony Richardson, Julius Prince, Josh Downs, Blake Freeland. Um, God dang it. At a ballway. At a bar. Darius Rush, that's a corner. Daniel Scott, that's a safety. So they've they've went and got they're they're working one, two, three, four, four defensive guys. Three of them are defensive backs. Yeah. They they know they what know. they're they're working to do. And Scott is an interesting guy because he can move around uh, and he he likes to trigger. And that's a cool thing for him. He's not afraid. Listen, play for Justin Wilcox, you better not be afraid. Like that's one of the things you can people can joke all around they want about Cal not being that good or not caring about football, but Wilcox cares and Wilcox also is very good at coaching in, in, in the second. Yeah, yeah, this is, I mean, this is good tape. Like he, he's legitimate. Like this is this guy can be a starter for you. And now safety is a position that you, know, you can find guys fourth, fifth round. But like sure. plays like that, and this is getting the, over this the top is the fourth of, round, getting over the top of a vertical a from round. a single high is not not something a lot of the safeties that have come off the board, quite frankly, can do. You know, and so he offers a different skill set that him and Nick Cross, if those are your two starting safeties, yeah. that's an athletic duo on the back end. That, that is a Nick rangy, from rangy duo. So, I'm not, if I'm the Colts, I'm a Colts fan right now, I am, this is one of my favorite drafts, truthfully. That, that is a top three draft that I've seen so far okay. of anyone in the NFL. So the Packers are drafting. It's at Jacksonville to Atlanta to Detroit to Green Bay. This was the four traded pick. P- please just don't trash on Clifford again. Dontavian Wicks. Oh, wide receiver. Look at that. Dontavian. It, it, dude, Get out of Virginia. Super productive, right? Yeah, very okay. productive. He's kind of, I'm not going to call him a foil and gadget guy. Definitely looks like he's better out of the slot, but he's super, super shifty, finds a way to get into the end zone, finds a way to get open, which is important. Mm-hmm. And a bigger body. They obviously love bigger body wide receivers. He's six foot one, 205 right. pounds. He had over 1,200 yards back in 2021 when Virginia was throwing the ball all over the yard. A yep. little bit of a step back this year, 430 yards, and my worry about him, and I can't believe the Packers keep picking these guys. Drops, dude. Nine yeah. drops this past mm-hmm. year. Um, 39 catch ball. Over like a 12% drop rate in his career. The Packers obviously think they can coach hands. Yeah. Because they drafted two high drop rate guys last year in Christian Watson and Romeo Dobbs. Yep. But as a fan, I can tell you it's very frustrating to watch guys drop footballs. Yes, and so <laughs> that is who Don David Wicks is. I, but he's a guy who's probably like a, you know, a number three. I think he's an NFL wide receiver. He's just a little bit limited. Does a 46240 bother you? Yeah, I mean, it does. That's why he's, like, limited in the role he's going to play. He's not a downfield threat. You have the downfield threats, though, in Dobbs and Watson, so you don't necessarily need another one, even if 
I would enjoy another one. But there's at this point in the draft, the wide receiver class is quite frankly cooked. You got A.T. Perry is really the only other one that I'd go to bat for ever being a starter in the league right now at, in this wide receiver Perry. class. I like him. The Wake Forest wide receiver. That's I, I would not bank on any other wide receiver in this class ending up being a starter. Boom! There we go. We're at the Jags with the pick in. At, at the, with this, this is pick. One, this is pick twenty-five of the fourth of the fifth round. We pick have forty-two 25. picks, so seventeen more after this. There we go. We're at one hundred and sixty. We're going all the way to one seventy-seven. Jaguars draft, I will say, has been one of the weirdest drafts. We, we've discussed a lot of people as being like, "Here's the theme. Here's what they're trying to do. Here's how these guys fit into their draft." This one's been Anton Harrison's your backup swing tackle. Brenton Strange is a backup tight end. Tank Bigsby's a backup oh, yeah. running back. There we go. Somebody comes off the big board. Ventrell Miller's a backup linebacker. Antonio Johnson. So I cannot believe they got him here. Yeah. Because this was the position, right, that everyone kept mocking him first round. Everyone's like, they need a slot, they need a slot, they need a slot. Brian Branch, put him in there. Well, Antonio Johnson was, for a lot of people's money, the second best slot in this class. Mm hmm 60th player on the consensus board. Now, I had him a little bit lower than that, but still I had him as a damn good football player, 64th. Got I him. think his ability around the line of scrimmage is almost like a poor man's Kyle Hamilton in what right. Kyle Hamilton did from the slot last year with the Baltimore Ravens. I think that's just what you do. That's where you play at Texas A&M. Let him play around the line of scrimmage. He runs yeah. a 4 5 two. He can kind of honestly plays quicker than that in short areas, and he's physical, will blow up screens. This is a tremendous pick. Yeah. This is Jaguars after kind of a lot of Huh, what's the, what's the thought process there at sort of picks? This is a pick that the thought process is obvious, the fit's obvious, and the value is as obvious as well. I love it. They go offense, offense, offense with Anton Harrison, Britton Strange, and Tank Bisbee. Then they go defense, 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 defense with Ventrell Miller, Tyler Lacey, uh, Yasser Abdullah, and then, of course, Antonio Johnson just now. Got some really good safety, really good at getting downhill, really good at getting two. Like, I, I would love to have him as part of my blitz pack. Yes. Like, he's, he's that good. He can do that. Nick Hampton from Appalachian State hey. is off the board now to the Rams. Listen, I love me some Appalachian State, guys. Nick Hampton, this is someone who, the way he played was, he just consistently was disruptive. And I think that's the key here. Obviously, you look at the measurables, and somebody people are going to wonder, is he this? Is he that? He's six foot two, 236. What does he play? Does he play the edge? Is he a linebacker? How do you use him? I think the key here is finding someone that you can use in all pass in past situations, and then you have to figure out is he going to be an actual linebacker or is he going to be just a situational edge rusher? So, so him and Byron Young are not too dissimilar to me as prospects. They drafted Byron Young, obviously, in the third round, the Tennessee edge rusher, and that both are just pure explosiveness, pure effort. Do we know what we're doing? Nah. Do, do we have a lot of pass rushing moves? Are we, you know, going to play the run at a high level because I'm 236 pounds here, <laughs> Nick Hampton? No, you're just not. That's not what you're getting. But the Rams have consistently not necessarily cared about that in their edge guys. They want edge guys that bring juice off the edge. Right. That if they're one-on-one -on -one because everyone's got to worry and kind of pinch in down, your guards do on Aaron Donald, well, if you give them space, these guys can get to the quarterback. That's how I feel about Hampton. He's probably more of a DPR, your situational pass rusher. Uh, third down guy, but the effort, dude. I, I mean, he comes into contact like he's the bigger dude every time, but he's 236 pounds. You yeah. don't see a lot of 236 pounders whose key move is bull rush. Nick Hampton is. Yes, uh, so is. I'm a fan of his tape. I do just worry about how those traits are going to translate to the NFL and if he is any, ever going to be anything more than a DPR. But man, in this situation, I'm cool with it. I, I, I like what they did here at this point in the draft. Yeah, same. I'm Listen, App State, Great football tradition, great football heritage. They put guys into the NFL. They do what they like. They they know what they're up to. They know what they're up against, and they they go out there and they they, they put together pretty consistently. So this is good. I know he he was never gonna coming out of app. He was never gonna have the size that, that someone from Alabama or Georgia had. So they found a way to use him really really well. And so we'll see if he's able to translate those skills to the next. I, level. I do wonder because he has a big frame. I do wonder if he can put on some more mass. Right. Is six eight wingspan for being only six two? Like the the length is Ooh. there. Just can we in an NFL weight room get him up to speed? That's if that if you can tell me he can get up to two fifty with musculature. I feel shit, better about kid, it. Kid, he's a higher pick than this. How about this? We're going to South Beach, folks. It's Will Mallory. Will Mallory, 
a tight end from Miami. This is a guy played a lot of football for them. He feels a little undersized a bit at tight end, but he's not going to play wide receiver. So you look at this guy, six foot four and a half, 239. Doesn't look like he's 239, though, because he's a little bit more stretched out. But when you look at Will Mallory play, what you are going to get is a guy who understands the game. He really understands where he's going to be open. He also knows which matchups he can win. And that's the part where he takes chances against linebackers, takes chances against some safeties, and then in other situations, he sits it down. So me, I like this Will Mallory pick, especially in this spot, because they're getting a guy in the Colts that's going to go out there, try to help Anthony Richardson. Yeah, he ran the fastest 40 at the combine of any tight end in attendance. He can really threaten the seams of your defense, and that's kind of his bread and butter is corners, posts, Seam routes, he wins on those fairly consistently and will run away from linebackers. The problem is, it's not really bigger than a lot of linebackers. Here. 239, the dude is skinny. And especially his if legs. If you're putting him as an inline blocker, he will get exposed. I, I just find it hard to believe he's going to be able to put on the requisite mass to ever block in line. And he really didn't have kind of the mentality that you would want to develop there. But the Colts are loading up on athletes. Th yeah. That's been their MO, but this is a guy who is a little something different than Jelani Woods and Mo Ali Cox that you already have in tow there at the tight end position. All right, folks, we've got another pick coming in right here. This is another, this is a guy I love. It's Chase Brown. Chase Brown oh. out of Illinois. Speedy guy. He finds a way to, he runs tough. He runs fast. He runs tough. I don't know if he looks much faster because his legs are so short, but he runs, he runs hard. And coming out of Illinois, we talked about it on the defensive side, talked about the mentality change with the coaching change. Chase Brown is kind of indicative of that as well. So twin brothers of Sidney Brown. And they are identical. And like build, they are both shorter, squatty, but jacked to the gills. Yep. Both ran mid four fours. And the explosiveness you see on tape, I mean, he would not go this late if it weren't for the fumbling problems. Five fumbles this past year on 329 carries. Had a couple more at the senior bowl. That's a big no-no. You know, coaches have very little patience for guys putting it on the ground nowadays. That's the problem, but like this guy has bell cow potential. Mm -hmm. He does not need to come off the field on pass downs, does mm -hmm. not need to come off the field uh, on third downs. And for the Cincinnati Bengals, who kind of use their running backs as just like spells, so it's just like they don't have roles there, obviously mm -hmm. behind Joe Mixon, who has legal issues that he's fighting this offseason. This is a guy that could just be a starter for you at this point in the draft. If you tell me he's fixing that fumbling problem, uh, I'm showing you a starter in the NFL right now. So that's a that's a great pick yeah. for the Cincinnati Bengals. I think both those offensive dudes they drafted there, him and Charlie Jones, those are guys that make an impact on the roster this season. Yeah, I, I like it. I mean, it was Charlie Jones, you mentioned him. They just got Chase Brown. DJ Turner, I thought, was one of a heck of a pickup for them. Jaron Hall to the Vikings. Oh, there he goes. There's they get the QB of the future. Let's get Kirk back on the line. Hear his thoughts on if Jaron Hall is really the quarterback, the heir apparent. No, I, I truthfully, I was not high in Jaron. I'll just say it. I, I get why there, there's a lot to like. He's a twitchy athlete. He can get out of tight situations. Yep. He has a nice, easy, quick release. Uh, I thought the improvement he showed this past year was very evident from the year prior. But a lot of the same concerns you have that Zach Wilson had, where it's like he's playing in a BYU offense that's so play action heavy that with such a good offensive line for his competition level that look at these pockets he's operating from. It's seven on seven. Yeah. He is playing glorified seven on seven. He didn't have to learn good habits. He got a lot of bad habits when it came to how to handle pressure that I worry about at the NFL level. And he's six foot two of seven. You know, does not have the height of a you know a developmental project that you usually take at this point in the draft. So. I wasn't as high, but he is. Oh, the last note on him is 25 years old too. Like he is an older guy. He actually yeah. did, you know, the more emission stuff, all that. So um, interesting player, but I would have gone elsewhere. Personally, yeah. I think he's. I think he is good. I think the thing I like about him is his accuracy to the corners. The thing I would like to see more of is accuracy to the interior. That's the part for me, and, and it reminds me. It reminds me a little bit of Sam Howell, um, a guy who was very good throwing to the edges but not so much right over the interior. And obviously every that's, highlight. That's like a six foot guy. You know, that, that's like the knock on six foot guys though, is do yeah. improve there and you usually know. Yeah, exactly. No, that, that's why I brought him up because yeah. it was the same, because Sam Howell's the same size. Yeah. He's the same house thicker than him, mm -hmm. but they're the same height. Yeah. So yeah, I just don't know if that's a thing that's gonna happen for him. And that's the thing you have to be able to do if you're gonna make it take that next step.
But he's a heck of a competitor. That's but sure. an athlete, I think he comes from a family full of athletes, and, and yeah. you see there on tape, like, if you want to run him in the run game, more than capable of doing so. So that's Jaron Hall. Interesting, like a lot of QBs yeah. coming off the board. And, and no I think, Tanner McKee, huh? And I think there's going to be a few more that come off the board as well before the draft's over. I, I think, obviously, I, I think Tanner McKee is going to probably get drafted before this day is over. I think Malik Cunningham could get drafted oh, nice. before it's all said and done. I'm trying to think, is there any more guys in this quarterback class? That may be it. That may be it in terms of guys that had draftable grades on. But we shall see. Ooh. Big in. Terrell Smith. Hey, there we go. He has some fans. I'm surprised he lasted this long because this isn't a – this is a guy who ticks boxes physically, who has sort of you know, six foot, over 200 pounds, and was really productive on tape this past year. Um, I, I just think he wasn't quite as sticky – as I would like from an NFL corner, I, I think his sort of hips and the you know lateral agility that I want from an outside corner wasn't there. But dude's physical. He really bodies guys. He knows how to use that size to his advantage, and he'll push guys to the sideline consistently when they try to go past him. And he's got four four one speed. There's no oh you know some of the concerns we're saying about other guys on tape of oh he can he hack it at the NFL level with. Um, with the size jump up, with the speed jump up. No, th those are not issues with him on tape. It's just that he really didn't put out good tape at Minnesota until this past season. He had, a, I believe, has been playing there for three years since his freshman year at Minnesota, but really never, the light switch never turned on until this past season. So I'm going to say this, and the Bears, they get two corners that are over six feet tall. I think that says a lot about the plan that they have and what they're going to try to do. Maybe... Maybe Terrell Smith works out for him, maybe he does it, but it's very clear that if they're going to take a corner, they need him to be tall. Yeah, uh, I'm interested because Matt Eberflus, he kind of had blank slate, right? Carte blanche. He had nothing on defense. You have like Jalen Johnson right. heading it this year, Eddie Jackson, and then build the defense how you want to. And it's interesting to me that with over $100 million in free agency, they prioritize linebacker. Yeah. That's where he went. He said, give me Tremaine Edmonds, give me TJ Edwards, that's where I want to start my defense. Usually, it's either D-line or corner is what you would think. Yeah. But he goes linebacker, and now they're kind of having to fill in. And we're seeing, he said, DTs was his next. They addressed that. Rounds two, rounds three, or were they both round two? Whatever, they addressed two DTs. And now they're turning their eyes to the cornerback position, trying to grab guys there. So, yeah, this is going to be interesting to see what happens. we still got guys on the big board. we got Tanner McKee. we got nice. Luke Whipler. we got Travis. Hodges Tomlinson, we've got Andre Carter, Corey Trice. A.T. Perry is still there if somebody's looking for a wide receiver. Ooh, I would love Corey Trice to the Chiefs Yeah, right now. Corey Trice to the Chiefs is a possibility. So this is an interesting one. How many more we got in this third round? We are at pick 166, Kansas State Chiefs, 177 is the last pick of the fifth round, Los Angeles Rams. We've got the Rams on the clock three more times in this round. Yes. They're just loading up at this point in the draft. That's their bread and butter. Because they don't draft highly, but they still draft a lot, is their MO. Um, but yeah, we, we are getting to the point, and we kind of reached that point, right? Let's be honest, where th these are not, we're just gonna, I got sugarcoated. These are not guys who are starting. These are guys who, if you get anything from them, you were happy as heck to have gotten it. But these are guys that are truly, you're, you're truly seeing your scouting department shine at this point in the draft, though, if you get anything from these guys. So we've got the pick in for the Chiefs. Let's see what they get. Should we reset some of our favorite drafts so far? B.J. Thompson. Okay, another guy. He's a similar mold to Nick Hampton. This is a Stephen F. Austin edge rusher who is yep. very undersized. I think he was listed at 220 by Stephen F. Austin. Comes to the Shrine Bowl in the 230s, but still like way too yeah. undersized to really make an impact at the NFL level. But he is an absolute high-end athlete. I think he uh, broad jumped to 11 feet, vertical jumped over 40. Like that kind of explosiveness is what you're dealing with. But I mean, he is angular and skinny as can be. This is a pure 
if we can get him, you know, in our weight room, in our developmental program, what could he look like in three years? Because productive on tape, but low-level competition with a weird body type when it comes to playing in the NFL. Yeah, I um, here's the thing. Let's do this. We before we do before we hit the comp the compensatory picks. Let's reset this second round or this fifth this second <laughs> the fifth round. Sorry, my brain is fried. Um, let's reset this fifth round before we get into the comp the compensatory picks. Um, let's see. We started out with we started out with the Jags taking Yasser Abdullah. Then we went with the Commanders and KJ Henry. We got the Colts and Darius Rush. Um, we got Cardinals Clayton Toon, the quarterback out of Houston. We have the Browns with DTR, quarterback out of UCLA. Next up, we have the Vikings with Ja'Kalen Roy, defensive tackle from LSU. Guy's going to be a sure run stopper for them. We get the Browns and Cameron Mitchell, a cornerback out of Northwestern, a very smart player, very heads-up player. And we get the Jets taking Israel Abikanda. That's Pittsburgh, a Pittsburgh running back. There we go. Antonio a- Maffi, UCLA guard. We've got, Jam- we got Jamie Robinson, Safety from Florida State, Jordan Howden, safety from Minnesota, Josh Weil, tight end from Cincinnati, Noah Sewell, linebacker from Oregon. We will see if he sticks at linebacker, moves to edge. We got Sean Clifford, quarterback for, to the Packers from Penn State. Bills take Justin Shorter, wide receiver from Penn State in Florida. Seahawks, Mike Morris, uh, defensive end out of Michigan. We've got Lions, Colby Sort of an offensive tackle from William Mary. Slovakia Dennis, linebacker from Pittsburgh to the Buccaneers. Seahawks, Olu Olawatimi, Michigan center. 49ers, Daryl Luter, cornerback, South Alabama. Chargers, Jordan McFadden, Clemson uh, guard, Ravens, Kai Blue Kelly, cornerback from Stanford. Daniel Scott, safety from California to the Colts. Packers, Dontavian Wicks, wide receiver from Virginia. Texas A&M safety, Antonio Johnson, he goes to the Jags. Rams grab Nick Hampton. An edge rusher from App State. The Colts pick up Will Mallory, a tight end from Miami. Bengals go Chase Brown, a running back from Illinois. Vikings go Jaron Hall, quarterback from BYU. Bears go Terrell Smith, cornerback from Minnesota. And Chiefs go B.J. Thompson, edge rusher from Stephen F. Austin. We are now on to the compensatory picks. The pick is in. We've already seen a trade. Rams have traded their pick to the Houston Texans. The pick is in. They want more picks. Who do we have? What are the Rams going to do? Own the seventh round here? Amazing. The Rams turn. Yep, they traded it up. So here we go. So some of my favorites so far of this round. Yep. I like KJ Henry to the Commanders. Okay. I, I think he plays a role there. Uh, I really like Cameron Mitchell to the Cleveland Browns. I, I think that was one of the steals of this round so far. Jamie Robinson to the Panthers. Uh, I, I, I don't know if he starts, but he's a guy who I like as a starter in time. I got it. I like Daniel Scott to the Indianapolis Colts. And I love Chase Brown to the Cincinnati Bengals, as well as Trail Smith to the Chicago Bears. This is all my favorites of this. Henry To'o To'o, linebacker, Alabama. Yep. The Texans pick up Henry To'o To'o. He's a linebacker from Alabama. This is a guy that started out at Tennessee, was a highly touted kid, played at Tennessee, transferred to Alabama, became their, instantly became their starting uh, kind of Mike linebacker. He seems a little undersized. Uh, plays at 6'1", 227, but he certainly has a feel and a knack for the game. He knows where he's supposed to be. He's someone that can make himself skinny. He is skinny when it comes to being a part of the blitz packages, but he's almost always in the right place at the right time, and he finds ways to make an impact on the game. What do you think about him? Yeah, so I had him actually, truthfully. So a lot of people had him in the top 100. This was a guy that had a lot of fans. Mm-hmm. I had him right in this range. I, okay. I was not as sold. I had him 177 on my draft board because – Physical dude, like he wants to get after. He like, does. He, the play stylistically is something you love, and obviously pairing him with Demeco Ryan's, like I, I can see the vision yeah. there with him, and I'm excited to see what he can do and develop into. But I do just think he's lacking as a pure athlete to really be a playmaker at the next level, and I worry about him in coverage most specifically. I, I really saw him get lost in times um, because of that aggressiveness. You, because right. his eyes are so locked in on the backfield, he wants to come downhill. He can be sucked out of position uh, a little too easily for my money. And there you go. Like he he tracks down Hendon Hooker there though. If his defense, if his other defender wasn't there, Hooker's running by. He's running away. That's the that's the issue I see with him on tape is that. When you're undersized, you better have some juice behind you. You better yeah. have some sideline, sideline speed. And I just never quite saw that from Toe Toe. Right. That, but he played in a system where everything was set up to be funneled to him, mm-hmm. which is that's what you're supposed to do. That's the whole point of playing linebacker and having defensive ends and having 
outside contain. Linebacker makes the play going away. Here we go. We got another pick. Ooh, Papo. Okay. Oh. The Auburn Let's linebacker. Let's go. I love this pick. Owen Papo. You want to talk about sideline to sideline speed? <laughs> this kid is fast. Dude. He can absolutely fly. I love his game. He reminds me a lot of a more aggressive, more violent Alec Ogletree in terms of the way that he plays the game. Ogletree always came off as more of a passive linebacker, tackle guys from the side. Papa wants to tackle you going downhill. Look at him in coverage. He's going to be aggressive, a little handsy, but he's going to be there. He is super talented. This kid has been a star since he was in eighth grade. No lie. First time I ever saw him, eighth grade in Atlanta. He ran a 4-4-40 at the Nike camp, and he just kept being the best player. Mm -hmm. He was the, He's the only person to be invited three times to the opening. That's insane. That doesn't happen. Wow. Usually, like like a guy like Marco Parsons, yeah. he went one time. Owen Papo's been three times. This guy can play. Didn't have a great – I thought he was good at Auburn. I think he got a little over-aggressive at times. I think he got over his skis sometimes. He's got to harness that speed, which is tough to do for a young guy. But I love him. I love Owen Papo. This guy is an elite, elite athlete. Yes. Hey, we, uh, what we said about, like, Trenton Simpson yesterday, I think Simpson's, like, built better for linebacker. This guy on tape plays oh, more and Papo, athletic. yeah. I mean, four three nine speed, 29 bench press reps. You see it. Yeah. You see that ability. And I thought he improved mightily as a tackler this past season. Yes. A lot of that, like, over-aggressiveness that we saw early in his career would, came as a tackler, and he would just overrun and be yep. complete opposition. You saw him play a little bit more under control. It still is an issue. But I love that you at least saw improvement. I, I do still think that when you watch his tape, you see every decision going on in his head. Yes. Like everything, Not you see him process, and then it's like, this happened, I go here. This happened, I go there. It's very by the book. Process. That kind of limits that athletic tools. Like you don't see it enough, but it's there, and I love the improvement. And if you're the Arizona Cardinals, and you desperately need help anywhere along this roster, I love their vision for how they've approached this draft. It's guys that... This year aren't going to make an impact. Owen Papa's not going to make an impact for you this year. He's not starting for your roster. Guys like John Gaines aren't starting for you. Guys like Garrett Williams, the cornerback coming mm -hmm. off an ACL, aren't starting for you. But what they can be, if you get them in the fold and if you develop these guys, are all good, good players for your football team. So I think the Arizona Cardinals have had a very good draft, in my opinion. Even if they're, you know, the Paris Johnson pick might have been a little early for me. The fact that they traded, got some draft capital, got a future first rounder, and still got a Paris Johnson. Very hard to argue with how this draft has been approached post Steve Kime era. Oh, wow. Asim Richards from UNC, um, offensive tackle. This is a guy that when you look at him play, hey, you, they, he helped protect Drake May, and that was his, that's your main job, right? And he's a tackle guard convert, in my opinion. Yes. You know, he's six foot four, 309, 34 inch arms. But, but to me, he just struck me foot speed wise as a guard. You know, nothing physically about him from a build perspective screams that he has to kick inside, but just, I did not love him mirroring speed. Uh, thought he had some balance issues when he was asked to do so, but a lot of times, you know, playing out in space is just, it is so different. And I think he's a guy that, on the interior, a lot of the things that plagued him, a lot of the reasons why maybe he, you know, he allowed 20 pressures this past season, Ooh. I think those get alleviated. I think he's going to be much better, and he's a three-year starter, experienced dude, and he now goes to a spot in Dallas that, the track record of development there is strong. He has a lot of good guys to learn from in that fold. So fifth round, that's kind of where I had him on my board. So solid pick. Boom, there we go. I, I Man, that Fajoko pick I love. Uh, yeah. I, I love what they did to their D-line here in this yeah, draft. They, I they think they got impact with not a lot of draft capital. They got guys that can actually play for your roster this season. Fan, fan of their. Okay. Well, the Jets looks like they've traded the pick. No one wants picks. To the Raiders. No one wants to draft any of these guys, apparently. Have, have we, I, we haven't really been keeping up on trades. Has there been a lot of movement for future picks? I'd be curious, because everyone's saying this draft was not great. And I think the consensus was this wasn't a talented or super deep draft. That's how you see kickers going in the third round. I'd be curious to see how many people actually gave up you know, a future third, a future fourth, because... Obviously, you'd like that in a weak draft class, someone to give it to you, but it's easier said than done to get so. Yep. There we go. The Jets send 170 to Raiders for 204 and 220. So they're just trading backwards in this same draft. Yeah, okay. So no future picks. So they're going to get two guys that... 
Dude, yeah. I love it. <laughs> the Rams on the clock three more times. Is, is there uh, hilarious? But the Raiders draft, we've talked about a little here. I just, I don't see. It's just discom- it's, it's how this is putting them over the hump, right? It is it's if you're the Las Vegas Raiders, you have to look yourself in the mirror and say. I'm in a division with Patrick Mahomes and Justin Herbert for the foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. How do I beat those guys? What what takes me there? To me, a Byron Young doesn't take me. You know, stopping the run a little doesn't take me there. I I I would have liked a little more swings than what they took. Like Trey Tucker is a return man. Byron Young's a two-gap defensive tackle. Mayor, I'm not going to complain about that. It's a great solid tight end. But like the whole point for them is you either have to get really good corners and safeties or really good edge rushers. That's how you beat those two players. Mm-hmm. That's how you beat them. Yeah. But like even like an Aiden O'Connell. And I get we're at a point where it's like you're not getting much, but backup quarterback's not the difference between you and a championship, right? Yeah. Now. That's not where you're, <laughs> you're you're not losing because of that. You're not close, unfortunately. So I don't know. I'm just I'm spitballing. And we're at a point in the draft though where also, teams pigeonhole themselves into picks. Early on, they're like, play the board, play the board. Now they're like, hey, I need this. You know, we don't have I a have corner. Get, we I don't have, have a corner this. that with special teams versatility now. We have to go draft the top one on our board, that sort of thing. Oh, here, Christopher Smith, Georgia okay. safety. Yeah. He was a guy who, on tape, I liked more than his testing. I, I thought he was a guy that could play from a too high or single high alignment. He's 5'10", 192. Like, he had some range, I thought, and he makes plays like that in the Oregon game and other plays on his tape where it's like he got there in a hurry, and I think he sees the game really well, but he goes to the combine runs a 4'6", 2 with a 33-inch vertical. At his pro day, he had a 7'4", 5'3", cone and a 4'4", 1 shuttle. Just a low-tier athlete. That's why he drops this point in the draft because I had him as a borderline top 100 player before that. But I'm not sure you just want to go to bat for a guy who's that limited athletic. And there he is wrapping up Jalen Hyatt's face. So maybe maybe you could throw that testing out the window. But like plays like that, where he just triggers, goes, hits it. I was a fan of the way he played. But again, undersized, poor athlete. That, that's how a guy falls to this point in the draft who maybe has a little bit better tape, like a Christopher Smith. Here's what I'm going to say. You said, you said it perfectly. You love the way he sees the game. Mm-hmm. He sees the game very well. So what does that allow him to do? Anticipate. It allows him to anticipate things. He studies film very clearly. He studies film. He knows what's going to happen before it happens. To him. So you can't do anything to him that he's not going to expect. The only time that did happen, SEC Championship game, Jamison Williams, mm, him. coming out a bunch. Alabama, he's like, I know what Alabama does on this play. And then Alabama had him break it across the field. He couldn't recover Good. because he didn't have the speed. Yep. Touchdown. Game change. Mm-hmm. All right, what do we got? And so for a guy who projects as a deep safety to not have that deep range is scary. Mm-hmm. Another trade. Okay, another trade. <laughs> this is insane. All right, so. Oh, come on, man. Guys, we're so close. Why? Just do, do just pick. <laughs> uh, so of, let's see, this pick just got traded. One, two, three. The last eight picks, all but two were traded. <laughs> Traded away multiple times. I, I honestly have never seen anything like this. Over oh, the majority of picks have been traded in this round. That's that's I think it's very indicative of how the NFL sees yeah. this class. But also in stream. Man, I, I, I do so Andre Carter, we may not get to talk about him because he may not go here, but I want to talk about him. The Army Edge Rusher. Yeah. Let's see. He Let's will see. get drafted. You know, his tape was good enough to get drafted. Yeah. But he is in one of the weirdest prospects and the weirdest prospect profiles because he's coming from Army, right? Yes. He's coming from a school where you are not training to play football year round. You are training to be, be in the Army, you know, which is vastly different type of training. And so when he goes to the, his pro day at 6'6, 256 with 34 inch arms and runs a 4'9, 140 with only a 30 inch vertical and 9 1 broad jump and 11 bench press reps, which I don't know why he even stood under that bench knowing he was gonna do, like, you don't just accidentally do 11 when right. I was like, oh, I'm doing 20 all week. No, he knew he was gonna do 11. That's, that tells me he just has not had 
the development physically that these other guys have. Right. And that, but then like you flip him on the tape and that's the only thing missing from his game. The guy uses his hands really well. He's creative. He has incredible bend for a six foot six dude. He had a six nine seven three cone even without the high end athletic training that we're talking about and a four two nine short shuttle, which are elite numbers of the position. So he has the way to play the game. He has the sort of traits that are difficult to improve upon in a weight room that is agility. All he needs is the play strength and explosiveness. How much can he add? Can he add 15 pounds of muscle to his frame? If you tell me he can, this guy will be a starter in the NFL and a high-end starter in the NFL. So a weird prospect profile. He had 15 and a half sacks two years ago before everyone found out who he was yep. and started doubling him. I don't know. This is where I'm taking a chance on this guy, though. I'm taking a chance on him before some of these other guys that have come off the board for sure, like a B.J. Thompson, who they have that explosiveness, but they don't know what the heck they're doing. Yeah. I think the guy who knows what the heck he's doing and has a reason why I can coach some explosiveness into him, that's who I'm going to take. So that's why I'm high on him. That's why he's high on the board, but also why he's available at this point in the draft. Sure. Payne Durham is the pick for the Bucks. They get a tight end. Um, that was productive at Purdue. 58 catches last year. Uh, 56, excuse me, 560 yards, 10 yards per catch. That's pretty easy math. Even I can do it. Um, eight, eight, eight touchdowns. So he was their second go-to guy behind Charlie, uh, Charlie Jones. Good, pl good ball player. I don't need him to be doing very much blocking, if we're being quite honest. Mm. But he is a guy that's going to catch passes. Catch passes. He seems. I would. Would you rather have him or Will Mallory? That's a good question. So he's more reliable. Mallory's far, they're like opposite ends of the spectrum, right? Like this guy you can count on to haul it in wherever it's thrown to him, he's gonna catch it underneath, intermediate, whatever. But he's not gonna run away from anybody. I think he went 487 at the combine. That's, you know, capped off. Whereas Mallory's 454. You yeah. can maybe work with that. So, depends on what you want. I'd probably go Payne Durham though. I, I just don't see it with Mallory. I, I think he's too much of a liability as a blocker to even see the field. Whereas Payne Durham can see the field for me. So we got Eric Gray. Eric Gray goes to the Giants at pick 37, uh, 172 overall. Eric Gray is a guy that I like. I like the one who's at Tennessee. Obviously, Tennessee had that sort of a mini mass exodus with Wanya, with um, obviously with Eric Gray leaving out as well. So what you end up with is a guy, Eric Gray, who is a very good running back. Came in highly touted to Tennessee. I think he's shifty. I think he has the ability to make plays in the run game and in the pass game. And he did pretty well at Oklahoma. I love his vision and his patience. Those are two things that you cannot teach people. Vision and patience. There's too many guys that run up their, their offensive linemen's backs. But you look at him right here. Okay, look at that. I'm, sh I'm quick. I'm shifty. I can go make plays. And I'm explosive. And I could, the way he stops right there, good grief. I, I, my ACL would be all the way in, it would be in Texas by then. <laughs> Dude, I'm surprised this guy lasts this long. He's a good pass catcher. Yes, he I, is. I think he's a good pass blocker. Yeah, this is your third down back. You know, you obviously have Saquon Barkley, who, you know, maybe he's going to hold out, maybe he's not going to, whatever. But uh, you don't want to subject Saquon Barkley to the hits and pass pro that this guy can go take. You know, he can be your third down guy when you want to give Saquon a spell and be super reliable. He's got great hands. Yep. Uh, he's shifty, like you mentioned, and maybe he's not super explosive the way Saquon is, but he can get half right in tight spaces. Uh, you know, he can be the number two there uh, and a pretty, a number two that you feel good about. So at this point in the draft, like I said, I was surprised he lasts this long. Uh, really like what the Giants have done. That, that's, a, that's a pick for pick, good, good, good draft. No one I'm questioning. None of those picks, none of those fits, none of those values. That's Perfect. that's how you want your draft to look like when you don't have the draft capital that some others in class do. This is good. Okay, we got the, the 49ers have got their pick in. I'll tell you what. Not giving, it, not giving Daniel Jones any excuses there. Yeah. Prove it. We gave you the money. Show the F up. God, the Rams. Now we're three of the last four. Three of the last four. They, there's Tremendous. nowhere for them to go. They can't trade anymore. <laughs> well, eh, there's two more rounds. Don't, uh, don't speak too soon here, but no. they're going to end up trading into a spot they traded out of at some point. You know it's going to happen. They're, oh, they're just moving so much. All right, 49ers. Dude, this 49ers draft. Can we just like discuss it a little bit again? I think yeah, we let's go over it. Here we go, 49ers. But it was, I mean, when you don't pick until 99 initially, it's going to be weird. Yeah, it, but the 49ers have pit, they put together Jair Brown, safety from Penn State, Jake Moody, the kicker. That was wild. I don't understand that still. Cameron Lay to the tight end from Alabama, Daryl Luter from South Alabama, and they're wait, the pick is in. We're waiting on their pick. But they're they're in a position where. 
I wonder what they do with this Lance and Purdy. Right. Because Lance has to play football. You draft him where they drafted him. Right. And Anthony Richardson is going to be the same conversation this year. He's got to see the field. For the 49ers or for someone else? For anyone. Like, to, to get better. Because he has, over the course of his high school, collegiate, and NFL career, had fewer dropbacks than Tom Brady did this past season. That's, That's insane. Yeah. The, the guy needs to play football. And you well, we talked about that with DTR, right? Yeah. You have to get reps. That you, You're not, you can't get better. you than. saw how much DTR improved. Yeah, over you the can't. Of his Mental reps, are, they only take you so far. And, and so when you draft him third, knowing that, knowing he had one season of college football under his belt, like you had to give him leeway. And yeah. I get that you were in a championship window and it was like, oh, we're so close right now. You go to the, you know, you go to the NFC Championship game the next year, Maybe it changes the math a little bit, but why take the biggest project in that draft if you did think you were that close? Right. I, I don't. It's, there was a disconnect somewhere, and at some point, in my opinion, you just got to bite the bullet and turn the keys over to this guy. Whether it's for a full season or if it's like an eight-game trial, he has to get that at some point. And obviously, no one expected him to get injured this past season. But I don't think you know, Brock was great. Don't get me wrong, Brock looked awesome last yeah. year, but you have to turn it over to Trey Lance at some point this season. Know what you got, give him that time, and then if shit, if it doesn't work out and you're still in the hunt, NFC's weak enough, Brock can maybe save you at the end, but man, they gotta give him that chance. All right, here we go. The pick is in. It is Robert Beal Jr. Defensive end, linebacker from Georgia. Robert Beal from Georgia, there it is. Big time player. When his number got called, he was able to make plays. I really, I've liked him since high school. This is someone, when you watch him play, you can see some aggression. You can see some energy. He was kind of buried behind a bunch yeah. of other guys. But he is someone, for me, um, if we're talking kind of player, he reminds me a little bit of Kevin Green, right? The old Steelers oh, and, wow. and Panthers. A guy that, if he beefs it up a little bit, he's going to be a true, like, elephant in that 3-4 in that scheme. He's very violent with his hands. He wants to win. He wants to walk you back. He can use speed off the edge. This guy is a creeper that just makes plays. Like, I think that really, the re look at that. Come on. And I just think that he's got an opportunity. He just didn't get as many of those opportunities at Georgia because they had Jordan Davis and they had Jalen yep. Carter, they had Shannon Tindall, and they had Quan, Quan, they had. Oh, what was his face? Who was the guy? Quay Walker, and they had Nolan Smith, and they like they had all well, these who guys. The, who was the one who was the best one? Who Trayvon up, Walker? No, no, the the one who ended up having legal issues, and then uh, oh, um, that guy was nuts, and then yeah, I can't remember. Yeah, but but they had Beal was so, stuck behind him too. And but, so he's got great potential, big time potential. I love him coming off the edge. I love what he's able to do. When his number did get called this year, which it did, because Nolan Smith went down, he rose to the occasion. Yeah, and four four eight forty. You have maybe the best D-line coach in the NFL, Chris Korserich, there in tow. They obviously, this is the guy with developmental potential. When you have nearly 35-inch arms with 448 speed, yep. that's something you want to work with. And Georgia, for as much as, you know, they've produced talent, I'm not sure they've developed talent sure. along that defensive line. Like, we're talking about Trayvon Walker as a project. We're talking about uh, Nolan Smith having to develop more pass rushing moves. Because they emphasize scheme so much there. They yes. are play as a unit, play as a unit, play as a unit. And so guys don't necessarily get the skill development that, say, mm -hmm. maybe like an Ohio State is known for. So uh, I do think there is some meat on the bone here for this pick. But obviously, like, it's just purely a, a coin toss at a guy who's a high, high-end athlete. Yes. Yes, he is. Has always been. Looking forward. To, I'm glad he got his shot. Like, I'm not mm -hmm. glad Noah Smith got hurt, but I'm glad he got his opportunity because he waited in the wings a long time as a guy that was fully capable. Kind of reminds me of being in a similar position to Byron Young at Alabama, who did play. He played all the time but mm -hmm. and started a bunch but of games. Until but his last year. His last year is when he came alive when they really needed him to. Oh, here we go. Warren McClendon, back-to-back -back dogs coming off the board. Oh, work. right. Opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of prospects. We have the high-end athlete yes. project, and we have the well-oiled machine Bingo. at tackle who just – doesn't quite have the physical gifts of his tackle mate, Broderick Jones. Like, he was more effective in pass protection this past season than Broderick Jones. Yes. But he is stiff. He is not super explosive uh, as an athlete, not super nimble, but he uses his length really well, 34 and a half inch arms. This is a perfect swing tackle that you probably won't complain about if 
you have to say, you know, say Joseph Note Boom goes down yet again. This guy can plug in there and won't look out of place. So this is a, this is a guy who may never start in the league, but he's a guy who can stay on a roster for a while. Yeah, he's good. He knows what he's doing, and I think that's the, the key here. Is he, he knows what he's doing. He doesn't make bad. He doesn't take bad steps. He creates creases for his running backs, and then he just is excited enough to run down there and try to make plays. Yeah, <laughs> you love to see it. And he, no pre draft workout for him, but it was not going to be great. He's just he's limited athletically. Why he falls at this point in draft, despite being multi year start. He was starting over Broderick Jones actually. Like 2021, that team he was the right tackle. Broderick Jones is the guy who's kind of um, coming in when Jamar Salyer had to kick inside. He came in then, but Warren McClendon was starting over him that season. How many more oh, we got sorry. here? Only three more with the Rams pick being in right now. We got the Colts and then the Rams yet again to end it on what was a somewhat tame day three, I'll say. Yeah. But a lot of QBs. A lot of QBs coming off the board. I mean, tame is a word. It's, it, tame is interesting because we've seen so much action, mm -hmm. but none of it's really meant anything. Yeah, I, I just feel like there's no, like, really off the wall, not too many really off the wall names. No. Kind of all guys, you're like, this is yeah, the range. Yeah, this is about where you should this go. This is the range. This is the range. I guess there is the two guys that I truly had not watched, the William and Mary tackle and yeah. the Minnesota safety. So, yeah. getting to that point. It happens. I, I do. Have you, ever, did you, have you ever done seven rounds of yeah. live yes. streams? Yes. Seven rounds gets fun. It gets it's fun as a word. <laughs> it's, um, you feel like you're drunk by the end of seven rounds. Absolutely. Of, of talking about every single pick. And you try to come up with different things to say. And... <laughs> but <sighs> every single year. Oh, man. So do we get to see any of these guys come off the board? We got three picks. All right. Let's see. Rams would not surprise me if they went Travis Hodge Tomlinson. They're one of the teams that I think would draft him. They obviously love Darius Williams when he was there. Undersized corner in that scheme. Could be possible. Um, I'm trying to think who else on the board there. Um, who's tops available. I'd love to see Deuce Vaughn come off the board here. I know Davis he's not. Davis Allen. Oh, another tight end. Clemson. Okay. He's, right. he's the perfect number two tight end, in my Davis opinion. Allen is a great number two tight end. You see him here at Clemson. This is a guy that finds ways to get open, can catch the ball in traffic. The other thing I like about his game, though, is he's improved. He's improved tremendously from where he was a year ago. And by, what I mean by that is he's been able to work better in blocking. Yes. His blocking was atrocious a year ago. And now it's getting better. He's working to find ways to get open, but also to stone people. He's working how to do better against tight ends, working how to move out safeties, working how to get to linebackers. The best thing that he does, obviously, is make contested catches. Oh, yeah, so good. Use his body. He, blo he boxes out like a basketball player, which is what everybody wants to see happen. But the real, the real key for me is how he's able to improve his blocking. And you said he's a great number two tight end. Yes, perfect number two tight end because not fast. Ran a 484 at the combine, just never going to stretch the field vertically. But ultra reliable. Uh, probably the best ball skills in this class after Dalton Kincaid. Dalton Kincaid, yeah. After him. Like he, he's so good in contest situations, and he can kind of go up and get it. He had a 38 and a half inch vertical. Uh, that's an aspect to his that. game that in the red zone, you want to throw him some back shoulders. You want to throw him a little jump balls. He can be productive in that regard. And they did that at Clemson quite a bit. So I'm a fan in that kind of role. And again, receiving ability with some blocking ability at this point in the draft, uh, I had him ahead of a number of tight ends that already come off the board. Uh, I think it's a good player. This is why the Rams load up on these picks, right? Is because yep. this guy can play a role. They're getting a lot of guys that, you know, maybe they're not going to be elite starters but you don't have liabilities then on your football field when you have guys like Davis Allen as your tight end, too. No, you don't have to worry about him. He's going to get the job done. Is he going to do it to the level of, of some superstar? No. Yeah, yeah. But you know what? The job, will, it will still get done. you got Tyler Higby. You know, you got a, you got a guy who is that receiving right. first tight end on the roster. You, you don't need two of them. It's difficult to find roles when you have two of them. This, this should go quick. The Colts pick is in, and the Rams are on the clock. They should be done. The Rams should already have their pick done. I love that you're like, Rams, just figure it out. You've been on the clock for the last three picks. Yeah. They've been on, yeah, they've been on the clock for three of the <laughs> last four picks they've been on the clock. Uh, you come up with two guys. If they take the guy you want, you take the other guy. <laughs> uh, 
All right, Colts. Man, who would we want for the Colts? So the Colts are going to draft an elite athlete. Don't get it twisted. That's, okay. that's their MO. Can we see the big board then? So then who would be who would fit that of who's still available on the draft board? Um, I'm trying to think. Corey Trice would fit that. Corey Trice, the high Corey athlete. Corey Trice, okay. Of those guys, I would not say anyone else would be a testing athlete that they would want. Uh, I think we're going to have to drop down a little bit. You know who hasn't come off the board? Keishon Butte hasn't come off the board yet. Well, he's weak. Well, listen, we can talk about him right now. He's got a lot of issues. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, he's a guy that basically seemed like he quit to start this season mm -hmm. and then realized, oh, my draft stock can fall. I need to start playing. Mm -hmm. Like, he, it was bananas to watch how, how much he disappeared, wasn't there, was not just, I don't know, it was... Yeah. It was it was insane. Like I'm gonna I got I got to look it up now. I, I oh, here, here's a player that could fit there. Trey Palmer from Nebraska could fit the Colts. That's a, he's a super athlete. Dude's a super athlete. That that could be the pick. We're, we're that's the next. Sean Butte. Sean Tucker could be should be could be a fit here too. That dude's a super athlete. Hit through the first one, two, three, four games. Through the first four games, he had eleven catches. <laughs> Dude, he it, was not even trying. And it did not, and, and then one did not play. Yeah. And then after that, six, six, four, seven, four, four, six, including two 100 yard games. He just, like, he's like, oh, I'll just turn it on at the end. Oh, here we go. Here's a good pick Evan Hall, Northwestern Evan Hall. running back. This is your Naheem Hines replacement. Evan Hall, Northwestern running back. This guy, he. You know, they say some people make it look easy. He made it look hard, but he did it. You know what I'm saying? Like, yes. there's a lot of effort coming out of his corner, but he got the job done. So for me, I think this is a great pick. Go ahead and tell tell the folks what, he, what they're getting. With he's him. a pure receiving back. I don't think he's your. This is your compliment to Jonathan Taylor, right? Like they traded away in Heem Hines last year. This is a guy that can fill that role. It ran a four four seven. Um, He's a jump cut king. He kind of just yes. slaloms as his running style. Yep. And he ran behind some shit, right? He ran behind an offensive line that outside of P.S. Karonsky could not open up holes for him. And so you like guys that did that, that had to overcome consistently. And this is going to be this is going to be your out of the backfield option routes, that sort of thing, third down back. In needs to improve his pass protection, I'll say. That, that's the one area where kind of dichotomous with him, where you would love it if he was better in that regard so that he could see the football field more. But as a pure receiver, he can get the job done. So yeah. I would I would what if what if Indianapolis implemented some of that like that that claw fence that Northwestern kind of took to as well, that slow that slow read Ooh. with Anthony Richardson and Hull. Now and he can get to his jump cuts and get to those things. That's what North, Northwestern mm -hmm. they took that from Wake Forest. Yeah. That slow, that claw fence. So he can do, I think that he would work. And because Richardson is always a threat, now you do put those linebackers in a bind and now you have some problems. I'm very curious to see if any of that makes its way in. I know he's def he definitely can catch the ball out of the backfield. So this is gonna be pretty interesting to see how it shakes. Okay, we got our last pick. Last pick's in. Let's go ahead and do it. Puka. Here we go. I'm ready to rock and roll on this one. The pick is in. All right, who do we have? Show me. Puka Nakua. BYU, this kid coming out of high school, super highly touted. From Utah, if I'm not mistaken. He's from Washington, I think he's from Utah. This is a guy that people thought was gonna go to Oregon, thought he was gonna go to Washington. Um, ends up at um, BYU, he can catch the ball. He catches through, he plays through contact exceptionally well. He wants the ball all the time. He wants to go up and get the football. He is someone that led them in. Yeah, he went to Washington, that's what I thought. Went played two seasons at Washington, played the last two at BYU. This guy, good change of direction, good speed. Listen, he's been killing it since high school. Puka Nakua, guy that transferred to BYU from Washington and showed why he was at Washington to begin with. He was better than just about everybody else that they played. Man, I wanted to like this kid. I, I think he does the little things about playing wide receiver so well. He's got good size. He's six foot one, you know, in the six one six two range, two hundred and ten pounds. But he's just such a limited athlete. To where I was watching him on tape. And he let guys back in. Like, he would win off the line or win on his break, and then he just doesn't have the gas, doesn't have the accelerator to 
make guys pay when he does win with his, you know, probably above average route running ability, above yeah. average hands, above average ball skills, a lot of like the things that are tough to coach into wide receivers. He does really, really well. But the thing that's impossible to coach into dudes, which is athleticism, he really is lacking. Yeah, great route runner, can create separation. The ball needs to be there mm -hmm. is the big thing. <laughs> the ball yeah. needs to be there now. You need to be throwing it when he's already taken that step. Yes. And that wasn't really happening uh, with Jared Hall. So we're going to see. Um, I know what we're going to do. That's the last end of the fifth round, folks. There's, we're going to start the six. We are not starting the six. We're going to say goodbye. But first, what's your favorite pick of this, of the last, of this day? Favorite pick of the entire day. Oof, you're really putting me on the spot there. There were a few that I liked. But I do think that my favorite one was right off the top. Um, I, I really liked. Let me, let me go back and look. What was the one right off the top of the fourth round that I liked? KJ Henry? No. Yes, sir, Abdullah. It was odds me out of bar. Oh, wrong round. One Look at the fifth round. That was that was insane. That was insane value. This guy truly is an all-time athlete, like Trayvon Walker levels of athlete that you right. don't find. A four four nine forty, thirty-seven inch vertical, two hundred eighty-two pounds. The guy is jacked, explosive, long, played out of position. You could see him excelling inside more than he did outside at Northwestern. And at 110, and maybe he has some degenerative knee issue or maybe he has something that none of us know about right now that drops into that far, tr like truthfully has to, yep. with how he was viewed by everyone that I've talked to that I trust in their evaluation process was a lot higher on him than 110. So if he's healthy, though, and on a football field, Colt's got one of the steals to draft there. Well, for me... Um I was gonna say DTR, and then I remembered that Owen Papo got drafted. Owen Papo is a guy that I've just kind of been watching since he was, again, it, it, rising out of middle school. This guy can play. I'm excited to see him kind of slow down just a little bit, but then use that speed to play to make, make things happen. So I'm looking forward to watching him with the Cardinals. Owen Papo from Auburn. Folks, thank you so much for tuning in to BR uh, Gridiron Draft Night. This has been so much fun. I hope you learned something. I hope we helped you out. I hope you had a good time. Folks, we are going to get out of here. For Mike Renner, I'm Michael Felder. For the crew, the team in the back, we're out. Peace.